This is live now. I'm not sure if the audio is going as it is. But anyway, once the thing starts, you can, uh, this audio you can unmute. This don't uh, click on it at all. I'll start the audio for the timing also. Can we start uh, un unmute? Oh, no. That is when the speaker is speaking, so his voice only will carry. Good, sir. Still there? Yeah. How many? 40? Yeah. 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 Video nahi aara. Morning, morning. Loot up, other secretary. Abhi, other, 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 is it coming? स्पीकर जो बोलेंगे ना ये रियल टेक पे रहेगा एप्सोन पे रहेगा हां रियल टेक पे रियल टेक पे रहेगा हां ठीक है okay. जब मां से स्पीकर बोलेंगे ना तब आप अनम्यूट कीजिए अभी ये अभी आप एक बार टेस्ट करो एक बार ये कंफर्म है ये कंफर्म है ये कंफर्म है हेलो दिस इज अ चेक चेक माइक इट्स ओके नाउ इट्स अगर इसका वॉल्यूम रखते ना तो इसको मारे इसमें कॉपी कर सर लेंगे हाँ सर ठीक है देखा मैं सेशन वन यस सर यस सर लंचो करने के लिए वो क्या स्लाइड चेंज है इसको रह गया ये सर नो नो डोंट डू इट मैं देखूँ वहाँ पे तो रखेंगे ना तो ये सर ठीक हो ठीक है बंद कर Thank <laughs> you. 
Aleatório, não tem problema não. Que para nada, mano. Our keynote speaker and chief guest for this morning, other eminent 
guests of honor and dignitaries present here today ladies and gentlemen a very good morning to all of you and welcome to this annual seminar 2022 of the indian maritime foundation on the subject present challenges of ship uh, ship building in india and way ahead uh, as uh, you are aware we are having this in person seminar after about 3 uh, years as like everyone else in the world we have to follow the restrictions and guidelines which were imposed by the covid pandemic and also for the first time i would like to mention that we are having uh, not only the in, in person seminar but one which uh, we are live streaming to on youtube so that uh, those who are not able to attend physically in person can see the seminar on youtube as well and of course the recording will be available later on conducting a seminar of this magnitude is not an easy task for a relatively small and voluntary organization such as the indian maritime foundation and we are therefore grateful to our sponsors for having generously contributed towards organizing the seminar these are mascon docks limited coaching shipyard limited lnt ship buildings oa shipyard limited garden reach ship builders and engineers and shop shipyard limited thank you all for your contribution so an overview of the program is now flashed in this slide next slide and the same is also there in the brochure which i'm sure all of you must have collected from the registration desk uh, a few small points uh, i'm just now flashing for the benefit of the audience Firstly, of course, uh, I don't think I required to iterate that uh, you should keep your mobile switch off. Uh, during the question and answer session, which will follow the speakers in each of the three sessions that we have, uh, request any audience member who wishes to ask a question to first raise his hand to ask for the mic. We'll have uh, two people who will uh, be there with the mics. Uh, please state your name and designation so that it is recorded uh, and uh, we are able to therefore uh, thereafter put it in our seminar proceeding for the compendium. and keep your uh, questions brief and to the point uh, i also request uh, the moderators and i also intend to do the same that uh, you not to make a full introduction of uh, the moderators as well as speakers because uh, the detailed bio data is there in the brochure so if you wish to know more about uh, that particular moderator or the speaker you may read the full bio data in the brochure uh with that we we'll move to the first item that is a welcome address by captain anand dikshit president imf and uh, master mariner is an alumnus of uh, training ship dafrin and has more than 40 years of experience in the merchant marine he took over as the president of the imf on the 7th of jan 2020 i invite him to deliver the welcome address good morning ladies and gentlemen admiral satish gorbade honored guest speakers and moderators distinguished delegates principal sponsors members of imf mariners ladies and gentlemen i am privileged to welcome you on behalf of the indian maritime foundation to our seminar on present challenges of shipbuilding in india and way ahead we would like to extend a special welcome to vice admiral satish gorbade Vice Chief of Naval Staff, who is our chief guest and keynote speaker at today's seminar. Thank you, sir, for coming down from Delhi to be with us today. A brief introduction of the Admiral, Vice Admiral S. N. Gorbani, P. V. S. M. A. V. S. M. N. M. A. D. C. is a navigation and direction specialist. He was commissioned into the Indian Navy on 1st of January. 1984 he is an alumnus of the national defense academy a graduate of naval staff college at the united states naval war college newport rhode island and the naval war college mumbai he has numerous awards and achievements to his credit at the india and in cadet training ship and is myself he continued to achieve distinction in the various courses we attended subsequently his important operational appointments include commands of the guided vessel frigate INS Brahmaputra 
submarine rescue vessel and his nirikshak mine sweeper and his lp and second in command guided missile frigate and his ganga the admiral has held important and challenging staff appointments prior to taking over as a vice chief of naval staff on 1st of august 2021 the admiral is married to mrs sanskruti and they are blessed with two wonderful children radha and para his interests are reading trekking water sports and horse riding a warm welcome to you sir we would like to express our gratitude to the principal sponsors of this seminar and acknowledge the presence of their representatives Mazgan Dock Limited Shri Vijay George Elant Ship Building Shri Jayant Patil Garden Reach Ship Builders and Engineers Captain Sunil Kumar Cochin Shipyard Limited Shri Jitesh Chandra <coughs> Goa Shipyard Limited Captain Jagmohan Shaft Shipyard Private Limited Shri Sohail Raj We appreciate their valuable support to the IMF. We welcome our distinguished moderators for this seminar, Vice Admiral D. M. Deshpande, Dr. Manini Shankar, Sri Jain Patil. We extend our warm welcome to all the guest speakers. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, gentlemen, for accepting our invitation and sparing your valuable time to be with us today. We feel honored to have with us today senior serving and retired defense and civil service officers, representatives of shipyards and defense industries, officers of the merchant marine academics and professionals. We welcome you all to this seminar. I would like to acknowledge the presence of the combined study group of the IMF and its core committee who organized this seminar. Vice Admiral Vinod Pasija, Vice Admiral DSP Verma, who is not here at the moment, uh, Commodore Sanjeev Nayar, Rear Admiral RJ Nakarni, and Captain Dinesh Singh. We welcome members of the Navy Foundation, Commodore PK Malhotra, President, Navy Foundation, Pune Chapter, Rear Admiral S. Patham, Rear Admiral S. Vargaonkar, Vice Admiral Jaiwan Kourde. We welcome representatives at the, of the Center of Advanced Strategic Studies, CAS, Air Marshal Bhushan Gokhale, former Vice Chief of Air Staff and Director, CAS, Major General S.H. Mahajan, Deputy Director and Secretary, CAS. We welcome the representatives of Dolani Maritime Institute, Captain Kevin Mascarenas, Mr. Sujit Das, and Dr. Somnath Nirani. We welcome officers of the NHQ, INS Shivaji, officers of the Western Naval Command, NDA, Millet, and National Maritime Foundation, New Delhi. We are honored to have with us today Commodore H. Khatri, CMD, Hindustan Shipyard Limited. Shri S.S. Sony, IAS retired, Vice Admiral S.K.K. Pratnan, Major General Rajendra Malave, and Rear Admiral S.S. Borbode. Among our distinguished guests are uh, Professor Vijay Khare, Head of the Department of uh, Defense and Strategic Studies at Savitri Bhai Pune Pune University, Commodore Ajay Sharma, Bharat Forge Limited, Commodore Sanjay Deshpande, Titagar Wagons Limited, Commander Pratim Sen, Naval Projects, Sea Trade International Technology, Commodore SL Deshmukh, Mr. Amiya Prakash Behre, Director, and Mr. Bharat Mistri, CEO of Sushma and Company Electricals. I would like to add that Sushma Marine, headed by Mr. Prakash Behre, is well connected with the Indian Navy and they have made a valuable contribution to the building of INS Vikram. Mr. Anirudha Gorbole, Managing Director, Marine Management Services, Mumbai, and Marman Engineering and Shipbuilding Limited, Goa. 
representatives of VR coatings and symptomatic automation, private limited. May I briefly say a few words about the Indian Maritime Foundation? Although most of you would be very familiar with the IMF. We are a non-profit NGO run by the officers of the Indian Navy and the Merchant Marine. Our aim is to make the people of India sea-minded and promote awareness of all aspects of India's maritime interests. One of our objectives is to encourage debate on various aspects of the maritime field, including naval and commercial shipbuilding and ship repair, which is the theme of the seminar today in keeping with our objectives. Our membership is not restricted to mariners. We welcome new mariners, we welcome new members, mariners and non-mariners, men and women from all walks of life who have an interest in the sea and ships. Although our activities cover a wide spectrum, today I would like to focus briefly on our maritime museum in Pune that many of you in the audience may not be aware of. Originally set up in 2014 at the Deccan College Department of Archaeology, the museum has been relocated to another of our College of Engineering uh, in a larger uh, premise. It was formally inaugurated on the 27th of April uh, 2022 by the then Honorable Deputy Chief Minister of Maharashtra, Sri Ajit Pawar. We are now planning to expand the size and the scope of this museum and make it one of the major attractions of Pune City. Please do visit the museum when you can. We welcome the donations of scale models of warships and merchant ships and other items of interest, of maritime interest and maritime heritage for our museum. But fortunate that we have with us today highly knowledgeable and experienced speakers. And we in the IMF are privileged they are, that they have come down here to share their uh, expertise with us. We have an interesting day ahead of us, and I hope that some constructive recommendations will emerge from these deliberations. A warm welcome to you again, ladies and gentlemen, and thank you. Uh, thank you, Captain Alan, for the welcome address. We now have the inaugural address uh, to be delivered by Vice Admiral Ingon Pasirika. Retired. The Admiral is a naval aviator and took part in the 1971 war as a Sea Hawk fighter pilot operating from the carrier the first INS Vikram. Later on, he went on to command three ships and was the commissioning commanding officer of a second aircraft carrier, INS Virat. In the flag rank, he has held several prestigious appointments and has had the unique distinction of commanding both our operational commands, that is the Eastern Naval Command and the Western Naval Command prior to his retirement in 2002. May I invite him to deliver the inaugural address. Okay. Are you on the slides?
Roman Catholic, not just the maritime view and not just the final aspect. Welcome to all of you, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, it gives me great pleasure to speak on a subject which I think is very vital for India. This has been going on for a long time, and I must admit that over the years, uh, we have been in the Navy doing a lot of which all of us are very proud of. In fact, if you look at what the Navy has achieved and compare it to the other two services, you will find that the other two services are still way behind us. This became possible only because of the vision of a few people of the of first generation in the Navy. I'll talk about that second. Yeah. Also, I am not going to go into any details of the ship building and about the Navy because I think there are I have given a little detail of our experience from where we really got left behind. I will not cover it in detail because it is there. It gives you exactly what happened from the 1600s when ships started coming. How the Indian Navy Marine was formed at that time, although we were not part of uh, India in the true sense, we were practically under the British at that time. And then we became Her Majesty's Indian Navy ship in 1858. And since then, you will see the progress that has been made. And a final thing was becoming the Royal Indian Navy in 1934, after which a lot of uh, officers took part in the World War. In fact, my father was a lecturer in uh, Lucknow when he was called upon to join the Navy. So in 42, he joined the Navy and went to sea. But because he used to wear glasses, he was given the supply branch. He was a very seasick man, and I don't know how he managed it at sea, but he did. And because of him, it's surprising, but my childhood spent, was spent in Vizag, Bombay, and Kochi. 
I don't have memories of that because I was just uh, two or three years old. But that is where uh, I grew up as a. I just as a, an aside, after all this, I wanted to join the Navy and Naval Aviation in particular. And because for some reason I was always getting 98% in maths and science, my father insisted that I should be an engineer. So he made me do engineering, started my engineering, and without telling him, I appeared for the NDA group. And when I got selected, I just told him I'm good. And that is how I joined the Navy. And I'm glad that I not only joined the Navy, uh, another small incident I think I must tell you is that when I did this, and I joined the Navy because of my marks, they gave me the engineering mark. <laughs> When they gave me the engineering branch, I told uh, the senior officer of the Navy in India, sir, I want to leave. He said, you spent so much time here, you will have to pay billions. I said, sir, I don't mind, I will pay it in my own time, but I want to leave. Then he said, why do you want to leave? I said, I wanted to join aviation and then let me engineer. He said, no, no, engineers are also aviation. I said, no, sir. I believe they are, but I am not going to do that. I want to leave. They won't believe it. In two days, my branch was changed from in India itself, from engineering to flight, aviation. So I said, I don't say, I don't say, but I had to be next time. Okay. The next one. Uh, I will now give a brief on uh, what I want to say. Basically, the important aspects that relate to how our Navy grows and how we become what we are. As I mentioned, we are perhaps the only service among three, which is so advanced. And I'm very proud that our thinkers, our thought processes, makes them. They planned this out right from the borderless are independent. And they've set up the various things, and this is the genesis which has led to what we are today. Next slide. A little later, the maritime vision has been has come up, for which I think there are enough people who are going to talk about it. So I will not cover that in detail. Which in this is a further 10-year plan for the a new build. And I'm grateful that today, from what we were, we used to import a lot of items. In fact, most of our ships were totally imported. And I'll cover that uh, a little later. Next. So these are the shipbuilding yards that helped us to build ships. And as you will see, today, not only these, there are a number of other yards, smaller yards, which are supplying items practically built. Uh, pieces of equipment to other uh, yards, and they're being transported by ship and by road and by road. The vision of our forefathers is very important. When we first started, it was decided that we must build our own and get the Navy to become self such If we hadn't done that, we would not be where we are. In fact, if you go to the first ship which was built, this was in collaboration with uh, England. And when this was built, you know, a couple of years after it was built, Admiral Gorshkov from the Russian Navy visited the ship because we wanted to show him that we are built the ship. So he looked at the ship, and just before he was leaving, the Admiral from the Western Command was with him. So that's it. Is this a wash? So the admiral is open. So you put just one gun and nothing else, and just a helicopter, which is just about land, and the helicopter is only for search and rescue. So, what is the warship part of this? At that time, rather than getting discouraged, that is the time that maybe this guy is okay. He has taunted us. Let us show him what we can do. And today, just I'm fortunate that uh, three days before, or a week before I spoke, three ships have got 
and the Navy is, the Navy has been in the news for three years. The grant has commissioned Sakura and also I've just given you a brief detail of the Vikram and she's commissioned. Continue, please. And the improvement that is going to be fitted up, which I think is important for us to see that 80% of this equipment is made in They're still importing. There has been some restriction because of the uh, policies that uh, you cannot, the Navy cannot import. But that's what that restriction is not on the shipyards. So the shipyards in a position to import some of the items for us and fit them. The other very big thing that we have done is our engineers and our electrical people and our design people have designed a lot of equipment which is totally new. We borrowed it, we built it, but whatever is the new equipment is designed by us. And today I think as far as the Indian Navy is concerned, we can compete with any Navy in the world for our equipment, for our ships, for our caliber, and of course, that is known for our manpower. We've done wonders and I'm so grateful that this is us. This is the latest ship. One hour later, so see the kind of equipment that is being fitted on board. Practically everything, the toad array, sonar, sonar has been made in Koche. That was one of the first sonars in the world which has been recognized as the best. <laughs> and that was built nearly 20 years ago and is now being fitted on ships. Uh, this is a IDRW report again on the 12th September. So as I said, three incidents in the 12th of September have made my lecture all relevant for the time. And these are the new ships that we are going to be building and which are likely to be sanctioned in the future. That is the kind of ship building that we are doing. And the only thing in this, regrettably, which is something that should have happened years ago, I went to the USSR to have a look at uh, our carrier and to buy it. Then she finally got a recommended gift, first of all. And we went there. That carrier was being given to us for 600 million rupees, equivalent of 600 million. Uh, sorry, 600 crore. I came back and submitted the full proposal to get that going. Fortunately, the system that was going, it didn't work. And we said, no, no, we don't have that money. And also, the carrier is uh, old and we won't. Yet, when eventually we got Vikram Aditya, it has been modified. And though we paid much more, we put in a lot of our own equipment. And I think I'm glad that we delayed it and didn't listen to what I had to say. We paid a lot more, but that was all right. That doesn't matter. And now, as we have, next week. Okay. I, as I mentioned, we have come to Vikram, uh, and hopefully, as a, what I was mentioning also is that although the first Vikram has been ordered, I think four years ago we should have ordered the second. Now, by the time the government sanction comes, Cochin Shifter will have some, so many other things to do that we will miss out. And I personally believe that we need at least three carriers in India. One for the Bay of Bengal, one for the Arabian Sea, and one totally for using as a standby so that whenever there's a requirement and carrier ships have to go undergo refit, so there would be one under transfer, a minimum of three carriers in this one. And I hope the government sanctions the second one. So, because even become a data now over the years, it's a world ship and it will take some time. These are some of the initiatives that we need. And this is what I'm sure that uh, the speakers will talk about. Uh, our skills in building and fitting, skills, manpower, r and infrastructure, which till recently was quite poor. I'm glad that the Director of Label Design has broadened this. And also in conjunction with the civil doctor, we have done a lot of work and all this is making this. The other weak area was, and I'm glad that that is also improving, is that the suppliers were not in a very good state. 
But today, we are not only giving them to build, we are also making sure that they build in places far away and supply to a shipyard 200 miles and even 400 miles. So, practically, the whole block is ready and it is just put on the ship and with the wiring, everything we done. Similarly, it was, I was very happy to learn from LRT that they are doing the same in their yard and they are even completing the wiring, the piping, and everything. And when they put it in place, they just have to make the connections as it was. And that is why they are not only making them faster, but making them cheaper. And I'm so glad that uh, when you talk about it, we get some more. These are some of the problem areas I think that we have to do overcome. I've been told last night that some have been overcome, but I think the one or two areas which are still not overcome is what is the difference between a government owned yard and a civil yard. A government owned yard can do nothing. By the time a new sanction or the change comes in, it takes three months. The shipyard has a meeting, and the next morning the change is implemented and they go ahead. They're also allowed to import without a problem. That is, as far as we are concerned, import has become a big problem to get an import clearance takes us six months. But these are some areas where we still need to improve tremendously. We have not. Similarly, the duty for a ship built in India is much higher than a ship built abroad. Whether there's a person from abroad, if he takes the ship, same ship abroad, he doesn't pay. So these are some areas which I think we need to improve, and that's why it's covered. This is what I've just covered, and next. Even today, as far as the maritime trade is concerned, we have, India, I think, has only 2% of it. We have the capability now, and it was nice to hear that we are building ships for other countries. If you are doing that, we need to build that and we need to go for it. There are not spoken at all of the merchant navy because there are enough people talking about it. But I think some of our merchant uh, yards have produced quite a lot of ships, but they have been, I think, <laughs> There's another slide which we have covered in some detail where uh, we, must, uh, we must change our policy of taxation totally to make ship building a totally competitive yard. Not because India needs them, but because we should export all our ships. The more we export, the more money we will earn, and the better we will get. From that year 2%, I think we get up to slightly higher, 10 to begin with, and maybe a little higher. Thank you. These are the ships of the Indian Navy today, which you can compare with any other Navy. There are only five navies in the world which have aircraft carriers and have built an aircraft. Our submarines are recognized as one of them. They have slowly started building submarines that are totally indigenous. Components are indigenous, our equipment is indigenous, and we have made sure that these are the kind. I know some of these things we cannot export because they are military hardware, but we also built OPVs and smaller boats, which we've been given to other countries, we don't have the kind of equipment. That's probably one small gun so that they are used for the other purposes. Mm -hmm. And the last slide to show you the control that the Indian Navy today is in. This is a list of the ships and uh, naval stations in the Indian Ocean. And if you see the entire Indian Ocean, you can see what the Indian Navy can command. There are our neighbors, but I don't think you can identify any of them in the past, other than Australia, which is quite small, which has ships that are anywhere close to what we Even at one time, we were scared of Pakistan, but today Pakistan is nowhere on the horizon as far as Thank you very much. I thought that I'd give you an overview. Thank you, Admiral Pasija, for that inaugural address, uh, which has uh, really set the tone and the stage.
for the seminar to follow. Stop sharing. Uh, we now have the keynote address for which uh, we are very honored and privileged to have Admiral Gormade, the Vice Chief of the Naval Staff, uh, as our chief guest and our keynote speaker. Since uh, Captain Dixit has already uh, given a list of all his accomplishments, I will not uh, repeat that. But I'm sure you are very eager to hear what he has to say. And of course, uh, exactly. I'm sure most of the audience is aware, but Vice Chief heads the Staff Branch 1. This is responsible for future plans of the Navy, which includes new ship constructions and inductions. And uh, as uh, Admiral Pastich has already mentioned, uh, this is the most appropriate moment for us also to have this seminar, because in the recent uh, couple of weeks, we've had three new ship constructions uh, which uh, some of which, of course, uh, Admiral Gormadi also has uh, attended in his capacity as vice chief. So I'm sure you're all very eager to hear what he has to say. I invite him to take the podium. Recording in progress. progress. Vice Admiral Vinod Pashikha, I know the CNC when I was XO Kaka, then Marshal Bhushan Gokhale, Captain Manan Dixit, President IMF, Kumru Rajan Veer, President Emeritus IMF, Vice Admiral Kochar, Commandant NDA, Dr. Malini Shankar, ECIMU, Sri Jayan Patel, Vice President LNT Defense, Vice Admiral Subedar, Vice Admiral Nadkarni, who has organized all this. We have uh, many, many distinguished uh, veterans and officers here who um, have had uh, the opportunity to work with. And I'm really grateful to you for uh, grooming me uh, throughout my career. And uh, many of them are here. Uh, and uh, Vice Admiral Vardhankar, Admiral Patham. General Gorkole, uh, Major General Mahajan, whom I actually took over the Directorate of Military Affairs from Major General Malve, who we did the NHC course together. Uh, I have Admiral Deshpande, uh, you know, trying to work with him in the Naval Headquarters. Commodore Ajay Chitness, I have also worked with Commodore AJ Singh in the DNP. And uh, for, uh, I've also we have uh, other distinguished people here, Captain Ravindra Hajar Navis, uh, Mr. Sahai Raj, I think he's here. And uh, we are happy that Mr. Shivani is also here. All other distinguished guests whom I have not mentioned, and uh, Krishna is here, whom I had the opportunity to work, and uh, there are many more senior people here. So. Uh, thank you very much, Admiral Cordy. Also, uh, so it's, these are uh, our opportunities to be here amongst uh, all of you, and uh, put some of my thoughts uh, because it's really an honor and privilege for me to deliver the keynote address of the seminar, which is being organized by IMF on a very topical uh, uh, issue of present challenges of shipbuilding in India and we had. Uh, this topic is extremely relevant because uh, not only for both India as a nation and the Indian Navy as a fighting force, because growth of the indigenous shipbuilding industry has really multiple advantages for the nation. And it's in the realm of economic growth as well as self-reliance in defense production. So I really thank the Indian Maritime Foundation who have conducted and hosting this seminar. I'm really confident that this seminar will throw up many good issues and it will work as a springboard 
which can be taken forward, which can uh, actually work as prospects for future shipbuilding industry in India. As you are all aware that the shipbuilding industry is of great strategic importance and has the potentially has the potential to significantly increase employment prospects along with having a multiplier effect on the economy directly and indirectly. This sector has direct uh, and indirect positive impact on leading ancillary industries such as steel, aluminium, electrical machinery and various equipment including the defense equipment. Besides, it has got a huge dependence on the infrastructure and service sectors. A successful shipbuilding sector has been pivotal for rapid and robust economic development of most countries which have long coastal boundaries. So if we observe the historical trends, we see that growth in shipbuilding has been both a precursor and a catalyst to overcome economic progress of a nation. Europe and the UK in the colonial era, United States in the early and mid 20th century, Japan and Korea in the second half of 20th century, and more recently, China in the last two, three decades have all displayed the same trend. As our government of India has envisioned to make India a 5 trillion US dollar economy and a global powerhouse in the future, shipbuilding as an industry has the greatest potential to significantly contribute towards this endeavor. Further, Today, our local is also going global. And as I see here, Pune is one of the largest industrial hubs of the country. And there are large number of MSMEs who have emerged in the last few years. And with the amount of incentives being given, and I would actually request all the veteran senior officers here who got lots of experience with them to identify good set of MSMEs and recommend them to the naval headquarters, especially on the services, so that we can take forward what great achievements they are doing and where are we can use our defense shipbuilding, etc. And these inputs given to us to the directorate of indigenization, uh, we will we'll take it forward so that we utilize those. We were even have a naval innovation and, and indigenization organization which was set up in August 20 which we are working very closely with the private industry so that we develop large number of technologies which can be implemented very quickly. Also, we have had a record merchandise export of $400 billion last year. This figure will definitely be surpassed this year as our merchandise exports have touched $117 billion US dollars in the first quarter of the current financial itself. And this has been the highest ever for our country. A vast volume of these exports inevitably will transit over the seas. And there is thus an immense potential to be part of this growing trade by supplying quality merchant ships as well. Increase in demand for maritime trade over the years has caused consistent growth of global shipbuilding industry in the past. While Europeans are still our global leaders in building passenger ships and ferries, the Indo-Pacific region has a maximum global orders for oil and gas carriers, bulk carriers, cargo ships, and container vessels, and has emerged as the fastest growing market in the shipbuilding sector. With China and South Korea alone capturing about 60% of market share in merchant shipbuilding. The Indian shipbuilding industry has also witnessed a period of growth riding on the stimulus of global demand, which happened from 2003 onwards. It was during this period that the market share of Indian yards 
in terms of global orders grew from 0.2 to 1.2% during the five year period between 2002 to 2007. This was actually projected to go up to 7.5% by 2017. Unfortunately, the global downturn along with withdrawal of the government subsidy in 2007 and relatively low competitiveness of our shipyards resulted in reduced demand of the ships. This then followed by the global recession in 2008 and fall in oil prices played a major spoil sport by leading to large scale cancellation of export orders. While this commercial shipbuilding industry has faced difficult times, naval or the defense shipbuilding industry has a different story to tell. Our far sighted predecessors, as was brought out by Admiral Pashricha also, sowed the seeds of self reliance in shipbuilding by setting up India's own warship design organization, which later became the nucleus of all major warship building activities in the country. The first major step was the licensed production of Leander class frigates, which was a great flash by Admiral Pashricha. Of course, we had the first ship of Ajay built by GRSE in 1960. His Leander class ships built in Mazagon docks laid the foundation of Indian Navy's transition from buyer's Navy to a builder's Navy. You are all aware that the trade of naval design with surface ship group has been recently rechristened as Warship Design Bureau. And this is meant to not only transform, but to take on additional responsibilities. Indigenous design and construction of warships has been a learning experience for us. Indian shipyards have built some of the most complex frontline warships and submarines. Our constant endeavor has been to evolve from our experiences and enhance operational availability of our platforms. We are also focusing to enhance the indigenous content in our warships. The delivery of indigenous aircraft carrier along with the design and indigenous construction of ongoing 38 of the 40 warships and submarines in India reiterates our commitment to further develop indigenous warship design and construction capability. And we will be fully self-reliant or Atmanirbhar. Let me take a pause here and speak more about Atmanirbhar, which is the first flavor of the season. We have to understand that our quest for Atmanirbhar is not an isolated policy or vision. It is part of a large transformative changes which are underway in India, in which Indian Navy has been in the forefront for many years now. Complementing this goal, the government has launched several initiatives such as revamping the defense production and export promotion policy, increasing the foreign direct investment in the defense sector and developing defense industrial corridors to name a few. I can probably say that with the dedicated efforts of over two and a half decades, along with the help of DRDO, Indian industry, directorate of ordnance, and through joint development with foreign partners, we have been able to indigenize weapons, sensors, and major shipboard, shipboard systems. <clears throat> These to name a few are medium range surface to air missiles, torpedoes, rocket launchers, anti-submarine warfare systems, combat management systems, communication suits, and electronic warfare systems. As is the practice in all countries, localization of shipbuilding with use of maximum indigenized content is our priority. While we have taken strides towards this objective, there is still headroom available to achieve further self-reliance to enable strategic independence, particularly 
in the equipment and systems pertaining to propulsion, weapons, and sensors. As on date, our industry partners have a clear idea and understanding of the kind of technology the Indian Navy envisages to induct in the coming years. While the growth of shipbuilding in defense sector has been impressive, commercial shipbuilding in India has been struggling in comparison to countries like China, South Korea, Japan, and other European countries. And there is a huge untapped potential in this sector, which needs to be harnessed for the overall benefit in the maritime sector and for further furthering our economic growth. Shipbuilding industry, when I see, is actually an industry of industries. About 60 to 65 percent of value addition to a ship under construction comes from manufacture of shipboard material, equipment, and systems. The shipyard by itself adds about only 35% of value by constructing the ship and integrating these equipment and systems. Therefore, akin to the automotive industry, shipbuilding industry has the potential of creating an ecosystem of supporting industry to cater to its ancillary requirements. I'm proud to place a record that despite the limited ancillary industry in the Indian shipbuilding ecosystem, Indian Navy has achieved a very high level of indigenization in the float component, that is hull material and systems. And we have about 50 to 60% indigenization in the move components involving large number of engineering and electrical systems. Just take the case of Vikrant, which was mentioned by Admiral Pashricha also. Commissioning of Vikrant early this month was indeed a red letter day for the entire nation. And especially for the Indian Navy, not only has the Vikrant's construction fostered <coughs> an engineer's ecosystem for niche shipbuilding, in a major spin-off, it has also made us self-reliant in the field of warship grade steel. In addition, I wanted to tell about the fight component, which has missed that slide. It remains an area in which we are working hand-in-hand -hand with DRDO, TPSUs, and private industries. And this is to enhance indigenization content. And I'm confident that we have a very bright future in this part for our indigenous weapon systems and sensor systems. The development and production of this indigenous steel through partnership between Navy, DRDO, Is it some problem with slides? Okay, not good. You can go ahead with this. So what I was telling you was development and production of the indigenous steel through partnership between Navy, DRDO and Steel Authority of India actually symbolizes how an unflinching quest of Atman Nirbharta can lead to unprecedented rates. And this now has happened that all our ships which are under construction are being made with the indigenous steel. That itself has promoted a large industry now. In spite of all the advantages that the shipbuilding has to offer, its huge potential has remained underutilized. The most important issue we have realized in the absence of the previous slide of centralized body focusing on growth of shipbuilding sector. At present, there are a large number of organizations and agencies and departments within the government that oversee policies related to the seas. Consequently, we have not been able to currently exploit the potential wealth of our exclusive economic zone of 2.3 million square kilometers. Further, for a matured shipbuilding industry, the commercial shipbuilding and defense shipbuilding should complement each other. 
by a significant process, the progress has been made in the warship construction. As I highlighted earlier, the commercial shipbuilding has not kept pace. The prime reason for this is lack of a shipbuilding <coughs> ecosystem in the country and a long-term perspective planning for India's commercial fleet. There are dearth of shipbuilding orders in the private shipbuilding sector. Development of ancillary industry supporting the shipbuilding has also been suboptimal in the commercial shipbuilding. We have challenges in the form of underdeveloped infrastructure, inadequate innovation, and less investments in R&D as compared to the advanced shipbuilding nations like Korea, Japan, and China. In India, there are less than a dozen firms that have basic ship design expertise. Some of these are standalone design units that do not have manufacturing facilities, but team up with shipyards to form consortiums that leverage each other's competencies. In addition to these issues, financial barriers also add to the existing woes of the shipbuilding industry. As was also briefly brought out by Admiral Prashrija, in India, the interest rate on loan taken for development infrastructure is large. Further, a typical shipyard requires a working capital of around 25 to 35 percent of the cost of the ship. The interest rates on working capital in India averages to 10.5 percent. On the other hand, the interest rates presently offered to shipbuilding yards overseas are considerably lower at around 5 to 6 percent in Korea and 4 to 8 percent in China. Taxation in India is also very stringent for the domestic industry. High taxation creates a cost differential which directly impedes the global competitiveness of our shipbuilding companies and shipyards, squeezing their operating margins. High cost of credit, high taxes on indigenous equipment, and high duties on imports of machinery, such as marine engines, propulsion package, ship management and navigation systems, etc., together <coughs> make shipbuilding a non competitive sector. This is the reason why our shipyards have the capability, they are not globally competitive. Thus, in such instances, the nation is dependent on foreign participation, having the wherewithal to address the challenges domestically. Therefore, what should be the way? There is a requirement of examining these issues with a whole of government approach and employ <coughs> measures both at policy and working level to revitalize shipbuilding in India. So I'll talk about some of the measures that could help revival of shipbuilding in the country. To ensure targeted development of shipbuilding and ship repair sector, there is a need to establish a dedicated department of shipbuilding at the Ministry of Shipping, Ports and Waterways. So at present, we have a Ministry of Shipping, Port and Waterways, and shipbuilding and ship repair comes under the shipping part. Now, this shipping part has got many more issues than the shipbuilding and ship repair as a factor. So we need positively an empowered monitoring authority, which may be headed by a secretary level officer who could be appointed to undertake national level coordination to facilitate clearances through a single window system that ensure, uh, that, ensure that bottlenecks for investment in the sector are removed. This proposed department could be empowered to coordinate all aspects pertaining to shipbuilding industry spanning across ministries because it has got many links with other ministries. <coughs> this agency could formulate policy and regulatory roadmaps to monitor all developments in the maritime domain. This may include policies related to consolidation of demand for ships and offshore structures, 
capacity and infrastructure augmentation of yards, setting up of avenues for low interest funding of shipyards and ancillary industries. And this also should be related with formulation of medium term and long term plans for development of India's <coughs> shipbuilding sector. For enabling our shipyards to attain that critical mass, we need to increase <coughs> shipbuilding demand. Few points which did come to my mind are to focus on ways and means to enhance share of Indian built ships in overseas trade and, of course, replacement of the aging Indian fleet. Formulation of policy on repair and maintenance of all Indian flagged vessels exclusively at Indian shipyards and judicial exploitation of inland waterways for increased domestic trade. There could be greenfield initiatives by Indian shipyards for specialized platforms, vessels, and they should be exempted from goods and services tax on shipbuilding and ship repair. This would incentivize them to compete with global shipyards and attract foreign investments and or technology transfer from foreign shipyards. These measures, if implemented, are likely to augment a sustained demand in the near future itself, that is next five to 10 years. In addition, I feel that there has to be collaboration between all the shipyards, whether big or small, public or private, and that is the need of the hour. PSU shipyards have expertise in defense shipbuilding with their available resources and vast experience in warship building. They have the requisite infrastructure, whereas the private shipyards, on the other hand, bring in efficient management and capabilities with them. Therefore, in a country like us, defense and commercial shipbuilding should complement each other for <laughs> mutual growth of the shipbuilding ecosystem. To achieve such a collaboration among them, we may look at the options of public-private partnerships or joint ventures, partnerships with PSUs and shipyards. Now, these joint ventures and partnerships between private and public sector could result in private yards gaining much needed experience in construction of mega blocks and PSU shipyards in turn could master modern integration and advanced outfitting techniques beside handling complex managerial issues. So I would say for an example, the partnership of MDL with Shoft and Chogle Shipyard for our P-15 Bravo and P-17 Alpha ships and GRSE with LNT for survey vessel large and also ASW shallow order craft is a good beginning in this direction. If we have a conglomerate of our shipyards, then we will compete with the world rather than competing with each other. And then we would be able to get much more export orders. Creation of maritime clusters are also vital for the growth of shipbuilding and repair industry, as they provide the ancillary services, manufacturing of ancillary products, maritime services, and financial services for the industry. And therefore, they would cultivate the entire ecosystem for the industry. Presently, Sri Perumpudur in Tamil Nadu has been <coughs> identified for development of a maritime cluster as part of the national perspective plan of the Sadar Mala program. Similarly, cluster formation is in progress for developing a marine shipbuilding park in Gujarat. So India needs much more such clusters for overall development of our shipbuilding ecosystem. In the last five to six years, the central government has undertaken <laughs> many initiatives towards revitalization of shipbuilding and development of a mature ecosystem of shipbuilding and ship repair in the country. This is the beginning of the financial assistance policy for 10 year period 
and grant of infrastructure status in 2016 to Atmanirbhar policy and Pradhan Mantri Matsya Sampada Yojana in 2020. All such measures are aimed at increasing the gross tonnage from 27,000 tons in 2020 to 5 lakh gross tonnage in 2030 with creation of more than 1 lakh additional jobs in this sector. However, these initiatives are gaining the required momentum progressively. Therefore, formation of a special purpose vehicle by way of National Shipbuilding and Shipping Finance Corporation under the Companies Act 2013 to overcome capital infrastructure investment and constraints besides evolving, evolving taxation policies for global competitiveness is also recommended. The present system of subsidy offered to shipbuilders needs review as the subsidy is inadequate, meager, and also complicated. A suitable organization could be assigned the task to undertake consultative study on rationalization of taxation and tax incentives for competitiveness of with the foreign shipyards. The government has also planned to achieve export of 350 billion in defense goods and services by 2025. Shipbuilding can play a vital role in achieving this goal. Naval shipbuilding projects can have strategic spin-offs for the economy, especially for the shipbuilding industry. Some of the shipyards have already exported OPVs size ship to countries in our neighborhood. And there's a large demand of ships in the Indian Ocean region and area. Further, there is a need to attract the foreign direct investment in shipbuilding in sector, which is currently a weak point. FDI from shipbuilding majors, whether in the form of investment in Indian private shipyards or in the form of joint venture companies, has the potential to infuse new technology and spur growth in the Indian shipbuilding capabilities. Such partnerships have the potential to convert India into a strategic hub for shipbuilding exports. A comparison with the Indian auto industry also may be in order, where focused investments have transformed Make in India into Make for the World, with the auto industry contributing nearly 7% to, to India's GDP. To attract FDI in the commercial shipbuilding sector, it may be necessary to rope in the services of Ministry of External Affairs, which has a spread of commercial wings in India's overseas missions across the world, and also of the Department of Promotion of Industry and Internal Trade, the Ministry of the Ministry of Commerce and Industry. It is very vital that the efficiency and effectiveness of shipyards and industry must be benchmarked to global standards with incorporation of global best practices. The yearly MOU targets with Department of Public Enterprises for PSU shipyards need to be reviewed based on performance indices determined by de demonstrated performance on build period, cost, quality metrics on ongoing naval, coast guard and other projects. Benchmarking of shipyards would also enable identification of Indian shipyards, which are at par with contemporary global players based on the key performance indicators. Shipyards which are below benchmark standards may be either merged with nearby better performing shipyards or may be incentivized to give them a chance to compete with better place shipyards. There should be a distinct capability with each and every PSU shipyard within the country for construction of specific type of vessel such as destroyers, brigades, corvettes, and OPVs, etc. Thereafter, utilization of such capability may be ensured by adopting a policy-based mechanism 
to grant orders for specific vessels which could be on nomination basis to the conglomerate or consortium of shipyards to build ships faster and of better quality. Therefore, it's very important that the shipyards, if they come together and start building ships together, by which, which is being followed very much in China, and if we use the same approach, we will be able to achieve. But we could, this similar approach could be extended for construction of commercial ships with public and private shipyards as per the capability. Ship design capability in India is at a basic level as compared to other Asian leaders in the field, such as China, South Korea, or Japan. Presently, most of the designs are imported from abroad in full or part, and there is no noteworthy innovation for indigenous R&D in this field. There is a need to encourage development of indigenous ship design capabilities and provide fiscal benefits to be given to R&D investments as they are also given in the pharma sector. I would like to conclude my address by reiterating the significance of shipbuilding industry towards nation building. Though indigenous warship design and construction capabilities has grown significantly in India, there is large scope for further growth for naval shipbuilding. The ongoing modernization process through indigenous means aims to create capabilities for accomplishing a range of missions across the entire spectrum of threats and challenges and in all four domains that the Indian Navy operates, that is the surface, subsurface, land and on, and on air. Besides, on the long-term capability development plan of the Indian Navy, I can firmly state that the future Indian Navy will be operating next generation platforms ranging from aircraft carriers, destroyers, frigates, corvettes, LPDs, nuclear powered submarines, and a very variety, wide variety of aviation assets like fighters, air early warning aircraft, reconnaissance aircraft, helicopters, unmanned platforms, and we are in a big way going to the, to the unmanned platforms. All of these would necessarily have indigenous state-of-art systems with cutting-edge technology and robust architecture to provide us with the requisite combat capability. In the past year itself, we have inducted first of the P-15 driver ships, that is INS Vishakhapatnam. We have inducted two new Calvary class submarines, Vela and Karanj. We have inducted the indigenous aircraft carrier Vikram in the Smarnim Vijay Varsh, and that is a befitting tribute to the indigenization efforts of the Indian Navy. To infuse latest technology and products into Indian Navy, the Naval Innovation and Indigenization Organization, NIIO, and Technology Development and Acceleration Cell, TDAC, has been set up since August 20. And this actively engages with the private industry to innovate and indigenize naval systems. In fact, we have a meeting every month with the private industry, and we have a VC in which we discuss various systems, we take them forward, and we are also coming out with lots of new, new solutions. Further, given the complexity and technology intensive nature of naval systems, Enhanced interaction through the NIIO with private sector, we have really pursued it relentlessly to form a partnership model rather than a mere customer and supplier relationship. In the last NIIO seminar, which most of you would have seen on the TV, which happened in July 2022, the Honorable Prime Minister launched 75 challenges. Actually, we have more than that challenges. But we, we are going to positively achieve 75 because being the 75th year of our Indian independence, this has been done under the IDEX print to induct new technologies and products into the Indian Navy. And this all will be done in a time-bound manner of one year by the next 15th August. 
we also i would also like to assure the audience of navy's unrelenting focus on indigenous ship construction and capacity development we are committed to partnering with the indian industry in our collective quest for greater self reliance with that let me wish the seminar and the participants a great amount of success thank you very much thank you admiral gormade for that uh, very insightful uh, thought provoking and uh, may also say a very frank assessment uh, of our uh, ship building capability as well as industry as well as the points you have brought out uh, as regards the way ahead uh, may i request uh, the president imf to present a memento to uh, the keynote speaker I also request the president, president to present a memento to our inaugural speaker, Admiral Pasticha. So, why should we head over to IMF, sir? Uh, with that, uh, ladies and gentlemen, we come to the end of our inaugural session and we'll now uh, break for tea. Uh, since it is about 10.50, uh, uh, sorry, uh, 10.50, I think uh, we'll take about 20 minutes and uh, we'll re-adjourn at about 11.10. Uh, Thank you.
May I request everyone to kindly settle down. We'll be starting session one now. Please settle down. Uh, we now start our uh, session one, which is on the topic uh, challenges for shipbuilding in India. The moderator for this session is Vice Admiral Dinesh Deshpande, retired. May I invite him to the moderator table? Vice Admiral Deshpande served in the Indian Navy for close to 40 years. He has been posted to various warships and shore establishments and also commanded Ayana Shivaji, the alma mater of marine engineers. In the flank rank, he has been the Admiral Superintendent of the Naval Dockyard at Mumbai, the Director General of Naval Projects at Vishakhapatnam, and was the controller of warships productions, production and acquisitions prior to his retirement in 2019. He has been awarded the Ati Vishishta Seva Medal and the Vishishta Seva Medal, and also commended thrice by the Chief of Naval Staff. He is presently involved in the fleet support ships program at HSL Vizag, as well as in the induction of AI and robotics in the defense sector. May I also invite the three speakers uh, who are there in session one, that is Captain Sudhakar, Captain Sunil Kumar of uh, GRSE, and uh, Commander Saurabh Jain of GSL. Found a sore up there. See there. Okay, I'll, I'll just try to get in touch with him. Maybe just outside somewhere. Uh, with that, uh, may I request uh, Admiral Deshpande to take the mic? VCNS, Admiral Gormade, Admiral Kocher, Commandant, National Defense Academy, delegates and guests, ladies and gentlemen. The topic for the first session of the seminar, which is present challenges for shipbuilding in India, and also with the way ahead, uh, if I may call it as a very topical topic, uh, and I use this word topical uh, from the point of view that this topic has been discussed uh, many a times on various fora. But the fact that it continues to be discussed uh, probably signifies the importance. And it also underlines the need uh, that the shipbuilding industry needs a lot of encouragement, a lot of incentives, a lot of reforms, or whatever you may like to call it. Uh, because today, that to me is the need of the hour because uh, the shipbuilding industry of what it was, uh, say probably two or three decades earlier and today, I personally feel uh, that not, not much of change has happened, especially in the private, ship, uh, private shipyards. Uh, with an overall defense export figure of close to about 15,000 crores and looking at an order book value of about 100,000 crores, uh, the 
ship building export figures are very, very marginal. They're probably in decimals. And therefore, there is, a, there is actually a crying need that we look at shipbuilding exports uh, to be coming up in a much, much larger way. If you look at the spread of the shipyards across the country, roughly about 28 of them, we have 20 private shipyards uh, in addition to the government-owned shipyards. And if you look at the business distribution of this 100,000 crore uh, order book value, on shipbuilding. And if I see what goes across to the private shipyards, uh, it is nearly, nearly absent. And that is the cause of concern because that is where we need to concentrate on. Uh, and that is where probably as a part of this session, our speakers will elaborate what are the remedies that are there, which we need to look at on how to get uh, the private shipyards back into the fray so that there is a growth in this much, much needed sector. So we have uh, with us uh, for the first session, uh, three speakers. The first speaker from Goa Shipyard, Captain Sunil Kumar, uh, sorry, from uh, Garden Reach, Captain Sunil Kumar. Uh, his bio data has been uh, elaborated in the brochure that's been given. He joined the GRSE in 2016 and thereafter has been handling GRSE's corporate plans and business strategy, and has thereafter been promoted to Chief General Manager in July 22, and thereafter picking on what should be the ways that we need to get uh, the private shipyards or into how to get the exports of, ship of shipping uh, into the entire game plan of uh, the country. So may I request uh, Captain uh, Sunil Kumar to please take the dais. Uh, some of the rules of the game for all the three speakers. Uh, may I request all speakers to conform uh, to the 20 minute uh, time frame that has been allocated. At the 18th minute, I'll give you a, a warning at, uh, with one bell and uh, two bells once you're, once you're done in terms of time. All yours. Uh, I'll check. Thank you, sir. Uh, Vice Admiral Gomadi. The Vice Chief of Naval Staff, Vice Admiral Kocher, Commandant NDA, Vice Admiral Pasricha, Captain Anand Dixit, the President IMF, and other very senior dignitaries present here today. I'm actually overwhelmed standing here in this August gathering. And I must confess that uh, this is the first time I'm speaking that even though I am the first speaker of the day as the session is concerned, I have very little to offer in terms of uh, new ideas. But definitely, I have uh, the experience of last six years in uh, doing corporate affairs and business development in GRSC. Day in and day out, I have been interacting with the powers that be in the Ministry of Defense as well as the Ministry of Shipping. So maybe I will just try to throw in a little bit more light on what exactly we can do. At the outset, sincere thanks to IMF for organizing this special session on present challenges of shipbuilding in India and the way ahead. Since morning, it has already been established that this is the need of the hour to propel India towards regaining its past glory and the fame as a shipbuilding and seafaring nation. In fact, I am more thankful to Admiral Pasricha for establishing the base of our history in shipbuilding and uh, the Vice Chief Sir for telling us a lot of things on how we need to do to go ahead. In fact, uh, just two days ago, I was attending a similar seminar on East Connect, where the CIA was discussing exactly the same thing. And a number of uh, people present here, that is the shipbuilders, were also present there. So we have been discussing this topic quite a lot. And I'm quite hopeful that in the near future, we will see concrete action coming out as a result of these discussions. Next slide, please. Uh, I've tried to keep my talk simple. I'm going to just cover this in three topics. Why shipbuilding industry for India, which I will rush through because it has already been established. Then challenges, they've been already spoken about, but a few more from my side. And of course, who needs to do what 
from the perspective that I've gathered in my personal experience. Believe it or not, India has been building ships for nearly 5,000 years. In fact, the Marathas, I'm talking about this because I'm in Pune, the Marathas under Ch Chhatrapati Shivaji Maharaj, as you know, have a very rich history in shipbuilding and naval warfare. Recently, I had the honor to be present on board Vikrant when the Prime Minister gave the ensign, the new naval ensign to the Indian Navy. And the Indian Navy has acknowledged Chhatrapati Shivaji Maharaj's contribution to our maritime history by drawing inspiration for the new ensign, which was unfurled that day on 2nd September. You're all well aware that modern shipbuilding in India began way back in 1735. In fact, uh, just to tell you, the ships that we built in India lasted for more than 30, 35 years, while those that the British made lasted just 12 to maybe 15 years. Uh, and in those days, a concentrated effort was made by the British to put down the Indian shipbuilding industry. My aim in, in going through all this is just to debunk some myths. One of these is that Europeans are pioneers of shipbuilding. It is not. We need to stake claim to our heritage and history. So the topic of today's seminar towards deliberating and helping India regain its past glory as a seafaring nation, especially when we've just become the fifth largest economy in the world, which, and of course, we will hope to achieve a 5 trillion target very soon. It has been revised, but hopefully the newly set target of 2027 should be met. You'll be surprised to know that uh, quite recently, as uh, you know, way back in uh, 2009, we were fifth in terms of shipbuilding in the global scenario. But today, I think we are way beyond 20 also. If you have to believe reports in the open domain, our shipbuilding contracts, especially in the merchant marine, is less than 1% in terms of uh, DWT that is. Now this has to be seen not, I mean, as a more bigger of an opportunity and a challenge to convert this opportunity. One of the major challenges is the absence of an ecosystem for shipbuilding in the country. I'm sure that people in Pune will be very familiar with ecosystem, especially with the auto industry really having a great ecosystem here. So this city, as mentioned earlier, definitely has a lot of potential. I come from Gardindi Shipbuilders and Engineers, one of the leading defense shipyards in the country, and the only one of its kind on the Eastern in Eastern India. At GRSC, we have built and delivered over 100 warships to our maritime defense forces. And overall, we are count stands at 788 vessels since inception. The ship INS Ajay has been mentioned before, is GRSC's rare distinction of having built the first warship for Indian Navy in India way back in 1961. With the Indian Navy and the Indian Coast Guard on the lookout for modern warships, at GRSC, we are building the anti, we have built the anti-submarine warfare corvettes and achieved 90% indigenous, con indigenous content, which is a testament to our quest for Atmanirvarth. Today, GRC is implementing an order book close to 24,000 crores and building 17 ships across five major projects, including one for export. So what does this mean in economic terms? It means that thousands of crores have gone to companies, not only shipyard, I mean, to companies including MSMEs that supply equipment and spares, while hundreds of crores have been expended in engaging skilled and unskilled labor. It means that thousands of jobs have been created either directly or indirectly. Just to give you some statistics, in financial year 21-22, GRC procured approximately 600 crores worth of material from MSMEs. Further, as we progress the execution of our order book, you can well imagine how much of this book is going to get pumped back into the local and national economy. The impact it will have on the economy, you can guess. 
been already bought out. It's a fair estimate that about 65% of the value addition in a new construction ship comes from manufacturers of shipboard material, equipment, and system. The shipyard itself adds only 35%. I am glad that these figures have already been endorsed at the highest level. Uh, recently, when Admiral Harikumar visited JRSC for the launch of a warship there, he said that 29 warships are being built at Indian shipyards and 39 more are being progressed. Now, Indian Navy is aspiring to be a 200 Navy warship and so is the Indian Coast Guard. The targets are 2025 and 2027. So, the, I mean, I foresee a rising demand for the commercial vessels also since the pandemic is receding and commercial shipbuilding is again taking off. But does it mean that the Indian shipbuilding industry is doing great? No. Unfortunately, it is not. We are not even scratching the surface of the global shipbuilding potential. But uh, based on my experiences, which I told earlier, I can tell you that clear steps are being contemplated and hopefully taken in the near future by the government and other stakeholders to address issues at hand. Some of the issues I will highlight subsequently. But all of us here should be proud that the Indian Navy has always led the way for shipbuilding in India. So much so that uh, there is an interesting, uh, in 2020-20, the consultancy firm KPMG came out with an excellent report on leveraging defense shipbuilding to catalyze India's shipbuilding industry. Another demand center for domestic shipbuilding is the ship repair and maintenance industry. Given the strategic location of India in international sea routes, this segment has huge potential for developing the shipbuilding industry. And uh, this potential, we already started tapping it, as you've seen at uh, CSL and uh, LNT. On 12th May 2020, our Honorable Prime Minister raised a clarion call to the nation, giving a kickstart to the Atmanirbhar Bharat Abhyan. It's, I mean, it's there everywhere today. This campaign is a vision of New India envisaged by the Honorable Prime Minister. The aim is to make the country and its citizens independent and self-reliant in all senses. With India's 7,516-kilometer coastline, and the need for sustained maritime influence for our growth, indigenous shipbuilding is inherently important to national security. Next slide, please. Next. Yeah, now just a few challenges that uh, uh, most of it uh, have been already mentioned, but one thing uh, we must understand is that what sets this industry apart from others. Ships are capital and labor intensive. Even a medium-sized vessel, whether a warship or a commercial one, costs several hundred crores. One also needs to take note is the diverse nature of equipment that goes into the making of a ship. Now today, I'm talking about commercial. Go Green is a focus for global fleet operators and ship owners. Shipbuilders worldwide are in a dilemma as to what shall be the new powering solutions in future. The Indian shipbuilder, shipbuilding industry, as you know, is anchored by around 27 to 30. Numbers vary here and there, both private and public, and has a reported capacity to build large vessels up to 4 lakh TWT. But the industry presently is performing well below its true potential. There are many structural gaps in the industry. Over-dependence on defense shipbuilding, lack of orders for commercial shipbuilding, and poor access to finance, I would say, is central to all other challenges. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, while the shipyards play an important role in shipbuilding, I believe that the ancillary industry plays an even vital role. At GRSC, we have endeavored to create an entire ecosystem of shipbuilding in the region and I will not say that we have been very successful. Apart from placing orders with local industry, more than 60% of our local procurement came from MSMEs in FY2122, and we hope to continue this procurement. We have also tied up with other shipyards, which has already been mentioned to use, uh, LNT was mentioned, but we are also working with TWL to use their idle capacity today. 
with some of the smaller vessels being built at Titagat. We are also keen to work with other capable shipbuilders to build vessels for the inland waterways and even for exports, because I see that is the only option and the way forward. GRC has tied up with the Shama Prasad Mukherjee port of Calcutta for the use of dry docks, which were lying unutilized earlier, thereby addressing the need for such facilities along the East Coast. Most of you would be aware that a large part of the ship repair work, non-OEM related, is outsourced by shipyards to MSMEs with the requisite capabilities. So in all I'm trying to say is that collaboration is the key to success in shipbuilding. Another word of caution that we would I would like to put forth is that the experience in undertaking procurement from MSMEs and local ancillary is not short of challenges. So while attempting to become part of the domestic and I would say more importantly, the global shipbuilding supply chain, I urge the industry players and especially the MSMEs to kindly note of certain key factors like quality assurance, project management, technical know-how and financial prudence. Major challenges some more is that ships are unique and non-standard, especially when you go to defense and our size and scale have not reached levels so that we can, we can become globally competitive. This is what we must aim at. Uh, be globally competitive rather than being competitive within the country. Skill labor. If the shipbuilding industry has a gap, labor tends to migrate. We need to look at how we can have a continuous uh, you know, employment of this labor. Very, very important thing is financial stress. We are all aware of large shipyards buckling down because of financial stress. Then the logistic infrastructure in the country, though it is improving, is not uh, really come to the state that, you know, you can build things in very different places, ship it to one place for integration and things like that. This is where maybe the coastal shipping and the inland waterways might come in to play a big role. Major, major challenge presence of OEMs, example, manufacturer of engines, we do not have here today. And nobody is going to come and start if you have, if you don't have scale. So these are the issues that needs to be uh, addressed at the grassroots levels. Now, in the absence of a domestic ancillary industry, shipyards have to rely on foreign manufacturers, and you're well aware how difficult it is for a public sector shipyard to get a GTE. Now, on the global scale, earlier we were worried about maybe Japan, Korea, then came in China. Today, till uh, Vietnam and Philippines are also marching ahead. Now, Sri Lanka was also there, but recently they've taken a setback. But these are all issues, global issues that we need to look at and internally consolidate and collaborate so that, you know, as India, we fight the battle. People will be surprised to note that the labor costs in India are high. We, though we perceive our labor to be cheap, in global, when you compare it globally, it is not so. I am told, in fact, I've read a report which says, in Japan, you can make a ship at 25% lesser cost, considering all factors. Everyone says we need to improve our efficiency. Our man hours per CGT is very high. But people don't realize that the weather in Korea or Japan and the weather in India, where a person has to do labor, is totally different. But yes, we need to strike a balance and we need to become globally competitive. Another one interesting point, which uh, I remember from Admiral Harish, who ex DGND, is that he said a shipyard has to sell first and construct later. Whereas, unlike most other industries, the seller manufactures first and then sells later an important aspect which actually requires a lot of support from the government to ensure, at least in the starting stages, that it is set right. Uh, next slide, please. Yeah, now uh, coming to some action areas. Many of this has already been uh, spoken about regarding an institution that can advise the government on national maritime policy, including commercial and defense sector. Why I'm saying this is presently, Individual ministries are working individually and the synergy and the focus is not there to get us results. In fact, this should be something I would say akin to a Gati Shakti program where a combination of around 17 to 18 ministries are been, has been done so far. 
Now, the government needs to create by law, I'm saying by law, a stream of funding for shipbuilding projects to ship owners. This is one aspect which so far has not been touched upon. But who are you building the ships for? Especially the commercial ones. For the ship owners, what is his skin in the game? That needs to be addressed. Because I am working on these kind of challenges so that you know the commercial shipbuilding orders take off. We, I mean, the shipbuilding industry has been given infrastructure status, but to the ship owners, the loans are not coming through. The shipbuilders, especially the public sector, may not be in need of loan, but for the private shipbuilding, the small players, loans are required and need to be facilitated. A uh, mention was made about taxation. I just want to highlight that the input tax is 18% for many items. Output, that is the tax that uh, GST, that we can claim at the time of sale of the ship is 5%. And the time gap for a ship building project ranges normally from 18 months, 36 or beyond. It is for you to imagine what is the working capital that is locked up and the element of taxation in the tax difference itself becomes a very big chunk. Needs to be addressed. People have been made aware of these kind of things at the highest possible forum. But unfortunately, the GST Council does not discuss these issues. The subsidy scheme, yes, I recommend that it should go to 30% and it should be continued further. There was a talk about uh, discontinuing this policy, but that is not going to happen. And my recent discussions with the IWA and the Ministry of Shipping, I am told that they are going to, thinking of increasing it to 30%. So hopefully it should come through. Then the policy, the Indian Maritime Vision 2030 document, much talked about, but doesn't address seriously shipbuilding issues. Talks about port, infrastructure development, inland waterways, and various other aspects. In fact, somebody was mentioning that the shipbuilding budget has been hijacked for port development. So that's how things are presently because shipbuilding has not yet received the true attention that it requires. So one major challenge is to transform all these initiatives like what we have heard so much about, port modernization, Sagar Mala, inland waterways, everything to concrete orders. You will be surprised to know that nine designs have been made by the IWA, uploaded on their website from 2019. Till now, there's no consensus on which ship to build. That needs to be addressed. Hopefully, in the next coming three to six months, there's a competition going on for identifying that. It will happen. Then, I was discussing with a... I'm going into practical aspects because the theory has already been covered a lot. I was discussing with a, a ship operator. He wants to buy a ship. And he came to us saying, can you buy a ship which can work on the Hooghly? Can it go on to the Brahmaputra? Why? Because of the Indo-Bangladesh protocol. There is a lot of potential. To move goods in the Northeast, there is a lot of potential. But the rivers are the easiest. But we can't do night navigation there. So you can, you can travel only during the day. And that too, anybody who has traversed the Brahmaputra would know how the river shifts and the uh, the depth conditions. So these things have to be addressed at the government level. Government is working on it. In fact, you would be surprised to know that there are dredging contracts in place, but depths are not available. So these issues need to be addressed. That's why I said a lot of things the government has to act upon. We can only be supporting caste in these issues. Shipbuilding clusters clearly mentioned. Uh, the vice chief sir has already mentioned the clusters coming up. Hopefully, uh, they will do well. And uh, we need to leverage our diplomacy and trade agreements to persuade globally renowned ancillary companies to set up manufacturing bases in our country. They need to be given incentives. Our DAs have been given 50,000 US dollars every year to promote uh, defense equipment abroad. Only 20% of it has been used so far. Then one most very important thing that I want to suggest is at the bottom. That is, we need to boost our exports and the present setup of export promotion needs to be revamped. 
We need to create bodies such as Sibat in Israel and Rosoboron export, which everybody may be aware of from Russia, with a mandate for identifying potential export projects and achieving the export targets. In terms of FDI, you may be happy to note that a team from India, a government level team, is in UAE searching for FDI with a member from GRSE. The major shipyards need to collaborate now. Uh, next, please. This has already been told. Collaboration is the key. We need to increase our operational efficiencies. And one way is to adopt internationally acknowledged matrices and try to meet them to the best of our ability. We need to use our local demand as an opportunity to build up long-term capability in the next 10 years and become competent internationally. We can't wait to see, let the opportunity come. We need to be ready to grab. And we need to focus on standardization of non-critical components for use across shipyards for different types of vessels. Identify dual use equipment in consonance with the maritime forces to achieve higher production volumes and their sustainability. Also, we need to institutionalize a mechanism for carrying out vendor identification, evaluation, and registration, which can be ported across shipyards. Now it is being done individually. And yes, invest in own R&D to evolve new products ahead of global players. We should not be followers. Focus on leveraging the government initiatives such as IDEX and MRGS. MRGS is not a gun. It is Mission Raksha Gyan Shakti. Uh, in conclusion, the Ministry of Ports, next please. In, in the Ministry of Ports, Shipping and Waterways website states that the nodal responsibility of the entire shipbuilding and ship repair industry in India rests with the Ministry of Ports, Shipping and Waterways. With the Government of India working toward development of national waterways, there is potential for huge demand for barges and small ships. And if the recent initiatives by IWI bear fruit, a new chapter in shipbuilding for inland transportation is about to be scripted. The last few years, the Navy has also been in the forefront for addressing challenges in shipbuilding. So I would like to conclude on a positive note by stating that the future is very bright for shipbuilding as all the ingredients are there. However, the shipbuilders, the ancillary industry, and the government needs to put the right foot forward and convert this existing challenge into golden opportunity. Thank you, Chayan. Thanks. Our next uh, speaker is Commander Saurabh Jain from the Goa Shipyard. Uh, he joined Goa Shipyard in 2017 and thereafter has steered various critical initiatives and policies to improve the operational efficiency of the yard. Uh, presently, he is working on uh, their prestigious project, which is the 1135 uh, project, which is being built in India. And today he is going to talk about the enhancement of exports by shipyards and the challenges to be overcome. Commander Jim, the stage is yours. Thank you, sir. Vice Admiral Gormade, ECNS, Vice Admiral Kocha, Commandant NDA, Senior Officers, Distinguished Guests, Ladies and Gentlemen. I am representing the Goa Shipyard Limited, and it's an honor for me to be present, present my views on the Indian shipbuilding and related exports. I aim to put forth my analysis on Indian shipbuilding industry and enhancement of exports of business platforms. <laughs> the presentation will be covered in the following heads. Before analyzing, going to the analysis of export, I'd like to touch upon the Indian share of uh, global imports, which stands at a huge 11% presently on an average. 
This is due to the requirement of maintaining a sizable armed forces, the state of the art technology. However, in the bargain, our reliance on imports has been too high. Though we have tried a lot to manufacturing under license or TOT, but uh, our dependence still remains very high. And we have not been able to shed the tag of largest importer, one of the largest importers. Now, talking about sports, uh, exports, the things are changing for good. As you can see on this graph, that the exports have risen in the last five to 10 years at a rate of 35% CAGR, CAGR to cross 13,000 crores uh, in 2122. And that is uh, rising from 2000, around 2015 16. Though we have risen to uh, about 23rd rank as per CIPRI, our uh, share is limited to only 0.17% of the global uh, exports. And this is quite alarming. Though MOD has uh, set a target of uh, $5 billion by 2025, and a lot of initiatives have been taken in this regard, and results are also coming, but we need to do uh, much better. About three de decades back, the European and American shipyards enjoyed a mere, major share of global shipbuilding. The Japanese during 1960 to 90, Koreans post 90, and Chinese have emerged as a major shipbuilding nation. They presently account for almost 80% of the annual ship production in terms of tonnage. India, as this has been dotted in the previous presentations also, it's just about 1% presently, and which need to be scaled up. And my talk today essentially focuses on increasing this share. Let's now look at the correct ship build, uh, current shipbuilding capability of Indian shipyards. Presently, we have uh, four DPOCUs, which are under, operating under administrative control of Ministry of Defense, followed by CSL, which is operating under the administrative control of Ministry of Shipping. And among the private plates, we have a uh, major is LNT and supported by various other uh, uh, smaller shipyards. Presently, the export order book of shipyards is just about 0.4% of the current order book position of approximately 90 to 1 lakh uh, 100,000 crores as uh, and Will Deshpande had clearly brought out in his opening talk. Since the design and construction of majority of the platforms is indigenous, it's, I feel it's the right time to unleash the export potential of Indian shipyards and the ancillary industry. This slide shows the correct order book position of PSA shipyards, which totals to about 1,13,000 crores presently. Annually, the turnover, if you see, is just about uh, 12,000 crores annually for these uh, PSU shipyards. Uh, however, because of the modernization which have been undertaken in the past and uh, which everybody of us keeps crying that we have spare capacity, I think we can safely assume we have a capacity of about 1.5 times. Though, So, combinedly, the shipyards can do about 17,000 crores annually on an average, presently. This is an analysis of the capital budget. Uh, this is only for the shipbuilding. On an average, we've been spending about 10,000 crores annually. And even if we optimistically assume it will grow by a rate of about 8%, it will touch about just about 24,000 by 2030. Though it will get determined by your budgetary constraints, political will, procedures, and technical hurdles. Now, comparing the statistics which I've shown in the last two slides, if envisage capacity of shipyards and the capital expenditure on defense shipbuilding are compared, we see a significant surplus capacity which is available with the shipyards, which can be gainfully utilized for exports. I'm talking about this uh, blue uh, shaded region. Having talked about the capacity of Indian shipyard for exports, I will not touch upon the global shipbuilding scenario. World military expenditure in 2020 was estimated at 1981 billion USD. The share of uh, global uh, shipbuilding has risen from of uh, share of GDP, global GDP, it has risen from 2.2 to 2.4 percent, hinting at higher military expenditure. Though initiatives like Atmanirbhar Bharat has been a great enabler in self-reliance, export is the required trust and an enabler to offset these imports and give the required numbers to the Indian defense industry to sustain in the future. 
In the global arms exports, US tops the chart with 33% share with 9.9 .9 billion USD annually. As I heard earlier, India is way down at 0.17%. On the contrary, India has a tag of second largest importer of defense equipment, only behind Saudi Arabia. In the next 20 to 30 years, there is an opportunity of about 835 billion USD, USD for the defense building. As a slide shows, most of the most, the most lucrative business is the petrol craft business, which is about 250 billion USD up to 2030. And for which there is no dearth of experience or expertise or capability with the Indian shipyards, and which needs to be certainly leveraged. This is analysis of the defense shipbuilding deals in the past few years. This shows that the, mostly the demand is coming from the developing countries who are looking to secure their coastal areas and increase their areas of influence. This slide depicts the top 10 developing countries where the demand is coming from. These countries are not only looking to purchase, but also generate self-reliance through TOT and collaborations. Data of last five years supports that the petrol crafts are the most widely sold products. 81% of the demand is generated through petrol crafts, FACs, frigates, OPVs, and submarines. An analysis of the export market reveals that market will witness the development of less expensive warships and customer will prefer construction in its own country under license or DOT. UK and US warships are generally found to be too sophisticated and very expensive, and they're not very attractive. Therefore, US and UK warships are facing a stiff competition from European shipbuilders, particularly Germany, France, and Russia. Germany and France together have more than 60% of the military export market of naval shipbuilding contracts. Russian shipyards used to have a thriving export business, and their biggest customers were India, Vietnam, and Algeria. However, of late, due to the geopolitical situation, their business is sliding down. China shipbuilders are becoming increasingly competitive in terms of ratio to cost to combat power they can deliver. In this scenario, India, Indian shipyards can focus on developing countries whose numbers are as high as 195. These countries do not want very high sophisticated or technologically high-end platforms due to their fund constraints, which makes cheaper project, product, products offered by Indian shipyards much more attractive. These are the few recent exports. I have cited a few examples which uh, successfully Indian shipyards have exported. Four of these successful exports amounting to about 200 million USD have been done by GSL. And recently, the, we are executing one Sri Lankan dock for the, uh, for the Sri Lankan Navy. Others have been patrol boats, auxiliary craft, uh, various by GRSE and LNT. These, if you note, know, these exports were related to small and mid-sized vessels catering to requirements of developing countries. Thus, Indian shipyards need to market these products and look to capture a larger supply of the global, global exports of these vessels. There is also a need to have a long-term partnership with, with upcoming defense hubs in inspiring countries such as Australia, UAE, Saudi Arabia, etc. These countries have shown a strong growth in their defense industry and now are focusing on developing indigenous capabilities. These countries are ready to collaborate, which should be leveraged by Indian shipyards. In today's interdependent supply chain, there is an opportunity for Indian industry to be part of the global supply chain of major global players. Part construction, joint ventures, etc., are another model of gaining international exposure. MSC, as MSMEs, has, which has been covered in detail in the previous presentation, have a great potential in this field, and they can be Indian offset partners. Another uh, aspect to ponder is the availability of expertise and capability of advanced weapon-intensive platforms such as destroyers, frigates, and corvettes in the country which has not been tapped for export market. These platforms are high value, which each frigate costing about 500 billion USD, Corvette on an average about 300. It is forecasted that the frigate market will witness 368 new hulls over the next 20 years, with a total acquisition value of about 118, 183 billion USD, making up for about 15% of the global, global defense market. Therefore, even a small buyer 
will give a major boost to our exports. And on top of that, these indigenous platforms can be uh, fitted with indigenous systems recently developed, such as Brahmos, Hamsa, IRL, ITTL, SAM systems. Uh, the list goes on. There is no denying that Russia has been one of the best design houses in the varied designs of defense platforms. However, in the current geopolitical situation, Russia will find it hard to sell these products as it has been doing in the past with these. India has a past experience in manufacturing a lot of uh, products, uh, in fact, platforms under collaboration with Russia, such as 124 Aries, and now we are doing 1135. This provides an opportunity to collaborate these and market these products with Russian design, where the design can come from Russia and these uh, platforms can be manufactured in Indian shipyards. Another opportunity is driven by growing tensions in Asia Pacific region due to Chinese threats of expansionism into the East and Southeast seas, especially over the nine dash line. This opportunity needs to be created into orders from countries such as Vietnam, Indonesia, Philippines, Myanmar, Thailand. So a lot of initiatives have been taken in the past, but uh, not much has realized, got realized into orders. Having covered the opportunities, now, now let's look at a few of the steps taken by government to boost exports. Uh, some of this has already been covered in the previous slide, which I skipped through. Defense Production Export Promotion Policy 2020. It is an overarching guiding document. Uh, export promotion cell has been set up at uh, DDP MOD which is highly proactive. It has been uh, coordinating with all the stakeholders, provincial countries, PSUs, private sector. They've been calling everybody and making them interact uh, uh, during the bilateral and the G2G meetings. The foreign trade policy has export promotion schemes, exemption on duties and tax and other facilitative measures. The export promotion body advises the government towards promoting exports. Now, leveraging embassies and diplomatic channels, this also has been covered previously. Uh, the engagement of with defense statutes have been done at the very highest level. Financial support, though it has not been utilized in the appropriately, but a lot of financial uh, support has been given to defense statutes to market uh, Indian products. There have been 85 countries which have been uh, notified under class A, B, and C, with CAT A having the highest potential for exports. More and more industries and PSUs are being included in the bilateral meetings with potential countries. Another thing is that private firms are being facilitated to make use of certificates issued by government agencies for marketability, marketability of their products overseas. In 1920 alone, 10 such certificates were issued, certifying that their products were fit for military use. Exim Bank is providing lucrative uh, financing schemes for the defense LOCs, uh, something like line of credit and bias credit. Uh, out of 4.3 billion uh, LOCs allo uh, allotted, 9 930 million has been related to defense LOC, which is about just about 25%. DAP 2022 has a pr uh, pr provision for IDDM, giving preference to Indian companies. Strategic partnership model allows Indian companies to collaborate with foreign OEMs and absorb the TOT and upskill. Now, for the first time, Indian government is putting a ban on itself for importing uh, products and trying to boost the indigenous manufacturing. The first positive list was promulgated in August 20, second in May 21, third in April 22, and recently in August 22, about 2,500 items have been notified. SOPs for the export of munition items have been simplified. Powers have been delegated to DRDOs and CMDs of PSUs to promote exports and get it, uh, obtain relevant export orders. NOC for export orders have been simplified as immediate and NOC is given for repeat orders of same product to same entity. In the next few slides, I'll discuss the strengths and weaknesses of Indian shipping, uh, shipping industry. Uh, we, are, we have all been discussing about this 1%. So I think the Modest target would be to go up to about 5% by about 2027. And repair segment, presently market share is about just about 2% to go up to about 
the design capability of Indian industry is currently quite strong and capable. In the last 60 years, it has produced sophisticated designs of advanced platforms such as aircraft carriers, bestowers, frigates, forwards, etc., which are compar comparable to best in the industry. DD has done a stellar role, as we have discussed in the, in the previous uh, few talks also. They have done about 19 designs, which got translated into 90 ships. And uh, this, what I'm trying to say is the capabilities available within India. And shipyards also have uh, have now evolved from doing mid-sized vessels and auxiliary vessels. They are doing the most sophisticated warship designs, ASW shallow water craft, NGO PVs, uh, then new generation missile vessels. All these things being done by shipyards themselves. That speaks volumes of the capability. Low labor cost is one of the major factors in Indian shipyards to be competitive and edge out global players. So, what are the problem areas? There are very limited yards which can do a, more than 10,000 uh, tonnage of ships. So that is the constraint what we have right now. Presently, Indian shipyards are contented in wine for Indian shipbuilding orders and not very aggressive in international contracts. Past track record of time and cost overruns and affected the brand image. Lack of experience in big international shipbuilding orders has not helped either. Lack of indigenous equipment, this also be covered, like main engines, propulsion and all, and some of the weapons sensors. This not available in India, sourcing from abroad is a bit costly, affecting the costing overall costing. Availability of skilled and experienced manpower is also a matter of concern. Absence of strong ancillary industry is also affecting performance. Synergy between government and private shipyards is almost non-existent. Non uh, whatever is happening between uh, shipyards and the private industry is only through tendering process and anti which are long, tedious, and not a very long-term solution. So this needs to be formalized for, for a strategic, supporting strategic partnership between the private and the public shipyards. Capital intensive industry, yes, every, all of us know that it's very, very, very uh, capital intensive industry and a lot of big shipyards have failed. Coming to the recommendation, sir, I'll just rush to these points because time, I think the time is running out. Demand for potential overseas customers needs to be identified and pursued. Diplomatic assets needs to be leveraged. Continuous monitoring and existing uh, upcoming and existing opportunities. Uh, there is a very interesting development which has taken place, uh, something known as National Bank of Strategic Capability Development is being set up, which is primarily to fund the MSMEs and the Indian defense uh, sector, wherein uh, initially 100 crores will be allocated by the government. And the offset obligations which are not met, the firms, uh, those firms will be told to give loans under this to, uh, to different uh, uh, MSMEs or uh, private players, so they can uh, raise capital for exploring and export opportunities as well as indigenous, uh, indigenous requirements. Joint ventures, TOT should be widely encouraged. Adoption of multi shipyard modular block construction strategy in line with the global trend. To our collaboration and multi national along the lines of European projects. Investment in RD should be encouraged. Development of maritime clusters should be implemented. Defense corridors in Tamil Nadu and UP have been the steps in the right direction. Shipbuilding industry should coordinate with academia. One major point I want to make here is that the government shipyards, especially the PSUs, uh, experience challenges in following government guidelines, procedures, which certainly affect their competitiveness and the costing. So this majorly has to be looked on how more autonomy can be given to PSUs. Participation of MSMEs cannot be discounted. Right now, we have about 8,643 MSMEs working in the different sector. It should be targeted to at least 16,000 in the next three years if we really want to give boost to the exports and the indigenous defense industry. In my conclusion, I would like to just draw your attention to this graph, sir. Currently, our defense manufacturing is hovering at about 70,000 crores. 
which is likely to grow at 13.5 percent this year, and by 2025, it's likely the government has a target of 1 lakh 70 to 75 thousand crores. In the present estimates, about thousand crores will go into the requirement of domestic uh, defense requirements, and there will be a surplus of about 70 to 75 thousand, which needs to be utilized for exports. Concluding, sir. I would like to reiterate that Indian shipbuilding has a huge potential to expand and to be a major player in global shipbuilding. Disruptive changes are essential, and R&D needs no emphasis in design of future ready ships. In addition to defence ships, policy framework should promote local construction of merchant marine as well. Lastly, government should look at synergizing efforts between PSUs, private, R&D, and academia to achieve the aim of achieving five billion USD exports by 2025. Thank you, Anjay. Thank you, Sagar. Our next topic for the first session is by Captain Sudhakar, who is the officer in charge of the Center of Excellence at INS Shivaji, and he would be talking about the challenges in integrating cap C items. In worship building, may I request uh, Sudhakar please take this. Vice Admiral Sadish Gurmade, Vice Chief of Naval Staff, Vice Admiral Ajay Kochak, Kamnad National Defence Academy, Vice Admiral Yam Deshpande, Honourable Chair of the Session, Distinguished Guests, Ladies and Gentlemen, Good morning to all of you. Uh, it's a privilege for me to take part in a forum like this with participation of so many stalwarts and uh, senior senior officers and industry moguls of uh, shipbuilding industry. Also, I'm very happy to share the dais with my commandery. Commander Jain was my commander on board Anvij, and I was a senior engineer, and we were a we were a formidable team on board. <laughs> I shall be presenting my paper on the topic challenges in integrating CAT C items in warship building. I think after two back-to-back -back presentations on uh, the holistic and a big picture of the ship building trends in the world and the country, my paper might look uh, might appear to be a total face shift talking about pumps, valves, nuts and bolts. Uh, while although a very narrow zone, uh, it's still important. And, uh... yeah, I shall be covering my presentation under the following heads. So I'll continue with the scripts. <clears throat> the maritime perspective, uh, the maritime capability perspective plan envisages both levels of about 200 ships by 2027, in line with the government's vision of transforming Indian Navy from buyer's navy to builder's navy. Concurrent warship building activity is underway across multiple shipyards in the country. About 39 ships and submarines are at various stages of construction, while orders for 33 platforms are likely to be placed in the near future. Warship construction program involves purchase of a large number of items from numerous indigenous and foreign suppliers. This paper focuses on issues pertaining to a particular class of items which are procured by the shipyards from the indigenous industry, more so from the ecosystem of the MSMEs that work in collaboration with the shipyards. A brief background about the topic before I discuss the challenges. The equipment supplied for construction of new warships is broadly classified into four categories, as flashed on slide. Cat A items are procured by the by the shipyards from the vendors, nominated by the navy on STA basis, and are to conform to the promulgated SOTRs. Cat under uh, items under Cat B are procured by the shipyards from the vendors, shortlisted and approved by the navy on LTA basis, and are to conform to the promulgated SOTRs. Cat C items comprise mainly the quartz equipment, which can be procured by the shipyards from any vendor. In this case, uh, only the generic specifications of the equipment are provided by the navy. 
Tab C star items include general equipment which can be sourced from any vendor by the shipyard. These items are required to conform to the specifications promulgated by the Navy. Examples of various items with their categorization are flashed on slide. A review of the progress of new construction warships in various shipyards reveals that the management of CAT C and CAT C star items is a common bottleneck causing delays. The most prominent items among these are valves of various specifications. In addition, delays have also been experienced in supply of pneumatic fittings, doors, hatches, and transformers. Moving on to the challenges associated with the management of CAT C and C star items. DME specs, NES, ASTM, and other reference standards clearly spell out the material specs to be conformed to. These specs include the com uh, chemical composition, mechanical properties, conformance to casting, and forging quality class. Emphasis on using virgin metals or approved scrap is also specified. While the documentation is comprehensive enough, the only way of verifying the conformance to these specs is by scrutiny of the test certificate from NABL accredited laboratories submitted by the vendors. Instances of items failing the checks by QA team or post fitment on board, in spite of holding a valid NABL certificate, are observed often in the shipyards. In the present system, there exists no scrutiny of the proficiency of NABL accredited laboratories. DME specs and SQAP specify radiographic testing of components manufactured through casting. It is, this is a positive method for detecting porosity, inclusions, cracks, and voids in the internal structure of the components. However, many a time, the components are cleared based on the RT reports without scrutinizing the RT films thoroughly, since only a, a qualified technician can scrutinize and interpret RT films. As a result, there are instances of items getting cleared at the inspection stage and subsequently failing due to material defects. It is therefore essential that interpretation of RT films is con conducted by qualified personnel. QAP specify uh, the components or the critical region of components for which radio radiographic testing is mandatory. QAP is also referred to the certain standards which specify the procedure to be followed for radiographic examination and acceptance. Inclusion of reference standards in the QAPs or the TSPs of the drawing does not necessarily guarantee a flawless radiographic examination because the selection of the right reference value or a parameter is left to the interpretation of the technician of the laboratory who's carrying out the radi radiographic examination. Instead, if the same conditions can be specified in the QAPs, it can help the manufacturers to choose the right enable accredited lab, which has the capability to perform the testing specified. Further, such QAPs bring out uh, the testing specifications very objectively, leaving no ambiguity for the interpretation by the technician. It is observed that there's a long waiting time at the type testing agencies. A close look at the type testing requirements reveal that majority of the tests can be performed in the manufacturer's premises itself. Very few tests like ABN and SBN measurement, shock test, or chemical composition of the material actually require the expertise or infrastructure of an external agency. Shipyards can identify in consultation with the Navy, enable accredited labs which have the capability to undertake various type tests. By these uh, steps, the time delay for carrying out type testing being experienced on, in the ongoing projects can be contained. Many internal components of valves and pumps like seals, soft seats, glam packings, O-rings, and gaskets are manufactured with polymer-based materials. These are generally quartz items and are cleared at inspection stage based on test certificates provided by the suppliers. During the pressure testing conducted by the inspection agencies or the shipyards, items fail the test due to leaks from the seals due to failure of these soft components. The issue brought out regarding unreliable lab certification is relevant for these components as well. Further, the shelf life of these polymer-based components is limited, whereas on many occasions, these components end up lying in the manufacturer's stores followed by shipyard stores for a very long time. Because of this long layoff time, they would have outlived their shelf life before they are tested or fitted on board, thereby leading to failures. There are a number of checks which are to be witnessed by the QAE with 100% quantum of check as per the QAPs. In addition, there are numerous other serials where sample checks are to be conducted. Besides, there is a large quantum of documentation which needs to be scrutinized by the CQAE on site along with the checks. It can be inferred that the load on QA teams with respect to inspection of CAT C items is enormous and does not commensurate with the limited manpower available. It is therefore it therefore invariably leads to a situation where these critical checks are undertaken only for partial quantity. Quality assurance of CAT C items is the responsibility of the shipyards. However, there are some CATSI items for which the QA cover is to be provided by the CQAE as per the current format. The intent of categorizing items under CATSI is to speed up the process of their supply 
by reducing the timelines involved for obtaining Navy's approval for the drawings and QAPs and CQA inspection. In order to address the overload on CQAE and the associated delays, it is recommended that QA cover for all CATSI items be made the responsibility of the shipyards who in turn are to ensure it through a suitable class or uh, suitable third party agencies. I shall be covering the few challenges which are related to the MSMEs. The public procurement policy for micro and small enterprises order was issued by the Ministry of MSME in 2012, and an amendment order was issued in 2018. As per these orders, a list of 350 items reserved for purchase from micro and small enterprises has also been promulgated. In order to conform to these guidelines, the shipyards are bound to place orders for these reserved category items on MSEs, on MSEs mandatorily. Over and above the reserved items, there are many other CATSI items which are generally manufactured and supplied by the MSMEs. Therefore, it emerges that the CATSI item suppliers arena is dominated by the MSMEs. In the recent, uh, in, in the recent shipbuilding projects, instances of a few MSMEs not able to honor the contracts awarded by the shipyards have come to light. It is observed that some of these firms actually quote with minimal margins to emerge as L1 and end up bagging multiple orders. However, they do not have adequate capacity to produce the numbers in the required timelines, resulting in delays. Also, to make good for the low quotes, the firms end up compromising on quality of raw materials, manufacturing processes, sourcing of quality subcomponents, etc. As a result, their products face a high rejection rate during CQA or TPA checks. The high rejection rate coupled with COVID-induced escalation of prices of raw materials, particularly of iron and copper, put insurmountable financial burden on the vendors. Consequently, the vendors back out without honoring the contracts. Some shipbuilding projects are conceived to be shared between two shipyards, wherein one shipyard becomes the lead shipyard. The lead shipyard is mandated to execute the construction of the first or initial few platforms. In such projects, it is a general practice for the second shipyard to place orders on the same set of vendors as the lead shipyard. This has led to a situation wherein the orders are accumulated with the vendors who either uh, do not have the capacity or financial health to honor the contracts. In addition to the dis uh, issues discussed so far, there are a few other issues pertaining to MSMEs which affect the warship production. Firms do not procure and stock adequate raw material for ensuring timely supply of products. Instead, they carry out the production as and when the raw material is available at affordable price, which in turn causes avoidable delays in delivery of items. Over the last two to three years, the emphasis on compliance of all transactions to GEM has steadily increased. While the firms established within the ecosystem of the shipyards have got used to the gem procedures, the new entrants uh, find it difficult to sync with the procedures, leading to a lot of avoidable delays in processing various stages of contracts. Also, the technical discrepancies on gem platform itself also hamper the procurement the, by shipyards. It is observed that not many bigger firms uh, participate in the bidding process pertaining to CAT-C items. Some of the salient reasons are flashed on the slide. Uh, they cannot compete with MSMEs in quoting lower prices for the requisite standards and quality. Secondly, the quantities required by the shipyards for warship building projects are small and spread over a long duration, and the bigger firms do not find it economical to take up these orders. Procedural delays involved in various stages of the contract, including obtaining approvals for the drawings, TSPs, QAPs, either from the shipyards or multiple agencies in the Navy, customer hold points during stage inspections, processing of the payments, etc., discourage the bigger firms from bidding. It is observed that there is no robust mechanism of monitoring and following up the orders by the shipyards once the contract is concluded. The firms keep coming back to the shipyard seeking extensions of the delivery period, and shipyards are not left with an option other than obliging them. Not exercising a check on such extensions, even if it is related to non-critical items, can manifest into major delays in the project. Also, a genuine assessment of the capacity and capability of the vendors prior placing orders will go a long way in identifying the right firms for the project. While DME 463 is very comprehensive and defines the specifications clearly, it may take some more time for the vendors to fully comply with it, particularly in light of the fact that the valve manufacturing vendor base is not very broad. COVID not only led to the loss of two valuable years, but also destabilized the financial standing of many MSMEs involved in valve manufacturing. As a result, the orders placed in the recent years just before the onset of COVID have got extremely delayed. I would like to present a, a case study on a warship construction project which is underway in two different shipyards, bringing out some of the issues discussed so far. Hull valves of the ships under this project had NABL lab certificate for casting and chemical analysis, but during the pressure testing at shipyard, leaks were observed through the valve body, indicating defective casting or material defects. 
Similarly, the polymer-based internal components of hull valves had uh, requisite test certificates. However, they failed during pressure testing at shop floor due to leaks from seals, indicative of failure of the polymer-based internals. Matching plug sheets of uh, emergency supply system, which are made of rubber components, had test certificates but had shown repeated failures. The valve manufacturers have been approaching a Vishakhapatnam-based pipe testing agency, which offers to undertake the complete set of tests. However, due long queue, it is observed that there is a long waiting time for getting the type testing of a new valve done. All hull valves and line valves of diameter above 100 millimeters are required to undergo CQA inspection in this project, despite being classified as CAT C star. Doors and arches, transformers, emergency connection, changeover boxes are the other examples of the items which are classified as CAT C and C star, yet have CQA uh, inspection mandatory. A few firms which are the contract for supply of valves, transformers, lip castings, doors and arches have backed out of their contracts. In addition, certain other firms which have the, who have the contracts for supply of valves, transformers and navigation lights are found to be delinquent firms who have not been honoring the contracts of the shipyard. Orders for valves have been placed by the lead shipyard on certain firms. Subsequently, the second shipyard also placed orders in the same firms. This has led to accumulation of orders with these firms and they have not been able to honor the contracts of both the shipyards leading to delay in the project. Certain recommendations to address the issues which I have discussed. Identification of reputed NABL accredited labs in various cities where CAT C manufacturing units are located is extremely important. Shipyards must specify test certification exclusively from these labs as a special condition in the RFPs. In case some items fail post certification, issues must be taken up with the Quality Council of India to investigate the shortcoming with that lab. Also, test certification of polymer based internals needs to be scrutinized stringently by the shipyards and the long layout periods need to be contained. It is recommended that in house capability to analyze the Arctic films be augmented by training personnel from the shipyard QC teams. In the instances when items fail in the shop floor test or onboard, these films should be scrutinized in house again to examine if the failures are attributable to the quality of the material. Shipyards can also outsource the interpretation of radiographic films to firms specialized in this field so that accurate analysis and reporting is done. In order to ensure flawless radiographic examination with no ambiguities, it is recommended that specifications regarding the procedure of conducting the RT as well as to accept the item be specified objectively in the QAPs by the shipyards. It is recommended that OEMs be encouraged to set up the, some of the type testing facilities in their own premises. These facilities can also be set up by a consortium of vendors with common requirements. Vendors can approach external agencies only for particular tests which need expertise and special infrastructure. These steps will address an important bottleneck pertaining to long waiting time with the type testing agencies. Feasibility of concluding the rate contracts for supply of CATC, critical CATC items be explored. These RCs can be concluded for a duration of four to five years, depending on the projects in pipeline with the shipyard. This will offer a long-term commitment to the vendors with adequate orders. Feasibility of placing part orders to different firms can also be explored. This will ensure that orders are not accumulated with one vendor. And even if one vendor slips into committed timelines, there is a backup readily available for supply of the same item and the project does not suffer. Major delays have been encountered in the, in the current warship building projects, mainly due to delayed supply of valves. It is therefore recommended that statistics highlighting the implication of these delays be compiled and a proposal be taken up with the Ministry of MSMEs to issue a waiver to the shipyards for sourcing the valves meant for warship construction from a, border, a broader vendor base without restricting to MSMEs as per the reserved category of the public procurement policy order. This can pave way for bigger firms to participate in the bidding and offer the shipyards a wider vendor base for sourcing valves. It is recommended that QA cover for all CATC and CATC star items be delegated as the responsibility of the shipyards. The shipyards in turn are required to ensure the same through third party inspection agencies. This would speed up the process of procurement by avoiding the procedural delays and ease out the burden on the overloaded CQE. It is very crucial that a genuine assessment of potential vendors with respect to their capacity and capability be undertaken by the shipyards prior placing orders. Further, once an order is placed by the shipyards, there should be a mechanism in place to follow up with the firms regularly to assess if the contract is progressing as per the design timelines. Some of the material defects are attributable to the poor quality of castings, which are sourced from small time foundries. The MSMEs cannot afford to source the castings from bigger foundries whose MOQs are very large. Therefore, in projects which have multiple ships to be built, it is recommended that feasibility of sourcing the castings in bulk for all the ships together be explored. This will ensure larger quantities which can match the MOQs of the bigger and deputed foundries. 
the lead shipyard can be nominated to undertake the sourcing for all the ships and issue the castings to either the manufacturing firms as or the second shipyard as free issue material. It has been about eight, year, eight years after DME specs 463 have been promulgated for valves. It is recommended that the feedback on the issues faced by the shipyards and valve manufacturers while conforming to the specs be obtained and evaluated. If any recommendations emerge which can improve the document further, the same can be incorporated by the Navy. With this, I come to the deaf presentations. Thank you, Sir. I would like to now throw open the house for questions. Uh, request the individual to please state his name. Uh, keep the questions to probably just about a, a line or two. And preferably, any particular speaker you would like to address uh, to answer your question. Thank you. Uh, first question. Uh... Thank you very much for these. Thank you very much for these uh, nice presentations. My question is on uh, ship design uh, of, the, of the future. Now, increasingly, we are seeing the adoption of you know technologies such as uh, digital twins for equipment and uh, predictive maintenance uh, features in in the design of uh, of ships itself. I want to understand from both the two shipyards here how much of uh, this is being embedded in your uh, in your uh, uh, production plans, particularly for the design uh, for the digital twins of equipment and predictive maintenance related to the integrity of the hull. So these are things that are, that are already available using uh, technologies of artificial intelligence and uh, machine learning. So I want to understand, are we doing that? Because this is now a feature of uh, most modern warship building projects. Thank you. Uh, by the way, that was Commodore Samadhar. <laughs> Being very specific to that, uh, we have uh, our design team is exploring how to go about this, and maybe for the future projects that are on the anvil, we will look into it depending on the sophistication. You may be aware that we are already having uh, that is GRC and MDL have virtual reality labs with uh, DND also having the same feature, which is being well used for the P17 Alpha project. Now, coming to use of artificial intelligence. I just wanted to tell Sulhakar that uh, GRC has just started doing AI-based uh, RT inspection of welds. So it's already happening. And yes, definitely there will be progress in leaps and bounds in the near future. Thank you, sir. Uh, Jen, you want to add anything? Yeah, I just one point from my side. Uh, though we, we talk about digital twin and all, but the bottom line is, it's the scenario, if you look at the, it's competitive. Everything has a cost to it. And uh, though we are exploring these options, as GRS is also doing that, we are in Tau, talk with the firms, how this can be implemented. But the cost implications are the ones which are a hindrance towards adoption of these technologies. Uh, and coming to the point of... Uh, Artificial intelligence, yes, a lot of initiatives have been taken. In fact, uh, it is being driven right from the top. That is Government of India. We are having almost uh, weekly reviews and our director, Captain Chagmohan, is quite stressed about it. <laughs> yes, we have a lot of targets to meet. In fact, a lot of initiatives have been taken in the past. Uh, we have done a uh, AI-based predictive maintenance successfully for a Coast Guard ship, which is running on an MTU engine. The same we are trying to replicate on Aditya. Another couple of other things have been done. And plus, we have done autonomous uh, boat in collaboration with Bell. So a lot of initiatives are happening. But yes, this is the future to go uh, to look. And uh, a lot of technologies, AI-based technologies and systems will get embedded into the uh, ship systems in the future. Thank you. I have a question for the one of the 
I would like to ask you that you know we're talking about exporting uh, ships, uh, particularly exporting naval ships, and you talked about the petrol craft and all that. So my assessment is that uh, you know we in a country we have a capacity shortfall even to meet the Indian Navy's requirement. You know the Navy's requirement of ships, and we need to you know work on. Uh, bringing down the times and uh, you know how quickly we can uh, build ships and meet the MCPP requirements of the Navy itself. So how do we balance that? You know, well, well, it is definitely a desirable thing that yes, we export our ships. Also, you know, we ha have the numbers. It will uh, help us uh, develop our shipbuilding. But how do we balance that? You know that uh, you know it shouldn't happen that we, we start focusing on export and you know we we continue to slide in the make meeting our own requirement. So where we draw the line and where we prioritize that. Yes, sir. Uh, now, if you look at, uh, I will talk about GSL per se, sir. Now, whatever capacity we have, we have, we can do 14 hull ships, uh, 14 ships concurrently. Six, uh, eight at uh, hull construction stage and four at out, six at outfitting stage. And we are just about concurrently doing five to six ships. And if you look at the model which is being followed by all shipyards, be it MDL or uh, GRSC, if you look at the hulls, they are being done entirely outside. Like they have, uh, they have outsourced to Shoft. Uh, GRSC is doing getting done to uh, LNT, and uh, I believe Chogli, Chogli also I think is in the fray with MDL. So these smaller shipyards are augmenting complementing the cap cap uh, capacity of the shipyards. So the while the core work stays with the shipyard, mm -hmm. with the support of these ancillary, the smaller shipyards and the ancillary industry, I'm quite sure and quite confident being in this industry, I'm, I can state very confidently that more work related to exports can be taken on without compromising on the timelines for the Indian shipbuilding projects. <laughs> Please, sir. Commodore Rajan Veer, Indian Maritime Foundation. I think it was mentioned by more than one speaker that the role of embassies should be enhanced in uh, boosting exports. <clears throat> now, uh, embassies have uh, commercial attaches, and some embassies have naval attaches. Now, uh, with the emphasis on uh, maritime affairs in our country, by the government, uh, is it envisaged, or would it not be better to have, uh, good to have a maritime attache in some of the embassies where, where exports can be boosted, or is it left to the commercial attache uh, to, to do that? I think that's uh, that's an aspect we need to look at to the government level. That even with some selected countries, which uh, where the we are uh, uh, trying to boost our exports, more ship exports and shipping and ports also comes into it. So the, the maritime attaché in some of the countries uh, would, would help a great deal in uh, in this work. And uh, the, my second question is on indigenization. It was mentioned that um, uh, certain items are notified for uh, imports are stopped. And uh, now this is a year process going on from time to time as the, as the indigenization has improved. So I would like to know some specific items where, uh, if you can tell us, where the uh, imports were stopped and indigenization was uh, carried out in the due frame of time. And uh, uh, so that's if you, I think Commander Jane would probably be the uh, Captain Jane. Thank you. Uh, sir, what I personally feel. Uh, for the embassies, usage of embassies, utilization of the uh, diplomatic channels. Uh, instead of commercial attaches, I feel defense attaches can do a better job in the sense they have better connect 
with the military and the naval setup there so they can get better leads once the lead is available that can be passed on to the shipyards or the private industry whatever concerned may be then connect can be established and then this can be facilitated because primarily because in being uh, in the role of defense attache they are interacting day in and day out with the military setup there they have access to the higher echelons there so their approach is better so and in fact a lot of good work has been done in the past time private to it uh, the defense attaches role has certainly transformed now we see a sea change in their attitude the way they approach uh, the way they are facilitating in fact they are proactive they are communicating directly to the shipyard saying okay do this do this i know this can happen this 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 guy has got a requirement of this the this guy is available who can facilitate this guy is who can do the job for you uh, in fact this is the shipyard available there who can do a manufacture you give your design he can do it there so i'm saying is they have a more broader view or to facilitate this export thing and it's working well it's just a matter of time it should get realized into orders also Uh, sir, just uh, to give you an example of uh, indigenization, one of the two things that comes to my mind is what we are doing at GRC is a data acquisition and processing system for the survey vessels, which earlier used to be imported or something. And then uh, um, uh, hello anchors and uh, shutters for those. A few examples of uh, indigenous uh, these things. Two more to add, sir. Some certain space required for the overall of the gas turbines, which we undertake in Excel, sir. It is uh, a big component of them. We are able to indigenize and use them for quite some time now, sir. For get the gas as well as uh, gas turbines. With regard to your point of uh, maritime attaches, we could uh, request the vice chief to just get away from this uh, session. Anybody else? Uh, good morning, sir. I'm uh, Commander Vivek Anand from headquarters, uh, WNC. Uh, we were uh, having a lot of various challenges. We are uh, discussing about more of uh, tangible uh, challenges. Perhaps uh, I have a different perspective of uh, from the HR perspective about, uh, in fact, uh, on the areas of concern, uh, we were indicating about the core expertise or uh, lack, uh, lackness in uh, about the talents or about the people who are actually with the shipbuilding industry, how many talents are there? I'm actually coming to that. Uh, like with the present scenario, there are a lot of veterans after uh, 20 years of good experience. They are not getting into the shipbuilding industries or rather they are joining either the corporates, like uh, that is the recent trends of joining Amazon, Flipkart and various aspects. But why not on the topic launch, we don't have any uh, experienced personnel sitting over on the Ministry of Defense or in the ship buildings where we have to make it as a the national assets of uh, so many people even after superannuation are readily available but they are not getting into the ship building industry and we are not focusing on the financial growth so this question it's not actually a question it's an open discussion forum for anyone so this is what which i was thinking in my mind so that's the reason i have posted this good day, uh, maybe we could you could discuss this uh post the session over lunch with people, maybe you'll get some answers there. Uh, because it's very generic, it's not very uh, pertinent to what we have discussed today. Anybody else? Yeah, please. My two pens. Uh, firstly, thank you very much for a very uh, enlightening presentation by all three speakers. I'm especially thankful to uh, Captain Sudhagar for bringing out uh, a very, very uh, topic which is very close to my heart and the Navy has been suffering uh, because of this. So my question is very simple. Uh, as uh, I know Subhadar may recall that uh, we had appointed one logistic officer in every WOT. That is primarily to capture the data of uh, the correct data in the D-707 especially for the firms which is contracted by the shipyard cat c cat d um, items has the process has been formalized 
because Navy had never been able to source those items correctly, and we have to go get it manufactured as a sample, and then uh, put them into the system. So I just want to know that the correct identification of these items into the with the correct part numbers has the process been final. Sorry, may I ask, please? I'm uh, Commodore Arvind Rawal, uh, CEO Shivaji, but uh, in my previous capacity as a PDME and before that uh, DME. So, sir, that was done in 2013, 14, and uh, with a uh, lot of fanfare, but it's not actually met the required or the requisite mandate that it had. The reason being, the main mandate of the thing was there should be nothing which is, uh, you know, which is left to the shipyard or should left to the ship to raise an IF. 100% of data should be captured in ILMS, and any ship could demand anything, whether it's a cat A, B, C, or a shipyard procured item. But it could not be met, sir, because the again the problem happened was the final uh, uh, piping of all this happens at TLS. So whatever data that logistic officer could collate at the shipyard, that data when it went to DLS and it could not be pumped in there. Even a small issue of there, a small string not matching doesn't pump in any of the data. It's the same again going back to such uh, mid 80s and the 90s when we all started computers. Whatever we did, the whenever or whatever small program we wrote, it said, you know, bad word or bad command. And nothing, you know, half of us could not learn computers because we could not go beyond that. So that is the problem again with the uh, pumping in this list and this thing in LMS because LMS and this handshake never happened. Later on, the professional directors got in touch with the OEMs directly. Some of the OEMs are forthcoming and coming to DLS directly with their own CDs and sort out these issues which are there. But it happened only in case of 20, 30 percent of, per percentage of uh, uh, items. Today also 15 Bravo is a latest ship which has been commissioned. Still, there are signals flying around of, you know, NA not available, not in -catted, and ship to raise IIF. So this is what we need to counter, sir. Uh, last question, please. Uh, I'm Commander Kulkarni. I worked for close to 20 years in the offshore after my naval service. Uh, what I found was the offshore supply vessels came from Norway, the dredgers and tugs came from China, and to my horror, bulk carriers came from Bangladesh. I want to know why this order would not place on Indian shipyards. Sir, uh, I mean, I am volunteering to take this question, but uh, the problem is that the shipyard, it is, uh, it's like uh, the presently uh, the defense shipyards, yes, most of them are executing defense orders and uh, the spare capacity is now being used to look at uh, the ships uh, in the domestic or other commercial, this thing like ferries and carriers and things like that, which is a recent phenomenon. Maybe, sir, 10, 15 years ago, uh, the the defense shipyards are really not looked into commercial, uh, building commercial things. And uh, today, when I'm looking at building dredgers and bulk carriers, what people are asking, especially the foreign owners, the Indians are not even asking, are looking at proven vessels, which is slightly difficult today because we are just starting off doing these things, except for maybe Cochin shipyard. So uh, that is what I have to say on the subject. And uh, we are in touch with uh, the national uh, agencies which engage ships for building ships for them. Now, just to add to that, I think uh, you see the DPSUs uh, to get into private shipbuilding, uh, it's not such an easy task. So, which, since we have uh, Mr. Patil from LNT here, maybe he could answer as for why he didn't take on the bulk carrier. <laughs> CMD HSL here. HSL was a uh, shipyard, as everybody knows, 80 years old, and it was making commercial vessel. And it came under MOD in two, only 2011. So, to answer to your question, the point is that there are two ways of building ships. One way is commercial driven, which means where the 
decisions are taken based on commercial, whether it is sub-vendor, vendor, customer, owner, everything is driven by commercial as is a commercial market. The second way of building ship is with the help of rules, where you have CVC, you have uh, auditors, you have CAG, you have uh, RTI, you have objections, you have ministry, you have monitoring, etc., etc. that we have all heard in the last one and a half hour. We were governed by the rules and we are still being governed by rules. It is not easy to do away with the rules when the shipyard is a DPSC shipyard, whether it is under Ministry of Shipping or under Ministry of Defense. The degree of questions, the degree of answerability may vary. The degree of freedom to take decision may vary. But the plethora of rules is very, very different. And the DPSUs also carry an agenda of the old lineage of socialistic regime, whether it is recruitment, employment, it is uh, promotion of MSMEs, it is GEM portal, uh, you name it. We are the carriers of government policies and agencies, and rightly so, I respect it. So the answer was that the commercial ships wants delivery on time, and the rule in commercial ship building is if you don't deliver in time, the vendor has the right to cancel the order. And the Indian shipyards, because of this particularly DPSUs, were not geared up to deliver a ship, a dredger, or a bulk carrier in a matter of two years and 18 months. That challenge was there then, that challenge is there even today. Thank you. Thank you. And I would also like to add, uh, in the shipbuilding, it is a single global market with information symmetry. Commodore Nair, ex-director shipbuilding of uh, Garden Reach Shipbuilders and Engineers. It's a single global market with information symmetry. So the world looks at only one thing. In the uh, most of the cases, the first priority is price. The second priority is the time. And the third priority is quality. So these are the three aspects in the order of merit which actually qualify as to which particular ship builder gets the order or not. That is why the Chinese have been getting it faster than anybody else. That's all. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, finally, I would like to uh, thank all the speakers for giving us a very informative talk. Uh, I would like to summarize what they have said because I think they've all uh, expressed their point of views uh, very, very explicitly. Uh, but suffice to say that uh, they all talked about uh, the necessity of having an industrial economic ecosystem which will uh, be geared towards uh, progressing the shipbuilding industry. Uh, we've also talked about the Atmanirbhar Bharat Abhiyan and the self-reliance factors, which are very important. And some very interesting statistics have been, have been thrown up, uh, which probably indicates to us uh, why we stand today uh, as probably a non-starter in the global market, despite having uh, not a bad order book in terms of uh, shipbuilding as such is uh, concerned. Though I must uh, confess here, uh, that is, order book is more geared towards uh, warship building rather than commercial building. Uh, personally, I have also been in shipbuilding for close to about 15 years in the Navy. And uh, to me, the state of uh, the shipbuilding industry, especially the private shipbuilding industry, uh, continues to languish what it was three decades back and what it is today. And therefore, I feel it becomes very important that this sector gets its due recognition. Well, that's maybe this point was uh, thrown up to us as to how we could look at uh, increasing the uh, orders for the private shipyards, uh, how we could uh, sort of resurrect this industry. And one of the points after a lot of debate and a lot of discussion, uh, we decided that we will open up a uh, few projects, especially not so weapon intensive ships, both to the private sector as well as to the uh, government shipyards. Accordingly, we did uh, uh, pass on these tenders to both of them on a competitive basis. And unfortunately, none of the uh, private shipyards uh, could bag an order. Uh, we were quite surprised uh, in the Navy 
Well, there was much angst about it as to why this has happened. There were lots of reasons which were thrown up. Uh, I don't like to get into these reasons at this forum, but uh, the private shipbuilding industry continued to languish where it is. So maybe if I have to roll back the years um, and be in the decision-making process at that point in time, uh, instead of uh, saying that uh, we should open up to both the government and the private shipyards, I think uh, with the type of an MCC, MCPP which is there, which is talking about uh, 200 uh, ship navy by 2030, uh, I think we need to take a call, it's a rather drastic call, and that drastic call would be that there are some class of ships we open up only to the private shipyards on a competitive basis. Which these projects are, have to be discussed within the Navy, uh, which suits the Navy from the point of view of uh, integrations, etc. cetera. Uh, and to me, I think uh, this is the need of the hour today, if we have to look at this industry to survive. Uh, an interesting fact is if you look at the MOS report of uh, 2021 uh, and has also been brought up by ex naval chief, this report consists of close to about 130 pages. And out of this 130 pages, only three pages are dedicated to shipbuilding. That is the state we are in. Unfortunate, but that is where we are. And therefore, it becomes very important that we need to recognize shipbuilding as a strategic industry. Everybody talks about this vast coastline that we have. Probably in geography is amazed as to why this sector has not picked up in our country. And uh, I look at it that in case the impetuses are given uh, to this sector, you would be looking at skill development for the youth. You would be looking at uh, increased job prospects. Uh, you would be looking at being compliant to the Atmanirbhar schemes. We will be looking at uh, boosting the ocean-based blue economy. And most importantly, as has been brought up by the various speakers, uh, we would be looking at creation of the ancillary, which in turn would mean a boost uh, to the Indian economy. So that to me is the key. And what is the remedy? Now, this opinion is my very personal opinion. And uh, I personally feel just like what the vice chief said, but I would probably go a step forward. He said, and I feel that it is essential that today, if we have to revive this very key industry, we need to create a separate ministry. We need it to be a small ministry. We need to have some funding for it, an annual funding plan so that there is accountability. We've got to have some good minds sitting in that industry which would look at what sort of tax incentives we need to give, what sort of services uh, which you need to get uh, develop certain financial platforms uh, which are favorable in boosting uh, this industry. Because today we are not even, uh, if I may use the words rather drastically, as I said, uh, we are not even anywhere near being a go. We are far, a far, far cry from it. And we need to do something drastically because this continues to languish for the last two to three decades and we need to push this really uh, properly. So I feel that uh, this creation uh, with uh, funding uh, becomes absolutely essential. A lot of people do this comparison. Uh, we look at uh, comparing with the automobile sector. Uh, but when you look at the automobile sector, that's a sector which is very, very largely dependent on domestic uh, requirements, and therefore it's different. Uh, people talk about uh, our friendly neighbor, how he has progressed in this industry. Uh, but to me, comparisons are a bit askewed because to have meaningful comparisons is very essential that uh, the playing field or the environment has to be like to like. So this is my take on this, and as I said, it's a very personal view. Uh, but finally, I'd like to thank all the speakers for, again, uh, a very nice talk. And customary, customary fashion, uh, I would request all of you uh, to give them a good hand. Thank you. I would like to thank the moderator, the panelists, and uh, all the audience members here for a very interesting and uh, very interactive session. Uh, may I request the President IMF to... Uh, Give the mementos uh, to the panelists. Proceed to the moderator, Vice Admiral uh, Dinesh Deshpande.
Captain Sunil Kumar of GRSC. Uh, may I also request him to uh, accept a salver uh, on behalf of GRSC as a sponsor? Uh, the speaker. Accept the memento as a sponsor. And uh, Commander Saurabh Jain uh, as a speaker. And lastly, uh, and lastly, Captain Sudhakar of Ayana Shivaji. Uh, thank you all. Uh, we'll now adjourn for lunch. Uh, unfortunately, we're about uh, 30 minutes behind time. And uh, we had originally planned the lunch for about an hour. Uh, but since many of our future speakers have a plane to catch, and uh, yesterday I'm sure you have all been well acquainted with Pune traffic, uh, I suggest that we uh, cut it down to about 45 minutes. So I may request you all to be here by 1345. Thank you.
Hello, hello, check, hello, hello. Hello, hello, check, check. Hello, check again. Mm. How you think? Hello, Chip.
हेलो ये अभी किधर से स्पीड ले रहा है ये तो हमारा इसका है जो पोस्टर बट अपना नहीं तो नहीं अपना वीडियो आना चाहिए इसमें अपना ये है कैमरा ऑन कर दो यस यस कैमरा बंद है ना सर कैमरा चालू कर सर उनको कुछ कहने को हेलो ये वॉल्यूम कम रखो ओके सर एम आई ऑडियो सर सर टेस्टिंग कम्युनिकेशन रीड मी सर आर यू आस्किंग मी दिस इज प्रोफेसर मिश्रा आर यू आस्किंग मी आप बोल चाहिए सर आप कुछ बोलिए ना यू आस्किंग आर यू आस्किंग मी एप्सन पे नहीं डालना हेलो एप्सन पे किसने डाला मैडम दी जन गोटे मीटिंग सर सर का नाम क्या है यही होगा रचिता बदल हेलो कैन यू बी ऑडिबल am i audible this phone you know what is this screen but uh, i don't know whether 
anybody can hear me or not? Yeah, in the okay, I can see you. I can see you. Okay. Uh, we are seeing you now on the main projection also. Can it be seen? Uh, yes, yes. Let's start your presentation. Yeah. Okay, we can see it. We can see it quite clearly. Okay. Okay, then I'll wait for my. Will you be very logged in for us? At least this session I like to be logged in. Let's see. Yeah, yeah, we'll do that. I'll do that.
Uh, may I request you all to please settle down. And uh, perhaps uh, some of our uh, dignitaries have left. So if anyone would like to come to the front uh, door, please do so. <laughs> uh, may I request you all to please settle down. And uh, perhaps uh, some of our uh, dignitaries are left. So if anyone would like to come to the front uh, door, please do so. Uh, we will now start our second session, which is on the topic proposed policy framework and reforms. The moderator for this session is uh, Dr. Mrs. Malini Shankar, Vice Chancellor of the Indian Maritime University at Chennai. Uh, she is an IAS officer of the 1984 batch, Maharashtra Kader. During a long and illustrious career, she has been actively involved in various development activ activities in economic sectors, including industry, shipping, and water resources. She has several prestigious degrees from acclaimed Indian and international institutions. And in 2020, received the AAA award of the Asian Institute of Management, Manila, Philippines, being one of seven global recipients and the first Indian woman to receive this award. Besides being the vice chancellor, she's also an honorary member of the Board of Governors of the World Maritime University, which is in Malmo in Sweden, having been nominated by the International Maritime Organization. And she has represented India in several international fora and also been invited by the government as well as private organizations to contribute to policy making. Uh, she is accompanied uh, by four speakers uh, who are there: Tiwari, Commander Prashant Singh, uh, Commander Sirajuddin, Com Captain Mainak Mishra, and Commodore Samadhar. Has everyone got a place? Okay. Uh, and uh, we will have Professor S. C. Mishra, who unfortunately could not join us in person uh, because uh, he only recently got diagnosed with COVID. But uh, he is there on Zoom, and uh, he will uh, give his talk online whenever his turn comes. So, uh, with that, uh, may I request uh, Dr. Shankar to take the mic? Good afternoon, everybody, um, and thank you for the introduction. We have two objectives before us. One is the discussion of this session, and the other is to keep you awake post Friday. <laughs> I don't know which is the bigger one. But at the outset, I would like to pay my tributes to Bokshagundam Vishweshwaraya, whose birthday falls today, the famous engineer, September 15th, yes. And it is my pleasure to welcome uh, the speakers, the dignitaries, and the August participants to, on behalf of the IMF. Coming in the wake of the recent commissioning of the indigenous aircraft carrier INS Vikrant, and as we heard this morning, other ships also, it's an opportune moment to review the shipping shipbuilding scenario in India and identify means and ways on how to accelerate the progress. The government of India has highlighted maritime security as a key focus area, as is evidenced by various policy formulations, among which are SAGAR, uh, uh, an Indo-Pacific uh, Oceans Initiative. Given the geopolitical developments in the region, it is imperative that India enhances its presence and capabilities in the maritime sector. As we have seen, Government of India has initiated several measures to promote indigenization. Inter alia, there is a make one and make two scheme, increase in FDI, enabling OEMs to get in, support for startups, reservation for MSMEs and small shipyards, defense industrial corridors and technology development funds. Shipyards, in the previous session, the, during the question and answer session, uh, it was raised to shipyards get commercial orders for commercial ships. Now, this is an issue in India still. They are dependent mostly on military orders. Can the challenges be met through naval orders alone? The second thing is, in terms of if we have to address all the challenges which have been highlighted in the morning session and con will continue to be highlighted in this session, uh, if you look at the papers they have, sub they, they will be speaking on. 
Scientific research and technical advancement is a field where India has been lagging behind. In comparison to China and United States, which boasted 1,096 papers and 4,217 researchers per million habitant, uh, hab inhabitants, India had 156 researchers per million habitants as of 2018, which is much lower than the worldwide average of 1,500. And yet we say we are the third largest SNT uh, graduates in the world. And even if you look at the number of articles published, we come in sixth page, not to speak of the quality of the articles. So that is a background that I would like to leave, you know, um, share my thoughts. We have eminent speakers who have identified key areas that require attention, um, in-house design capability, ancillary industries, economies of scale, adherence to cost and delivery schedules, et cetera. They've also made critical uh, recommendations to ensure that the Indian shipbuilding and indigenization capabilities gain strength. So without much further ado, we will just uh, go to the speakers and ask them to share their papers and their talk. We start with Commodore Vineet Tiwari, Principal Director of Naval Design, uh, IHQ Ministry of Defense. Um, he's a naval architect serving in the core of naval construction of Indian Navy. And as was discussed in the morning, since the entire biodata is available, we, I will not uh, dwell too much on it. Uh, the floor is yours, uh, Commodore. Vice Admiral Pasricha, Captain Anand Dixit, President IMF, Dr. Malini Shankar, the session moderator, a very distinguished audience, including eminent veterans and captains of the industry. At the, out, at the outset, I must thank IMF for giving me an opportunity to speak on this very relevant topic, which is very close to my heart being a professional naval architect, working on design, construction, and repairs of naval ships for over three decades. In line with the theme of this seminar today, I'll be talking about the need for instituting necessary policy framework to revitalize shipbuilding in India. I'll begin with a disclaimer that the views expressed in this presentation and talk are the personal views of the author, that is myself and Commander Prashant, and do not reflect the official views of Indian Navy or MOD. Sorry, I think you started with a gap. Uh, the scope is as shown of my presentation. I'll briefly touch upon the Indian shipbuilding evolution, cite the Korean and Chinese shipbuilding growth story, and recommend me measures to, re uh, to revitalize shipbuilding in India. I'll begin with a quick look at the typicality of shipbuilding industry. As has been cited before also, the shipbuilding industry is an industry of industries which has direct and indirect positive impact at a very large scale on almost all the other industries and sectors such as Tier 1 and Tier 2 ancillary industry, logistics and IT services, and financial services, etc., with very large spin-offs in terms of employment generation. The shipbuilding industry, as uh, we can see here, is also known as the mother of industries because of its multiplier effect on manufacturing ancillary industries and on account of its large scale employment generation potential. It is an established fact that for the same turnover, the shipbuilding industry generates at least three times the employment generated by the heavy engineering industry. As the esteemed audience is well aware, the manufacturing sector of a country has a very significant impact on the economic growth of the country. If we glance through the history, we see that nations which evolved 
as major manufacturing hubs, also evolved as major shipbuilding nations and economic powers. A few of the global shipbuilding leaders over the last century are highlighted on this slide. If you look at the shipbuilding industry in India, it also witnessed a period of unprecedented growth riding on the stimulus of global demand from 2003 onwards. A large number of shipyards buoyed by possible business opportunities made significant capital investment to scale up their infrastructure. This led to an increase in market share of Indian yards in terms of global orders from around 0.2% in 2002 to around 1.2% 1 by 2007, which was further projected to go up to 7.5% by 2017. However, as we all know, the industry did not follow the growth path as projected. The global recession in 2008 led to large-scale cancellation of orders, and this, coupled with withdrawal of sh uh, shipbuilding subsidies, led to a drastic slide in market share of Indian yards to a meager 0.01% by 2013. While subsequent to 2013, we could see recoveries in shipbuilding order book of some of the even smaller nations like Vietnam, Brazil, Taiwan, Philippines. However, our Indian shipyards could not catch up. And some of the major Indian yards that were appearing to have a healthy growth potential during the shipbuilding boom went out of business. Uh, this slide would uh, appear familiar. As compared to merchant shipbuilding, the war shipbuilding industry in the country has been a major success. The genesis of Indian Navy's design organization, which has proved to be the cornerstone of our Atmanir Bharta in naval shipbuilding today, has been amply highlighted in the inaugural and the keynote address. From a humble beginning in the 1960s, the Navy's in-house design organization has grown multifold and, and is currently capable of designing the most complex weapon intensive platform, including an aircraft carrier. Very few nations in the world have developed and nurtured this capability. Till date, 19 platform designs ranging from small crafts in the beginning to world-class destroyers and aircraft carrier now have been produced to which around 93 ships have been built indigenously. The Indian Navy has been driving the Atmanirbharta in modernization of its fleet through a clear vision and a robust long-term integrated perspective plan from which emerges our technology perspective and capability roadmap, as well as the indigenization plan. This long-term planning has ensured the sustenance and progressive growth of indigenous warship construction capability as well as development of new technologies and advanced equipments for our future platforms. In the next few slides, I would like to pro project a glimpse of the growth story of the Korean shipbuilding capability. Korea did not have any systemized shipping or shipbuilding policy until the first five-year economic development plan that was launched in 1962. Korea had in uh, principle two alternative approaches to economic development. One was inward looking based on import substitution and the other was an outward looking development strategy emphasizing export and trade. The country's policy shift to an outward looking strategy was fueled by powerful economic reasons including poor availability of natural resources, small domestic market and, and and an abundant and well-educated labor force with relatively low wages. The Korean government developed shipbuilding as a strategic industry in successive five-year economic development plans from 1962 to 1980. The first five-year plan for 1962 to 66 focused on ship quality improvement plan and expansion of shipbuilding facilities. The second plan from 67 to 71 brought in Shipbuilding Promotion Act of 1967 and financing for shipyards 
through shipbuilding funds. The shipbuilding industry promotion plan in 1970 included raising of domestic supply rate of ships and developing standard designs for 10 ships. At the third five-year plan focused on making shipbuilding as the strategic export industry and to enhance shipbuilding capability. In addition to the robust policy framework, the Korean government focused on building institutions such as Research Institute of Medium and Small Shipbuilders, Korean Marine Equipment Association, and Institute of Ocean Science and Technology, etc. The Korean government also developed shipbuilding clusters to encourage effective cooperation between the shipbuilders and the ancillary industries, which were located close by. The government also funded research in cooperation with the Shipbuilders Association and provided credit facility to ship owners and loans to shipyard to ensure working capital requirements. Such priority to shipbuilding industry and measures instituted by the Korean government fueled the growth in the shipbuilding industry, making it a leading global ship exporter. So these are the things which we would need to do if we want to become an exporter of ship. Looking at the Chinese success story, China has become immensely competitive in commercial shipbuilding, bagging largest share of global orders today. The Chinese political leadership saw the potential in the shipbuilding industry for economic growth and employment and worked in the mission mode for over 40 years to reach the present levels. Their government invested heavily in scaling up indigenous shipbuilding capacity with creation of massive infrastructure like huge dry docks with very large crane capacities for dual use in commercial and naval shipbuilding, while also nurturing a vibrant and robust ecosystem around the shipbuilding yards for indigenous equipment manufacture, skilling of manpower, MOU with leading shipyards for infusing technology, creation of many universities and R&D institutions, et cetera. With fall in the global commercial shipbuilding demand, the complete paraphernalia has been smartly and gainfully leveraged by China to produce warships at an alarming pace with concurrent series production of large number of warships in many Chinese shipyards. The Chinese have evolved their shipbuilding policies with focus on profit retention reforms to make their shipyards sustainable in the long run. They have evolved policies for adoption of contract management system, laying the ground for legislative and financial reforms. The China has evolved five-year plan dedicated to shipbuilding industry with an aim of doubling the market share by, account, by, by according strategic status to shipbuilding and employing various measures to sustain orders. The focus areas for Chinese shipbuilding policy is summarized in this slide. I'm sorry. Uh, yeah. yeah, sorry. So the China has focused on financial reforms advancements in science and technology, and development in manufacturing. The financial reforms have provided tax benefits, fund availability, and stabilized material costs. The message for India from case studies presented of Korea and China is that such capabilities require convergence in thoughts and action with holistic long-term vision and policy investments. The road to competitiveness can only come from pressures of commercial shipbuilding to meet global standards with consequent enhanced maturity of vendor base of localized OEMs and ancillary industry. As I mentioned earlier, shipbuilding has largest potential for job creation among manufacturing industries with simultaneous development of ancillary industries in the shipbuilding ecosystem. Greater prioritization for development of shipbuilding industry amongst manufacturing sector therefore needs no further emphasis. Of course, there are major challenges in way of boosting indigenous merchant shipbuilding due to the conflict of interest between shipping and shipbuilding industry, which needs to be addressed through strong legislative action 
on the highest priority to be able to generate domestic demand for shipbuilding. The cabotage law is a well-known thing which needs to be taken care of. Now, having discussed the importance of prioritizing the shipbuilding in the country, the need of the R is to strongly reevaluate our policy initiatives in the sector to leverage our strength and invigorate our economy. It is important for us to grow our merchant shipbuilding along with naval shipbuilding to truly realize the required critical mass for capacity enhancement with consequent benefits of economy of state. This would truly be an encouraging sign for the local industry as seen in case of China and Korea. Toward this, we need to take actions in short, medium and long terms, which I would highlight in subsequent slides. To begin with short-term measures, it is proposed to form an apex national authority on shipping and shipbuilding for, for synergic vision and policy making for promotion of indigenous shipping and shipbuilding under the PMO. This would facilitate coordination among in intra-government bodies, formulation of long-term policies, evolution of MOUs, and long-term cooperation agreements between industry bodies and the shipyards. The shipbuilding is a capital intensive business and financial support for it is imperative to be given at right time. Therefore, innovative ways of funding of shipyards and providing tax incentives and GST rationalization need to be evolved. The legislative action for long-term consistent policy formulation is another essential aspect for growth of shipbuilding in the country. For shipbuilding to have a critical mass, we need to enforce building of all the coastal and inland vessels at Indian shipyards mandatory. Demand for shipbuilding can be generated by implementation of legislative norms to permit only Indian built and Indian flagships to carry Indian cargo. We also need to create institutional bodies and agencies to consistently develop new methodologies for enhancement of shipbuilding in ever in ever evolving scenarios the efficiency and effectiveness of shipyards and industry need to be benchmarked to the global standards and these benchmarks need to be progressively improved with time government should encourage partnerships among the public and private sector yards to increase the overall standard of the industry and robust indigenous design strength would be the key to developing the, uh, the domestic shipbuilding capability. Towards this, we need to strengthen our design houses through financial and other support measures. Finally, looking at the medium and long-term measures, we need... I think my slides are running ahead of me. Yeah, so we need to target self-reliance in commercial shipbuilding and ancillary industries. We need to strengthen support structure to make our shipyards competitive for exports so as to add volumes for shipbuilding. We need to set up specialized institutes for developing indigenous expertise and skill set for shipbuilding. And finally, we also need to invest heavily in concurrent development of shipping and shipbuilding infrastructure. With that, I have finished. Thank you. Jai Hind. Thank you very much. Our next speaker is Commander A.M. Jafar Sirajuddin, who is presently posted at IHQ in the Ministry of Defense as Commander Marine Engineering. He is responsible for induction management of engineering equipment and new construction lessons for the Navy. Thank you, ma'am. Good afternoon, uh, ladies and gentlemen. I would like to take this opportunity to thank Indian Maritime Foundation for arranging the seminar and the opportunity. In my paper, Indigenous Shipbuilding and the Vendor Base for Future Technologies, I would like to delve upon reasons for delays in the Indian shipbuilding of iron projects, identify the challenges, and suggest some mitigating measures with respect to equipment induction process. Uh, 
problem with dollar proposal. Mm -hmm. The scope of the presentation is shown on the slide. We'll start with a brief introduction. My slides are behind me, sir. <laughs> so we'll yeah, we'll start with a brief introduction. List few key challenges. Understand the capability of the ancillary industries, and subsequently explain the equipment induction process being followed in Indian Navy, and see. Few of the future technologies Indian Navy is looking for in the new component. And finally, suggest some policy changes to enhance the efficiency of the whole process. The data given on the slide is known to most of the audience here. However, it is essential to reiterate that the industrial capability of a nation is linked to its shipbuilding prowess. Today, only 10% of Indian flagships are being built at Indian shipyards. However, the scenario is entirely different in case of uh, ships being built for Indian Navy. Out of 38 ships presently under construction, 36 are being built at Indian shipyards. This excludes yard crafts being built at various public stroke private shipyards. The capability of indigenous warship construction may be attributed, uh, attributed to the Leander class frigates, which was built at 1960s. However, still there are delays being experienced in the ship construction. According to a 2015 report of Public Accounts Committee of Parliament, four reasons, as shown on the slide, has been identified as a major contributor to the slow pace of construction. In addition, another major challenge is the timely availability of the equipment post successful testing for onboard installation. This, is, this can be attributable to the availability of a mature, robust, and reliable vendor base who understand the naval requirements. The paper aims to identify the challenges and suggest mitigating measures in the development of the vendor base for future technologies in indigenous shipbuilding. The scan of the environment revealed three major areas affecting the MOO category of a warship. Most of the Indian shipyards lack in-house full design capability. This is presently being addressed by dependence on a foreign design house or design of warship, warship design bureau. As brought out earlier, over 90 ships have been built to 19 class of ships designed by WDB. With complex propulsion system, a requirement driven by need for an efficient solutions, propulsion system integration has grown to be a separate vertical for today's warship. Thus, having an in-nose PSA capability has become inescapable. Lastly, ancillary industry of the country is vastly underdeveloped. Out of the three major aspects brought out above, the present paper focuses on the development of the vendor base within the ancillary industry available in India. In order to develop the vendor base, three focus areas have been identified, which may help, those, help to improve the situation. First, vendors should have a clear understanding of the equipment qualification and induction process. Second, avenues made available by the government for induction of future technologies, and third, undertake few suggested policy changes to enhance the efficiency of the whole process. Over 60% of MOO category equipment have been indigenous. However, few equipment are still being imported as shown on the slide. It is pertinent to note that these equipment affect the main propulsion of the ship. While diesel engine has been taken up for development at a make on screen, and firefighting system is being indigenized through DRDO, the efforts of indigenization of other equipment is still at nascent stage, largely due to lack of industrial capability within the country. New technologies under deliberation for induction are shown on the slide. It may be noted that few of these technologies are being actively pursued at IHKMOD for development within the country. In order to indigenously develop the above equipment and technologies in India, there is a requirement for the industry to understand the envisage capability, technical specifications, qualification standards, and testing procedures. Understanding the above by the vendor will enable him to accurately estimate the cost and time required to develop the equipment. It is also equally important for Indian Navy to unambiguously 
explain the envisage capability with all the underlying requirements to the vendors during the induction process it is pertinent to mention that the indian naval ships are either built to classification society rules or built to iin specifications iin specifications would include requirements such as given in defense standards military standards or standards promulgated by the professional directorates at ihq further as brought out by a previous speaker the equipments are categorized into cat a b c star and c the technical specifications are listed in the statement of technical requirements approved by the ihq and would invariably specify requirement of the equipment to meet the mil standards or class rules in case of equipment meeting class rules special requirements such as limits of acceptable noise vibration and shock would be promulgated other functional and technical requirements will include the limiting dimensions weight material of construction manufacturing processes quality assurance procedure inspection agency acceptance test procedures and factory acceptance trial protocols qualification standards of naval equipment will include some or all of the attribute shown on the slide equipment design and manufacturing should meet the requirement such as environmental conditions under which the equipment is required to perform its intended function endurance test for more than 100 hours uninterrupted running as specified tilt test at various angles structured bond noise which may contribute to the overall urn levels of the platform airborne noise mechanical vibration limits ability to withstand underwater shock and any other type test as dictated by the standards while ancillary industry in the country is capable of manufacturing most of the equipment to the specifications such as iso or iacs rules the equipment fails to qualify to be inducted into the service due to not meeting the qualification standards therefore policies in existence and standards being followed are shown on the slide it is prudent for the industry to ascertain these requirements once again during the technical negotiation committee meetings held with shipyard and iin reps the type testing is undertaken in accordance with def stand 362 or extend dgq policy letter structure bond noise is measured in 1/3 octave band above the first stage mounts and mil stand 1474 echo is followed for airborne noise and its limits mechanical vibration limits are as dictated by iso 10816 and iin shock policy would be applicable for shock qualification of the equipment as brought out above there is scope for development of new technology indigenously by indian ancillary industries with focus impetus on pm's vision of atmanirbhar bharat government of india has brought in various provisions through newly published defense acquisition procedure 2020 three major ways through which the technologies can be indigenously developed and inducted or make schemes technology development fund also called tdf and innovation of defense excellence challenges the make program which is part of make in india policy of the gi was first promulgated in dpp 2016 this program comprised of make one and make two schemes a revision was then made in chapter 3 of dap 2020 to make the procedure simpler and more industry friendly and was categorized into make one which is partially funded by the government for the prototype development with assured bulk orders make two which is industry funded for prototype development with assured bulk orders and lastly make three which is industry funded funded for prototype development through jvs or tots that too with the assured bulk orders a successful development of these schemes would uh, under these schemes would result in acquisition from the developmental agency through by iddm or by indian route the gi announced setting up of a technology development fund in unit budget 2014-15 the fund was set up in 2016 and have been allocated to brdo under this scheme only indian vendors are eligible for participation and procurement would be made under through by indian iddm category a nodal officer is nominated by in for each project under tdf scheme 
as a member of project monitoring and mentoring group. Innovation, innovation for Defense Excellence was set up by MOD with funding under Defense, Defense Innovation Fund and managed by Defense Innovation Organization of MOD. The DO, DIO has been constituted with Secretary DP as the chairman and VCNS as the member of advisory board to the DIO. So coming on to a few suggested policy changes, a few policy changes to ensure efficient vendor qualification and equipment induction are listed on the slide. A policy on comprehensive vendor qualification for each equipment is recommended to be formulated by the Naval Headquarters. The vendor qualification should be for a specified period of time, not more than two to four vendors, except in exceptional cases, should be qualified for an equipment in order to avoid proliferation of the equipment make and model. Further, successful completion of type testing and factory acceptance trials of the equipment is recommended to be an important prerequisite for vendor qualification to ensure only technical capable firms are qualified. On successful vendor qualification, a vendor compendium should be promulgated encompassing all equipment and its vendor. For equipment which does not affect the fight capability, the vendor compendium may be published in public domain. Once finalized and promulgated, vendor compendium should be retained for a certain time period. Suggested time period for the retention of vendor base prior renewal or reevaluation is 10 years. This will enable better equipment standardization in Indian Navy. Further, a common pool of vendors for supply of CAT C star and C equipment across all shipyards is recommended to be identified and disseminated to the shipyard. This will ensure continuous business to the MSME category firms as CAT C star and C equipment primarily include yard materials and engineering components such as walls directors, bellows, gaskets, instrumentation, fasteners, etc. In turn, this will, stand, this will enable standardization across all IN platforms over a period of time and better prices for the shipyard due to increased quantity of production. Where feasible, the specification of the equipment need to be frozen prior conclusion of the shipbuilding contract. In case the same is not feasible, changes in visage is to be indicated to the shipyard. Once frozen, no changes to the equipment specification unless affecting safety of men and material is to be promulgated. This will reduce the lead time for equipment supply and thereby shipbuilding timeline. A comprehensive assessment of equipment specification across IN platforms is the need of the hour. When not affecting the fighting capability of the platform, the equipment specification can be in line with marine or commercial standards complying to the IACS rules. Only those equipment which affect the fighting capability are to be built to IN or mill standard or defense standards. On completion of the assessment, equipment specifications are to be standardized across IN platform irrespective of ship being built to either class or IN specification. That I come to the conclusion of my presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Commander Sirajdan. Our next uh, speaker is Captain Mainak Mishra, who is in the Naval Headquarters responsible for all ongoing weapon and sensor maintenance issues, future projects, and weapon indigenization. Admiral Pasticha, Captain Dixit. Moderator of the session, senior serving and retired officers present here, the representatives of the industry, ladies and gentlemen. This afternoon, I stand before you to speak on weapon indigenization in Indian Navy, challenges and way ahead. The scope of the presentation is as shown on the screen. To begin, amongst the three services, as brought out by Admiral Pasricha also, the Navy stands out due to its conspicuous success in platform level indigenization. Lieutenant Commander Kalesh Mohanan 
wrote in an article in Indian Defence Review that a major objective of the 1969 to 74 defence plan was self-reliance in the field of warship design and warship production, and the aim was to conserve foreign exchange. Accordingly, the indigenous construction of frigates, patrol craft, submarines, minor war vessels, and auxiliaries was accepted. And in 1969, Naval Headquarters proposed to the government that a full-fledged directorate of naval design be sanctioned. However, to the credit of early naval planners, two important milestones towards self-reliance in warship production had already been accomplished with the commencement of Naval Construction Carter in 1951-52 and the establishment of Directorate of Naval Construction in 1962. As initially visualized, the Navy has achieved significant progress in past five decades, progressively moving from British Leander class frigates to indigenously designed stealth frigates, destroyers, and even aircraft carrier. It needs to be mentioned here that platform indigenization is undoubtedly an exemplary feat, but reliance on foreign weapon manufacturers for providing them combat capability is something that requires attention. Our dependence on foreign weapon manufacturers makes us susceptible to supply chain issues, unilateral obsolescence, foreign exchange variations, sanctions, etc., and impinges on our strategic autonomy. To put things in perspective, over the next 15 minutes or so, I would try to explain the need for weapon indigenization, elucidate its current state, highlight complexities in the process, bring out recent institutional initiatives, and at the end, put forth some implementable recommendations. Let us understand the need for weapon indigenization first. Needless to mention, at this August gathering, India is heavily dependent on imports, especially for energy requirements. To put things in perspective, between July 21 and July 22, India's exports rose by 2.14% to 36 billion US dollars, but the imports increased by a whopping 43.6% to 66 billion US dollars. Another related statistic, which has been quoted earlier uh, from CIPRI, brings out that India spent 331 billion US dollars on military between 2016 to 20, 2.6 percent of GDP, and was the second biggest importer of arms after Saudi Arabia. This is the condition despite 33 percent drop in the arms export, arms imports between 2011 to 16 and 2016 to 20. For an import-dependent country like ours, one of the foremost ways to reduce trade deficit is by reducing import bill and increasing defense exports. In fact, Israel should be an example in this regard as defense exports finance the country's defense research and development to a considerable degree. Supply chain is a word that became very popular during COVID as everyone realized its importance. A study by Deloitte pointed out that over 200 of the Fortune 500 firms have a presence in Wuhan, the ground zero of COVID-19. The lockdowns in Wuhan and later in Beijing and Shanghai entirely affected the supply of high-density electronic circuit boards, electronic displays, and precision castings. Though post-COVID, there have been some attempts to shift manufacturing base. It bears consideration that China took 20 years of government-driven initiatives to build a local base capable of supplying electronic components, auto parts, chemicals, and drug ingredients. We also have been particularly affected by Russia-Ukraine conflict. Our reliance on Russia for military hardware and equipment and equipment upgrades is common knowledge. However, it also needs to be understood that when Russia is embroiled in a conflict, their OEMs would indubitably prioritize supply of military hardware to their own forces. Acquisition of weapons and sensors from foreign OEMs is a vicious cycle. The proprietary interfaces necessitate that if you import a missile, you also import its, its FCS, reference systems that provide its ship data, its test equipment, calibration setup for test equipment, and repair and support facilities for the FCS missile and all other supporting systems. Every time there is a need to system to upgrade the system to manage obsolescence or life extension, you perforce approach the same OEM, making the service completely dependent on a foreign OEM. In addition, even in TOT, foreign OEMs do not share critical technologies and activities. For these, dependence continues despite local manufacturing. Technology is the basic foundation on which use cases are determined and weapons are developed. Denial of critical technologies is a convenient method used by advanced economies to stifle developing nations. Stuxnet was a small 500 KB computer worm, which targeted Iranian nuclear centrifuges in a nuclear fuel refinement system. 
it proved for the first time that computer virus can target industrial automation systems. Unless the hardware and software are locally manufactured and developed, it is extremely difficult to ensure that computer malware has not been introduced into the system by inimical elements. Having understood the need, now let us get an overview of how the Navy approaches weapon indigenization and what has been accomplished so far. Considering its specialized nature and complexities involved in the weapon indigenization, the, uh, the, uh, the indigenization, weapon indigenization is the charter of DWE, unlike all other indigenization that are steered by DOI. At the command level, command weapon indigenization committees are there. They meet on a quarterly basis to review the indigenization projects. At IHQ level, inputs from the CWICs are collated into an annual weapon indigenization plan. Once promulgated, the release of funds and monitoring of projects is taken up under AWIP by the DWE. To accelerate indigenization, Indian Navy came up with the first indigenization plan called INIP in 2003 which enunciated its requirement of indigenous equipment for next 15 years. The INIP was revised in 2008 and then again in 2015. As brought out in INIP 2015, Indian Navy has embarked upon indigenization through two routes. First one is R&D through the DRDO and second is transfer of technology with industry partners. Some of the major success stories as far as weapon systems are concerned are surface-to-surface -surface missiles, surface-to-air missiles, MR guns, CR guns, torpedo tube launchers, rocket launchers, gun FCS, as has already been highlighted by the vice chief. In addition, these are the systems that have already been inducted. There are other several weapon systems that are at various stages of trial and induction. Despite the aforementioned successes, there are some impediments in weapon indigenization, which have prevented us from achieving greater self-reliance. The first is piecemeal indigenization. In the Navy, system level indigenization is the responsibility of IHQ, while subsystem and module level indigenization is command charter. Prudence dictates that indigenization be progressed in a phased manner, wherein critical modules or those with low MTBF are indigenized first. But in a weapon industry that thrives on use of proprietary interfaces and software and hardware locking of LRUs, any such endeavor is bound to meet the disapproval of the foreign OEMs. There have been some instances of these OEMs when called in for technical assistance, attributing blame on indigenous LRUs for failure, despite there being no connection. The second is the cost factor. There's a need to appreciate that there is a significant difference between the economics of what we presently produce and what we aspire to produce. Our aspiration is to join the big players producing high technology systems, but in the absence of sufficient design and technical skills, the cost of independently developing such high technology systems are higher by orders of magnitude due to, due to high requirements for precision, miniaturization and materials, expensive testing and development facilities and export controls. The next factor is the production quantity. Considering the number that the Navy has, it is difficult and in some cases impossible to manufacture armaments in large enough numbers to benefit from economies of scale. Major platforms are acquired in dozens, but never in thousands. If the technology is being developed for the first time, development cost further spikes unit cost. As Mr. Dhruv Jaishankar termed in an article for Brookings, the defense sector is a monopsony, since Indian defense is the only customer. This leads to further market distortions. Last factor that I would like to highlight today is procedural complexities. Commodore Anil Jaising, had conveyed the sentiments of private sector when he wrote, defense manufacturing has been open to private, sec private sector two decades back, but it has been largely restricted to a network of DPSUs, which work directly under the Ministry of Defense's DDP, creating a perception and not without reason of an us versus them syndrome, where the us, that is the defense PSUs, have always enjoyed a playing field that is heavily skewed in their favor. In addition to the perceived bias, there are problems of long-winded acquisition procedures, acceptance delays due to non-availability of platforms, and associated issues with timely payments. Government has taken several initiatives recently to promote indigenization. I will just rush through because they have been covered several times since morning. The indigenization, indigenization lists, there are three indigenization lists, uh, positive indigenization lists, which have been promulgated by the services. There are two uh, indigenization lists which have been promulgated by the DPSUs. 
this is a srijan portal which has been uh, uh, which is which is there available in the open domain for real time updates on the activities that are being done by the dpsus the changes to make procedure have been covered by uh, the previous speaker the buy global manufacture in india new category make 3 has been introduced the incentives for the msbs have been covered the idex scheme and uh, the ddp has approved 498.8 crores for the next 5 years reservation for msmes and small shipyards that part has been covered the other in uh, incentives to the industrial sector as has been covered by the moderator also the industry industrializing uh, licensing policy has been simplified the fdi uh, has been increased from 49% to 74% defense industrial corridors have been established at up and at uh, and in uh, tamil nadu so several uh, in uh, initiatives have been taken by the government in the uh, uh, past few years so having seen the distance travels to date and the initiatives that have been taken by the government recently i think that the way ahead towards self reliance will require the industry as supplier and the navy as customer to march ahead in sync in the next few slides i'll put forth our expectations from industry and then i'll cover some of the uh, way the services can catalyze the process uh, at the at uh, our end to remove the existing bottlenecks enhance energy and make indigenization more rewarding starting with our expectations from the industry first is the need to absorb technology the indian uh, startups are technologically sound but weapon indigenization especially when it involves piecemeal indigenization is extremely challenging the technical documents in many cases are incomplete and may be a poor translation from the original language uh, the technology in many cases is obsolescent and the only operational equipment may be on ships which cannot be uh, disassembled due to operational reasons in such circumstances the industry needs to have the capability to understand and replicate the underlying technology the present times are a wonderful opportunity to form collaborative partnerships the government's relentless push for make in india and the stand of the services to restrict imports has convinced the foreign oems that the import restrictions are not temporary so they are willing to collaborate and invest in india through the fdi route or as part of intergovernmental agreements indian industry should utilize the opportunity as there is a lot of scope in local man manufacturing of spares of these foreign origin equipment and in their obsolescent upgrade the next point is the hiring of the people who understand defense services especially service requirement commander anand had brought out this point it is pertinent to note that over 60000 personnel retire from services every year the number is likely to increase further in 4 years when the batch of recruits under the agnipath scheme superannuate this is a huge tal talent pool that can be gainfully utilized further the and cognizant of defense requirements which are regularly put out in the open domain also there is a need for greater engagement through forums such as cii sidm def expo and idex such enga such engagements also provide us a perspective on innovative and disruptive technologies that are there in various domains we had discussed earlier about the perception that the playing field is skewed in favor of dpsus today there is a growing realization that while standardization eases inventory management and skill acquisition processes lack of competition gives rise to the mono, mono, monopolistic tendencies there is a need for the private sector to get into core dpsu strength areas such as fire control radars launcher mechanisms uh, medium caliber guns etc to create competition we understand that it is impossible to indigenize 100% of the subsystems and modules however the industry should judiciously validate supply chains while sourcing their requirements there have been instances of delivery periods being unduly extended in light of the global chip shortage thus it would be prudent for the industry to diversify supply chains especially for critical components coming to indian navy and how we can accelerate the process of indigenization indian navy has been planning in advance various technologies and equipment to be indigenized these equipment and requirements are published in the form of idex challenges and the indian navy indigenization plan in should continue to crystal gaze futuristic requirements and disseminate the same in open domain so that the industry can prepare itself also there have been instances in the past where industry has brought out that the qrs of the services are unrealistic while there is an expectation that the product being designed and developed should be technologically advanced it should also be ensured that the qrs 
enable healthy competition between the bidders. There is a need for greater engagement with product designers and developers, especially at the initial stage of the product development life cycle. Indian Navy has created a center for indigenization and self-reliance at Coimbatore for industry outreach, a similar specialized center in respect of weapon indigenization for handholding during initial stages of development is the need of the R. Weapon indigenization is a challenging process. Managing such projects requires thorough knowledge and understanding of acquisition procedures, financial regulations, underlying technology, all of which need time. Frequent transfer of service personnel to cater to career milestones uh, affect the progress of these projects. We should, as far as possible, try to maintain personnel in such critical billets for longer durations. Since weapon indigenization is an extremely niche field, trials and testing require extensive involvement of the services. Even if a product is successfully developed, the only way it can be confirmed is by, un by undertaking trials, which is possible only in reference systems available within naval yards or in operational systems on board ships. Thus, Navy needs to facilitate expeditious trials and testing of the products that have been developed. brought out so many times here is the smallest service and requirements, especially in terms of numbers, are not comparable to Army and Air Force. There is a need on part of HQ IDS to create numbers by pooling requirements of the services as well as Coast Guard to make indigenization process financially viable for the industry. To conclude, India has accomplished major milestones in the field of platform indigenization in recent years some of the most advanced naval platforms that the world has ever seen have been built in India. However, weapon indigenization has not kept pace. Complete and comprehensive indigenization, including weapon indigenization, is sine qua non as it impinges on the strategic autonomy, economic stability, and national security. Needless to mention, Indian government and industry are seized of the matter, and reasonable progress has been achieved in recent years. Success stories notwithstanding, weapon indigenization poses several challenges such as complex technology, inadequate documentation, and economies of scale. Incumbent government has taken certain important initiatives to accelerate the process of indigenization, which have been highlighted earlier. To take the initiative forward, it is imperative for the industry and the Indian Navy to synergize efforts and jointly realize the vision, vision of self-reliance in the field of weapon indigenization. Thank you. Thank you, Captain Mishra. Our next speaker will be addressing us uh, from on the online mode. He's Professor S. C. Mishra. He from IIT, professor. He's a member of the technical committee of the IRS and uh, is the founder president of the River and Ocean Sciences and Technology. Professor Mishra, uh, can you hear us? Yes, yes. Can you hear? Can you Am I visible? Can you unmute yourself? I have unmuted myself. Am I audible? Is it all right? Can I be heard? Can you hear us? Yes, I can hear. Am I visible? Okay, we are now we can hear you. Professor Mishra, we can hear you. Is it okay? Is it all right? Can I... Yeah, I can hear you. I can see you. What about uh, that side? Can you see me and can you hear me? Can I be seen? So it's because of real time, 30 seconds. Ago. So YouTube, I think you have to mute. Just mute YouTube. Yeah, just to mute to this. Then see. No, just not this. Uh, the YouTube channel just move that. This one. Move this. Ah. Okay. I have unmuted myself. 
That you two uh, fingers coming, I think. Yes, sir. Can you hear me? No? Udar off. Udar ko chart kiya, volume. No, this is YouTube. This is YouTube. Yeah. 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 Sorry, he's on mute. No, sir, he's on mute. He's so well. Only if we switch it on this one. What happened? Can you can I be yours? Is Regarding your audio, so uh, uh, we'll uh, I have requested moderator. Uh, can you stop here? Okay, just uh, can you try again to just speak? Let's see if you're clear now. Can you hear me and see me? This is not the Zoom one. That's a left. This is not the Zoom one. No, no, I am unmuted. I am un unmuted at my end. My screen, my picture is coming on the screen. No, it says uh, the option here is to mute again. 
but I am not doing that. So I am unmuted actually. Yeah, hello. Hello, can you hear me? Okay, I'll do one thing. I'll mute myself and then unmute again. Uh, I have unmuted now. Can I be heard? Instead of wasting time, the next speaker can start. I can come after you. Now we have the Maritime India vision, which is uh, propagated and just recap. I've just taken one slide out of that document from the priority initiatives. Increase domestic shipbuilding by 2025, increase domestic shipbuilding by 
So uh, these were some uh, great uh, statements made in the uh, uh, MIV 2025. And uh, the term that we used to use to describe these statements were called mother root statements. You know, uh, which are just statements hanging in the air with no idea as to how to get there. But uh, apparently we have moved somewhere. But uh, now the ground truth is what? Ground truth is that we are not in the top 25. So we now means we rank 18th in terms of flag registration, rank 19th in terms of ownership of the world tree. We, we were the uh, largest ship recycler to be introduced our MIB policies, and we are not in the top 20 ship in This is the ground truth. But looking at it positively, what it tells us is that we have got plenty of experience to grow. You know, China has grown somewhere, Korea has grown somewhere. They probably peaked out. We have a lot of headspace to grow. And uh, if we work on it together, we will get there. So uh, let's look at the approaches to shipping. We spoke about it in two cases. I've taken two case studies. One of the shipping corporation of India and the other of the Navy. What happened to the shipping corporation of India? We converted the shipping corporation of India the buyers money. This slide tells you that they ordered 15 ships on every shipyard in the world, except Indian shipyards, one CSL and one HSL. So they missed out on indigenous capability, they didn't build any capacity, they didn't build any, yes. any skills, and their loss of foreign exchange in Indian jobs. And the second part of the story is not only did they did not build ships in India, the SCI does not uh, does not undertake any uh, repairs of the ships in India for a very important reason because it moves gets foreign lasts and they are uh, posted abroad. So there's a natural disincentive to do anything in India, particularly if you're going to be stuck in Kitchen uh, or being in Dubai, uh, fitting a ship. I think the choice would be in uh, Dubai and get your phone fifty dollars a day there than uh, be in India and not get it. So this is something that the uh, shipping corporation of India's uh, strategic outlook has been. On the other hand, uh, the very proud uh, naval officer, former officer, we the Navy built to the strength, and we are a builder's navy. That was why as many, we are in this way. This type tells you we have heard uh, lots of things on this. But basically, it was the coming together of the buyer, the builder, the user, and the government in a very focused way, which created capability, which created capacity, which created skills. And uh, this, is, this is what is showing the benefits of our strategy over the last few decades. <clears throat> so, uh, now looking at the merchant side, ultimately, uh, this whole thing depends on cargo. Uh, as far as coastal shipping is concerned, uh, we are losing about one, uh, we carry about one billion dollars of cargo in the one crisis by sea. But uh, our budget ship was 1.27 percent as we mentioned. But coastal sharing uh, shipping only constitutes 6.4 percent the share of uh, or the modal share of, of our uh, of our transportation, and out of that, only 54 percent is carried by Indian ships, and it's just a five percent modal shift of cargo from road stream to coastal shipping. Would save 283 million dollars apart from huge savings in energy and emissions, which is a very important parameter today as far as sustainability is concerned, and as far as the government is concerned, and it's the and it's government that the CO25. Of course, uh, there's a lot of debate on the cabotage laws. I don't support it at all, but uh, but we need to do that because we don't have ships to carry our own cargo. There are other challenges as well, and we have discussed that at some length about first mile and last mile connectivity. Mm -hmm. And sometimes in between as well. So there are those uh, little gaps, but we'll have to work with it to overcome that. But this is a state of coastal shipping. When we look at exim shipping, the, at one time, Indian ships carried almost 46% of Indian cargo. Today we are down to 7.5%. And we pay about $58 billion to foreign ships to carry our cargo. I don't think this is a great idea. And of course, we are the fourth largest consumer of oil. 4% of the world share, fifth largest importer of petroleum products, and we have only 1.5% of total tankers. We are the fifth largest importer of petroleum gas, and only have 0.3% of total gas carriers. We have 7.1% uh, of limestone, 51.3% of granite stones, but we own only 1.5% of bulk carriers. 1.8% of iron ore, and 80% goes out from, uh, from various destinations, but we don't build 
per carrier can. In addition, we also import 250 million tons of coal. In the last time that I spoke, spoke on this somewhere else, we had 565 shipments of coal coming into uh, Vizag for RINL, of which only 36 cargoes came from Indian ships. The balance 500 cargoes came from foreign ships. So that is the kind of dependence that we are having on imports as well. Fertilizers uh, uh, is a very important loss of our entire economy. We import 5 million tons of it. Increasingly, we are going to be importing ammonia. And we don't have ammonia gas carriers. They're specialized ships. They're not even building them as yet. So we need to sort of face these facts uh, up front and see what solutions we can do. Uh, strategic implications, of course, are very clear. It's, uh, we must move to multi uh, Multimodal transportation for the benefits of coastal the shipping is well known as choice tied on that subsequently. And we all need to have one integrated ecosystem. This has been discussed at length, and this we emphasize mm -hmm. that point. Isolated and independent schemes are not optimal. And outsourcing cargo to foreign shipping uh, compromises security of trade and access to commodities and markets. We're seeing this increasingly, particularly in, uh, in the regime where there are sanctions and there are uh, denial of trade. So in those times, you must have your own hub. To, uh, to bring your own, uh, own uh, cargo and access the markets that India has to access to so that our economy grows. Uh, of course, there are other aspects of this, job process, etc. And the most more important requirement is that we have to work together in the intermodal transportation so to reduce our uh, logistics cost to the exorbitantly high of 14% to 10% if we have to become complicated in, in our goods. And of course, the economic ramifications, we are some. Cards, uh, is not something that we spoke about. The investment multiplies 11.2 by uh, 2. Employment multiplies multiply 6.4. Turnover multiplies 4.2. These are huge numbers to build up the economy. And they should show up in any discussion that we do. Um, the potential that's been pulled out by KPMG report, you can see this on the slide. But we need to uh, understand that there are strategic and there are economic ramifications for the growth of the shipbuilding industry in India. Uh, so, how do we do this? First and foremost, uh, the proposal is to have Arthur and Ever one each. That means we must carry our own trade assets. That's the first model. And uh, no, uh, this no point when you ships, you are not insured the cargo. So the first requirement is we must have a plan by which we can ensure long term assured cargo. And that can also come about if we can get rid of coverage in a planned way. So that's the first point Arthur and Ever one each. Secondly, we have spoken about uh, credit. The second point is that we must have solutions. Whom is going to give us cash? We need to find ways and means of creating those banking systems that will give us low cost credit towards capacity building and uh, sustainability of the shipping industry together with our ship yards. So, that is one of the big on this slide. With these two together, we come to our number one. That will only come through if we can have a stop the silo based approach. You know, there are only one, one chat is not giving out all the answers. That's not going to work. We need a 15 year ship building plan. Need to have a demand aggregation versus the standard designs. Uh, we have been discussing standard designs for uh, for merchant ships around three basic hard designs. We must like, leverage the existing expertise. We are all expertise. The many people, I think, need they are going to leave in another year or so. At the age of 56, he's going to be available. If I can please tap him, but we won't get a better designer than him. At least the country should not lose these standards. And if people who now retire at the age of 56, that's not fair. They should be absorbed into some system where their skills can be brought to bear as, as designers. And um, uh, not a pure economic viability model, but a strategic necessity. I have highlighted this specifically because mm -hmm. uh, about five years ago, uh, a case for LNG carrier had come up. Mm -hmm. you remember that. And at that time, the uh, the government, and including the BPIO, had shut it down because it was not considered viable. So, whether uh, a pure economic approach to shipbuilding should be allowed or not. Is something that we should understand, and no country in the world has moved to uh, achieve shipbuilding standards without government support. In India, also, it is required unless the government steps in to uh, look at things from a not not a pure balance sheet item, but as an off the balance sheet item in terms of uh, the benefits that you can draw from these programs. Often, you propose in one, will not happen. So, uh, firstly, let's look at how do we get the cargo. The we need four people. We need the director. And at the moment, we already have many of the ministries who use ship, uh, shipping companies to transport their own cargo. Ministry of Coal, Ministry of Fertilizers, Ministry of Public Sector Enterprises, who transport highways, get hundreds of people, food trains. 
need to get them together. The public sector enterprises, the central warehouse, the corporation, the food corporation of India, many of them, they are all shipping cargoes, but they are all shipping these cargoes on foreign ships. So I think we just need to uh, get them together to do that. Then after that, we need to aggregate it. Let's understand what numbers look like. That. I'll put down the next slide. Then you must have the shipper who must also be on board and who must have some assured business. That means you must have a minimum rate, uh, minimum yearly or take long term contract and I assured you are in your growth, which is linked up to the uh, growth of the national team. Mm -hmm. Finally, the builder has to have a good agreement with the, uh, with the uh, agency who is the shipper on a long term procurement and maintenance contract. Mm -hmm. One of the best documents I've seen in the DPI, which combines procurement and maintenance with one doctor in one document. And the RFP was one meter, just one number. That was all that was required to sign off on one of India's best electric locomotives project. One number. That was one number. Something like that is what we need to uh, look at to get that. So, this is the slide that I told you uh, considering the emissions, the energy requirements, the cost aspect, going down logistics, etc. It's very clear to anybody that if you do uh, coastal, you are going toward. But it is only port to port. This is where Gati Shakti is gone, where I can see first and last mile uh, connectivity will uh, be established. So we need to work together on this, right? Gati Shakti is moving on a particular uh, line. We need to work together to see that the last mile and first mile connectivity is also in place. So uh, this is how the uh, business case looks like. I uh, put on that if you are looking at 6% share and go to 33% uh, share, as shown in the red arrow, if you are looking at saving uh, uh, about a thousand million. Uh, rupees per year if you wait this much from uh, from uh, uh, 6% to 33% interest rate. And uh, of course, don't forget this will also save us a lot of on emissions and energy, uh, energy, the two things that we are internationally committed to. So, uh, when we uh, did this, we also did a requirement analysis for uh, what the coastal cargo looks like of the 2035. We're taking very, 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 very conservative growth rates for coal in that growth of 2%. Uh, this year it's much more than 2% already. I don't know, that's 7.5% offside, etc. So the actual uh, 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 the potential cargo in 2035 becomes 1441 million tons mm. and uh, not counting uh, fuel and container in new. Next part of the story was, you know, how do we mark this one? This is where we work together and we close the, the plan on three health bombs. 26,000 ton, 50,000 ton, and 100,000 ton. Looking at uh, uh, roughly uh, 11 months of operations, four voyages in the year, which gave you a number close to uh, uh, the last number there 1,353 ships at a cost of 160,000 crores over a 10 year period. This is what, what we need in actual terms and numbers to make our shipping industry take. So, then the, how do we build this? What is the build plan? Firstly, we must have standardized design specifications. I hope it is nothing like the ones that we have pulled out on the Indian Waterways Authority website. I think that one to four is the kind of design that we suggested there. The second part is, of course, I think uh, many of my friends also spoke about get the supply chain in place, beginning with the marine diesels. We don't make marine diesels in India, and we must have very high technology marine diesel engines. Whether they are marine diesels or green, green hydrogen driven is a matter of choice, but let's look at Marine diesels for the time being. Then have strategic partnerships for ship construction. This is what we have discussed today. And I'm going to build it. Then make the strategic supply chain. We have to understand not, not, not everything can be built in India. And these are business discussions. So some of these things will have to be balanced on what we need to buy and what we need to make. And uh, the most important part of building a sustainable supply chain is to have move away from the bad production. You can't say, you know, you build three ships, then you see it on. You make one aircraft carrier, come back after 10, you make one more. That way, the supply chain will never get made, including propellers. You know, for ship propellers, you can't order because nobody knows you want two, you want 20, or you want one. No idea. So, we must not forget that we have to move away from this bad production model of ordering two ships at one go to a pipeline production model. Mm -hmm. How the US had done it when they did World War II, they spoke about the Liberty class. So, there are some lessons we can learn from those systems, and this will build the supply chain in India, build the scale and size to support the answer. So, how do we? Uh, the, th the second part of the problem is uh, so, so they see Punji, credit the game. So, we have now proposed that uh, we have a national bank which is building a shipping development, and the, the funding is very simple. We just do what the NHI has done for road transport, they 
process of one thousand petrol and one fifty petrol and diesel that has given the mayor of money to build all the highways in India. That's one of the claims that we are getting. All that we are here, uh, here we are saying is that if you ship anything on FOB basis on any foreign ship, you pay me at zero point five percent. As my uh, sense on that, around sixty billion dollars, zero point five percent is a hell of a lot of money, mm -hmm. and that money is going interest free to this bank, and this bank should have no business to uh, lend lend this money at anything more than three to four percent, covering about one point five percent for its operating cost and two point five percent as over on that. That's a very reasonable margin for any bank to work on. Then uh, we spoke about the staple debt. This is the idea that is that we took from the IMF. Where every RFP that is issued to any shipyard comes with a stable debt, where, where there is a clear understanding that the debt will be at two percent or one point five percent or whatever the NAB SSP does, and to about eighty five to ninety percent of the project cost value. Not in this complex methodology that we have now got for funding uh, shipyards. You know, the, uh, higher of this, lower of that, medium of that. It's not engineers some third party has to determine. No, it's a simple thing. You go ahead and do it. So this is what happens to the shipyards. We, we give the debt to the shipyard who, who makes this uh, thing, sells it to the, uh, to the ship owner who now gets a staple debt transfer to it. And the ship owner starts uh, uh, getting its revenues through the assured cargo that is uh, guaranteed by the government agency. The old fertilizer is there. So they have become the cargo guarantor. The revenue stream starts coming. I have now paid for it. You build the ship on credit. You, I have paid you for it. Now I'm going to pay you back. The, uh, through the uh, uh, capex route that's shown here. The same thing as uh, spent out in more detail here. This is on how the opex is uh, to be made. Of the same as of the long term contract for carriage of the short cargo. So, uh, finally, of course, uh, cabotage. So at some stage, you must have a sunset clause in cabotage. You know, we can't continue with this whole thing endlessly. At some stage, you have to tell them where they get off. And um, we have to uh, make sure that. Um, that uh, Future cargo is only carried on Indian ships, and we tell this well in time. You can't tell them at 8 o'clock in the evening that Baro Lake Evans is no cabotage. That won't work. So we'll have to say now that we'll set a date, whatever date you decide. I'll put down 31 December 2026. Somebody might want to say 1st January 2027. That's a matter of detail. But the fact is that we need to announce to the whole world that, of course, this is it. Cabotage will stop, relaxation is gone, so it's okay. So, how do you do this? We, as I mentioned, we make the uh, 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 bank, National Bank of Shipbuilding and Shipping Development. So it works for both the shipping, uh, shipbuilders and the ship repair, uh, shipping community for all this thing. And I've told you that you can have 2,500 crores of money every year. That will fund you to about 40 to 50,000 50, ton ships to be built in India. So I don't think you can build it, but you can go for it. So, how does this uh, NAB SSB look like? It should have the mandate. We make here, there should be a control organization, there should be a professional management. Uh, the board of directors, management, to get the right there should be banking guys, there should be guys as part of the management and the direction team. It should be located in Mumbai and it should have transit there, there should be communities yeah. and uh, probably budget and finance. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. So, uh, so in this whole thing, uh, we need to also review what has been said in the MIV 2030 and make some more ambitious targets. We must say that we want to do 33% mobile share by 2035. Another mother of state. But at least in my mother of state, I have suggested some way to get close to that number. We may not get there, but let's set ourselves a target. Uh, as I learned from my earlier CEO, I do for Shikhar and this, who set tough targets, you're not likely to attain easy targets either. So let's start with some tough targets, so we'll get from there. This is how we are saying on gold share of ownership, uh, Indian jobs, 21,000 seat per year. This has been all calculated. We can get all these numbers if we follow the plan that I've suggested. Mm -hmm. Then, um, so finally, what is the pedestal view? What, do, what, do we, or what should be our passage plan? Uh, first of all, you need more consideration with the industry stakeholders, who are the cargo aggregators, the guarantors, the shippers, the shippers, the insurers, the charters, and figure out how to do all this in terms of the legal work, the documentation that is very tough. As far as winds and tides are concerned, we need to figure out what it is and what for, and that is where a whole of nation approach becomes a strategic must. Uh, we need to do a lot of negotiations. You know, these are not easy to do. And there will be a lot of uh, pushback from the uh, from the industry, from the ministries. So we want to retain our independence from there. We want to send our buyer, grain, and sell it to. And finally, it should be staged by some uh, 
this is an organization which has a multi ministerial coordination sort of thing. And uh, I have seen Mr. DK, which can be an independent authority reporting to the cabinet secretary. And as far as the saving part is concerned, it should be covered by the concerned ministry, where we actually spoke about that at least to, within the ministry, at least a senior uh, civil services also should be uh, uh, responsible for it in terms of decision making in this region. Mm -hmm. So, this is where I think I finished my presentation. And thank you very much for this present here. I've been very grateful to you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Very interesting question. First one, uh, as far as ownership of the Indian architecture uh, concerned, uh, when the review of maritime transport was one, 38% of uh, 38% of 38% uh, of 38% uh, of 38% 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 of I think that's just in between. So, just start your video. Just give one more try after the question answer. Yes, just not this. This still not finish. Yes, again, yes. And just start your video. Unmute your video. Report all that here. Make it here. And then, you know, I'm not going to have a cat in here on board. Just give it a try, ma'am. Uh, can you now unmute your audio? Also? I have unmuted. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 
Yeah. Uh, I have unmuted myself. Yeah, can you hear me? Oh. Yeah, I'll do that. Okay, are you sure I can be heard? Okay, all right. Good evening, everybody. Hello. Good evening, everybody. Can I be heard? Can I be heard? Can you hear me? Yes, sir, you're audible, sir. Okay. 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 In that case, I'll first, uh, with so much of uh, trouble, I'm so sorry that uh, I couldn't come and all these things have happened. Anyway, uh, I have uh, been hearing so many luminaries talking about shipbuilding that I really feel humbled to be able to speak about something. Uh, perhaps uh, you all know I'm a teacher and I don't really have the practical shipbuilding experience. Uh, but all the same, I would dare to speak my views and uh, let's see how it goes. I'll share my screen, what happened to it? I, I, I represent an organization which is called Forum for River and Ocean Scientists and Technologies. We are a group of professionals who have formed this forum. And we talk mainly about anything connected, connected with waterways. That is both inland waterways, lakes and lagoons, and also coastal waterways and oceans. So I, I was requested to talk on Indian shipbuilding the way ahead. And I have prepared a few slides. Maybe they will be of interest. 
India has the, has the uh, morning, uh, uh, our uh, keynote speaker mentioned, India has a maritime trading history since perhaps 5,000 years to 6,000 years. Mahanjadara was 2,500 to 3,000 years before Christ. Wooden ships were built and traded in high seas from the Malabar coast, from Konkan coast, from Gujarat coast, from Coromandel coast, and from Kalinga coast to almost all over the world in the Asiatic region. That is to West Asia, East Africa, to Southeast Asia and Far East. Indian ships are known to have been trading with China since a long time. Wooden shipbuilding is a traditional art and this skill has uh, This skill has been passed down the line through generations. Particular note must be made. One important uh, aspect I wanted to bring out in this, that uh, uh, the ports flourished on river mouths and banks, perished when the river changed its course or got silted, new ports formed and shipbuilding and shipping continued without a break till the beginning of 20th century. In other words, People really didn't bother whether there is a port or not. They just made a port. Whenever the river changed its course, people just made a port, made a shipbuilding yard, made ships, built ships, and proceeded with uh, trading in the uh, Far Eastern and uh, Southeastern and uh, Southwestern countries. This is something which is unique and must be understood. There are no fixed ports. Steel shipbuilding started in the early 20th century. Saw the advent uh, early 20th century saw the advent of steel shipbuilding and ship repair in this country, particularly in Kolkata and then in Mumbai. Shipbuilding and repair industry grew as the demand increased due to increased trade between England and India. This got a further boost during the Second World War. During this period, welding depressed rebating in shipbuilding. Indian workers grew in skill levels to tackle changing scenarios in the shipbuilding technology. It must be noted with pride that after independence, these workers only were instrumental in building a robust shipbuilding industry, which did not grow as expected. I say robust because the first ships that were built in, built in this country was also a good ship. So right from the time of independence, shipbuilding quality has not deteriorated. But however, shipbuilding industry hasn't improved. This is very well known. CSL was established in 1972. This was a post-independent shipyard. And uh, now it has built the newest aircraft. It's done very well. Mazandok Limited is uh, 250 years old or so. And a major defense yard, GRAC, established in 1884 taken over by government in 1960. CIWTC, Central Inland Water Transport Corporation, formerly Harrison Co Company, was taken over by GRAC. This was a shipyard next to the GRAC, but unfortunately it couldn't survive, it must. HSL, established in 1941 by Sindhya Steam Navigation Company, taken over by government in 19, 1952 and transferred to MOD in 2010 primarily because its merchant shipbuilding history was not encouraging. Goa Shipyard, established by Portuguese in 1957, taken over by MOD in 1900, uh, 1967. Other central and government shipyards, SDPE, now with CSL, Salimar Works, still uh, daughtering. For Shipbuilding to improve, we have heard a lot from the previous sector, so I don't know how much it is important to talk about, but however, I'll talk about this. In 1971, shipbuilding ship pricing policy was established by the government and shipbuilding subsidy policy was applicable only to HSL and CSL. No other private shipyard nor government shipyard. In 2002, 
shipbuilding subsidy policy was applicable to all shipyards except defense yards. Contract signed for ships till 14th August 2007 through global tendering were eligible for ship, uh, subsidy. 30% of the bid, bid price was subsidy. Sorry. Applicable to commercial vessels of length more than 80 meters. Budgetary provisions was made till 2013-14 and later extended till 2020-21. But one has to remember that the shipbuilding uh, subsidy of this generation, 2002, stopped in 2007. So ships which are ordered and keels were laid out to 2007 were not eligible for shipbuilding subsidy. Only those ships which, which keel, keel was laid prior to 2007 uh, were eligible and they got their subsidy till 2020-2021. Stoppage of shipbuilding policy uh, subsidy subsequently could have been a reason, a major cause for decline of collapse of many private shipyards in 2007-8. Today, shipbuilding financial assistance policy includes it's valid for contracts signed between 1st April 2016 to 31st March 2026. Valid for all commercial ships built in India of length more than 80 meters. Subsidy of 20% of contractual price to be paid to the shipbuilder. The subsidy is to be reduced by 3% every three years. Ships built and delivered within three years of contract signing. Ships must be built and delivered within three years of contract signing. Shipyard capacity expansion is to be from the from its own resources. So that two or three things are important here. One, government is giving a subsidy of 20% starting from 2016, and it is to be reduced by 3% every three years. That means over the 10 year period, there will be a 10% reduction in subsidy. That means it is expected that shipyard will improve its uh, performance and it will have a better cost control. Shipyard capacity expansion is to be from its own resources. That means government is not going to fund anymore for, for infrastructure development in shipyards. To encourage shipbuilding in India, government has further issued shipping directive 2020 that cabotage uh, things have been discussed earlier, so I'll drop that. If you look at ships on order, this diagram, this uh, uh, pie chart, you'll see that most of the orders are bulk carriers and tankers, and you have container ships, passenger ships, and general cargo ships. In this scenario, if you look at the Indian order book position for commercial ships, in July 2022 was 132,000 CGT, or roughly 0.2% of the total international order book position. This is the real situation. And this is talking about these common ships, tankers, bulk carriers, uh, container ships, uh, general cargo ships, and passenger ships. This lack of order book position was primarily because orders being booked by naval vessels. So there was no, no capacity of building more vessels. India could not compete with China, Japan, and Korea with regard to cost and delivery schedule. So there are two aspects. I mean, one is that shipyards had naval vessels order, and the other was that the cost and delivery periods were not competitive with others. But during this period of 50, 60, 70 years, India has built liquefied gas carriers, uh, though a small one that runs in Cochin, uh, liquefied ammonia gas carrier. Small high performance vehicle again in Cochin, which are running in the Cochin Metro. Coastal resource vessels building across the seas in India and across the coast, tugs, fishing trawlers, and a number of passenger vessels flying between Indian mainland and Andaman and also around Andaman Islands and uh, Lakadip Islands. Now, if, if you leave out those uh, uh, ships of five types, which I discussed in the last listing, uh, you can see here that Korea has received orders of 49% of the totally LNG fired ships. LNG fired ships, that means the main engine is fired by LNG, it's not LNG carrying ships. If they could be LNG carrying ships, but 
along with LNG carrying ships which have LNG fired engines, other ships that are also fired by LNG engines. Korea has got 49% of the order. Korea has obtained order for 60% of the total eco-friendly ships. What is an eco-friendly ship? Eco-friendly ship is one in which the diesel oil is mixed with other kinds of oil, reducing carbon emission, and also auxiliary uh, propulsion devices such as uh, wind power uh, and uh, solar power uh, uh, uses. Also, eco-friendly ships would include, include hydrogen power ships. So by July 2022, Korean shippers have received a total order even larger than the Chinese order. In this scenario, India has built INS Vikram, order placed in 2004 on Cochin Shipyard Limited, ships launched in 2013, and finally commissioned on 2000, 2022. This is our glory. We can build very sophisticated ships. That is not questioned anymore. That's why I brought out this slide. INS Vikrant means that Indian shipbuilder can build really sophisticated ships. Status of Indian shipbuilding. Why is Indian commercial shipbuilding in such a state? We have got, got our favorite tradition, skill, capacity to quickly assimilate new skill, and apparently supportive government. But still, our cost control is poor and delivery time is large, so, very so we get a very limited market share. These are the main two items. Cost is high and our delivery period is not within contractual. Our contractual delivery period itself is high, plus we cannot deliver within the contractual delivery. We have a large and profitable defense shipbuilding industry. What have we learned from this? If we have Today, Cochin Shipyard, Mazagon Dock, and Garni Shipbuilders and Goa Shipyard show a, show a profit in their financial statements. If, therefore, I say that defense shipbuilding industry has been a profitable shipbuilding industry in our country today. I have put three major reasons for this in-house and successful design establishment. We have heard about the naval design establishment so well today. So a good design establishment which supports ship construction is an essential item of our good shipbuilding. Value addition to the steel structure of a ship. If you look at the any naval vessels cost breakup, perhaps large, large amount will go to equipments. So when you have a large value addition, your profit automatically goes up. And then third item, which is very important, is the very alert owner. The owner partners the shipbuilder. Uh, this, uh, what do you call this? Uh, the naval system is there now. You have uh, an office in each shipyard where you partner with the shipbuilder to build a good ship. Very few ship, ship owners, private ship owners would do this in the commercial shipbuilding practice. I think these three are the main reasons. Can we do something about this? Learn something from it. Design effort. I'll talk about design effort. There have been uh, comments in this seminar that India does not have the design know-how and till today, India is importing designs. That I'm objecting to. And I'm bringing before you uh, facts that are necessary to know. A close interaction between designer and builder can reduce a lot of difficulties best during construction. That is reduction of rework, better performance prediction, timely delivery, and bet better system engineering approach. Have designs purchased from abroad been flawless? Are designers available for consultation and advice during construction? Any foreign design, we, we learned today that we buy designs. If you buy a commercial design, is the designer available for discussion or for advice during the construction or delivery? 
I don't think they are available. NSDRC was a design house owned and established by the government in 1987, and it worked till 2009. Apart from many other design activities, it successfully built, designed a number of passenger vessels, small and big, for Andaman administration. And uh, perhaps most of you will remember the successful completion of Kaligat vessel, which was left half done in the Ugly Rock. A number of research vessels for NIOT. NIOT has been a strong client of NSDRC, and NSDRC has helped it build up its research vessels successfully. In fact, research vessel team and itself. Then there is the small crafts to, for tourism, sports, wood and FRP steel, aluminum, high speed vessels, mostly catered to national needs, would also be export oriented. There are two or three things I want to bring your to your notice. One is, can we build value added ships? This item, which is, uh, you see a conventional ships, equipment cost is about material, purchased material cost, including steel, is about 60 to 65% and 35 to 40% is all other costs. And whatever success you have in production, your profit margin would not be more than 10%. And this 10% goes down subject to international competition. When you build a value added ship, this 65% goes, goes up to 75%. So the remaining cost is 25%. Therefore, your profit margin, even if it is 10%, you are getting a 10% profit over 75% of, of the material cost also. And that is a good increase in your profit level. Then there is a large demand for in, inland and inland cargo and passenger vessels of steel, mostly limited to national competition. And why is it that when government decides to do something, it can really do very well, like building defense ships. But why cannot the government decide to build inland cargo vessels and passenger vessels to move in our rivers? It can be only talked about, but what is the incentive the government gives for building Indian cargo vessels? Small crafts, of course, there are a lot of small craft builders. Then ship production, if you look at ship production, some salient features of ship production, I'm sure all of uh, the audience will be knowing about this. Ships are customs built, custom built. Today, marine platforms are of varied types. Marine platforms are technology intensive different skill sets, work environment is harsh. Shipbuilding comes under the category of heavy industries having uh, strategic importance. Such construction is a combination of construction and assembly. Quality check is required at all stages of construction. And the most important item of ship production is system integration. How good is your system integration? What does Indian shipbuilding suffer from? I've listed some names, some items, but I'm sure that today we have talked so much about uh, subfronts of Indian shipbuilding, particularly naval ships. Okay, delay due to supply items. Decision making process for equipment is slow. Follow up with vendor and subcontractor is slow. That we distributor generally doesn't follow up with the vendor and subcontractor on a regular basis. Only when the item is about to come, he rings up, is my item ready? Can it be shipped? Rework required for maintaining quality. Normally, all departments are notionally walled without communication with each other. This is a typical scenario of Indian shipyards where all departments remain within themselves. You ask uh, a young man with about 10 years experience in shipyard working in a particular office, a particular shop, he will tell you everything about that shop, but if you ask him what is happening in the next shop, he will say, I don't know. So what happens is system integration becomes difficult because people don't realize what their, their working effort will be on the next shop and things like that. Similar thing happens, lack of communication between external stakeholders during the shipbuilding process, that is the builder departments, ship owner, class, vendors, and government bonds. Because of this, system integration is poor. Technically, 
and also there is no integration with production uh, the cost the fine no financial integration with production no cost control no cash flow control this is the sad state of indian shipbuilding today what can be done hello yeah if a yard wants to build value added ships an essential requirement is sound knowledge base which should be continuously upgraded with new technologies now this i don't think ship builder himself will understand very well but i feel that if you want to really build value added ships if you want to buy build lng ships lng fire ships the knowledge at least the theoretical knowledge of lng fire ships must be available in the ship yeah. it's not enough saying that you have a lng cylinder and you feed it to the uh, uh, engine and it will fire and go no it should be more than that it should be details as one would know god lies in details so can shipyard make provisions for reading technical material i have gone to many shipyards when i ask somebody have you do you find time to read the technical literature he says no sir we are working till about 8 pm every day including a saturday and sometimes also on sunday so where is the time now unfortunately i feel that shipyards must make an effort towards getting technical material and asking their officers and staff to read and upgrade their knowledge it can also organize short term courses and this should be applicable to officers and traders advanced skill training when a young man goes into a shipyard he is sent from department to department on a monthly basis for a year and that is how he learns about ship building but he learns nothing you ask any youngster with a one year experience in shipyard he will say yeah i am posted in this shop and i am working there that's all i am learning this this work but if you have a ship building simulation software then he could learn so ship building on his own there is no such software in existence normally like the engine simulator trains the marine engineer to work on an engine if a ship builder can be trained on a ship building software simulation software he can do a better ship building activity in his own yard in fact he can learn much quicker than what you learn in a long period of time communication system improvement this is something i was shocked to hear the other day that the small vendors people who make these uh, blocks steel blocks and also ancillary i i hope it will apply to msmes and ancillaries uh, that the communication with the builder is very poor and the cash flow is a major problem if we are talking of small vendors msmes and uh, uh, entrepreneurs then one must remember they have a cash flow problem it is not that rich in cash and they will deliver the goods and then they will get the money also they don't have time for training so it is can the builder take the vendors as partner can the builder communicate with the builder in a manner that he can train them and he can understand his cash flow problems and he can side with him in solving his problem and getting his getting the product back from him i think this is an essential item which is really lacking in our country that communication between small vendors and builder there is no boss and servant here all are partners you cannot say this is bad take it back that kind of attitude doesn't work so i think communication is a very important tool in an age when human to human human contact is required to be reduced on the shop floor because of covid of course i have written this sentence in the aftermath of covid it is essential that an advanced computer computer system for in an age when human to human contact is required to be reduced in the shop floor it is essential that an advanced computer system for supplying not only the technical details but also the work in progress on a real time basis 
digitization and digitalization, including IoT, cloud computing, AI, and machine learning, edge computing and cybersecurity, et cetera, must be applied. Okay, we have, we have been hearing today that there is a lot of digitization and a lot of work being done in the naval ship design, this thing. But what about digitalization? How much of communication between different organizations in the same digital model is done? Can the vendor and the builder, builder and the owner, builder and the government body, I, I, can all these be under a digitalized system of digital information, including perhaps the perhaps the advanced stage would be AI and machine learning. So my suggestion is that digitalization must be done. That is everybody must be networked together so that any information that is generated in one place should be automatically transmit, transmitted to the other required places. Of course, one must remember cybersecurity is very important, but this is not something which is insurmountable. System integration, we have talked about it. A ship as a whole unit has to be built in concurrent manner and not on a sequential basis. Digitization, digitalization helps. Procurement, order placing, procurement, and installation. Decision-making process would greatly be enhanced if we could have a digital twin of shipbuilding process helping to do PLM, product life, life, life cycle management from the concept test till delivery and perhaps beyond. So finally, we come to the theme of this session, can government policy help? As far as I understood, till now, government has only talked of financial subsidy. This is necessary, but not adequate. Could there be different incentive schemes for value-added ships and inland water vessels? Apart from those that is given for general ships like bulk carriers, tankers, cargo ships, and container vessels. Can value added ships be in incentivized so that shippers are encouraged to eat, uh, uh, build value added ships? Apart from naval vessels, I'm not talking of naval vessels, I'm talking of commercial vessels which are value added in nature, like those where I have already mentioned. And if we are really interested in inland water transport, we should give some incentive to inland water vessels, which may be less than 80 meters, but built by smaller yards. That is very important, I think. Could there be some encouragement to ancillary industries and MSMEs? This has been talked a great deal, and I'm sure that uh, uh, nothing is required to be explained in this. Could the government support major multi-institutional development projects, such as shipbuilding simulation, digital twin for shipbuilding and encourage innovation. Uh, we have heard that the Navy has its uh, uh, establishments for supporting defense equipment innovation. Navy also has a major DRDO establishment which does innovational work and designs, in, uh, helps in indigenous work. Is there anything in commercial shipbuilding for this? I don't think so. NSDRC was there in some extent, but now it is closed. It is not there, simply nothing is there. People have talked about R&D being very little in this country. Design effort being very little in this country. Why? Is the knowledge base inadequate? If this knowledge base was inadequate, is the same set of people how people are building naval vessels? No, sir, it is not the knowledge base. It's the effort, it's the desire. When Europeans, Americans, Chinese, and Koreans can have national-based R&D projects with multi-institutional involvement, classification societies, research institutions, uh, educational institutions, etc., why can't we have? Can anybody name a project which is multi-institutional? For shipbuilding, it's not there. I am suggesting two projects here: ship, ship, shipbuilding simulation and digital twin for shipbuilding. 
which should be supported by government in a major way and supplied to shipyards once it is through. I also want the government policy to support innovation in commercial shipbuilding. We don't have a DRDO. Maybe we don't have an organization, but some organization can be interested to encourage innovation with some amount of cash input. And that's all. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. A special thank for the thank you for the patience shown while we sorted out the technical challenges. I think this only reminds me of that story we read in school, no? Robert and the spider, right? Try, try, try. Uh, Robert Bruce and the spider. Try, 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 and we'll succeed. I think we have a few minutes for uh, questions from the audience. Uh, so, uh, so questions to raise their hand, to give their names so that it's recorded. Uh, yes, 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 A very, very comprehensive picture of where we are now and where we should be. But given where we are now, originally in single digit percentages, what is the sort of time frame you're looking at to achieve what sort of achievable objective where, at least if not, you know, which is not ideal, but could be acceptable? And this I'm asking in relation to something we quoted the maritime vision now, 2030. We should have a maritime agenda, 2010 to 2020. Part of that got subsumed into Sagarmala in 2015. But at the end of 2020, what had been achieved was far, far short of what had been desired in the agenda in 2010. So, what so you guys talking about now, now, that by 2030, we will be where we want, we want to be. And from that, from that third, third question, question, most of the most things, things you expect, expect will be done by the very beginning, not being able to do it in 75 years. So what will bring about that transformation? Thank you. Uh, we've been discussing this for some time. Ultimately, uh, the point is uh, that everything has a tipping point. In our case, we are at a stage in our uh, country where we are at a tipping point, where we have only one direction to go. That is all. So until now, we are ambivalent. Uh, we are direction, and uh, we have already saw the building blocks are in place, and uh, more of the building blocks will be done. There's also some institutional changes that have happened in government that probably facilitate many of these things that are done. But finally, as I said, this whole thing, if I put a number of things on the by for like every week, we are still very aware of. Very much the end of the year in the uh, itself. Uh, the point is that uh, what I'm trying to bring out here is that no one ministry can do this. You know, shipping is a government thing, uh, is a whole of the ship. And uh, to that extent, we need to sort of put those building blocks as of those three major things. You must have cargo, you must have credit, and you must go with the campaign. These three things are the, are the first principles. And the second principle that I mentioned is after the one is so basically that does this to be to uh, 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 both uh, and one. That is the formula. Now to get the cabotage out of the way, to get the credit structure is pretty simple. As mentioned you, these numbers are very fine. We are spending sixty billion dollars for a foreign company to carry our cargo. What is zero point five percent says something of the side? So we got the money, uh, this fee to the bank. And uh, we should be able to uh, uh, give that money to ship, uh, ship owners and ship carriers. That should be able to be one small order. So at least you're taking care of the credit. Last part is the cargo. Now the cargo exists in this country. We have made a prediction of almost 1.5 billion uh, tons of cargo to be moved if the, if the objective of 33% of the cargo is taken up. Okay, we want to take the 
that's the five fold increase from today. And that itself will give you a mix of the of the challenges that we need to work on. And all these things will also work because we create the scale and size to set up the landscape that you think you making problems in the the main engines in India or whatever else that comes up to mind. I don't know, even window wipers or something. But uh, all these things are are only possible for industry to participate in if there's visibility on their place, if there's scale and size. So that's my sense of optimism. And uh, if we have to go to the fourth largest economy and the second largest economy by 2047, you have to get there on something. No? That something is probably ships. Anybody else? So you talk about stable uh, tech. Maybe grasp that. Now we are in the think tank, we are discussing all these issues. Power that be from the government sector, are they here? Or are, in some manner, do we have a mechanism to pass on this uh, our findings to them so that you know, the nation we must continue to work on some other external issues? So can we really pass on this kind of idea? What is the thing? Thank you for that observation. Any other questions? Yes, I think we have time. Uh, yes, sir. Yeah. I want to ask, are there any plans to make any battery operated chips? Because a battery operated chip will be free of any chip. Uh, then for smaller ranges in the port and coast, they can be operated. For Coast Guard petrol vessels, for Navy petrol vessels, and for ASW ships. That is the future to go because you have to reduce emission. See, I am as part of the other work that I do, I also just involved in sustaining security business on recently. Um, I have a big issue with uh, electric propulsion because you know, while you might have to make it a little bit of electric propulsion, uh, for it, uh, 
important economy which is primarily deriving its uh, power from coal-based power plants. So you are actually displacing the source of uh, pollution. And you ultimately your total emissions are on the rise. So you know you have to build those batteries and this, uh, charging those batteries requires to take power, and that comes to coal-based power plants. So uh, certainly, as far as uh, alternative uh, uh, energy sources for uh, for powering these uh, chips are concerned. Um, we are already working on a project on green green hydrogen that is going to come into energy sources using a mix of uh, fuel cells, electrolysis, and EP as the plants. That will give you a combination of hydrogen, oxygen, and ammonia. Now, ammonia is a far more uh, stable fuel. So, in the future, we will see potentially uh, engines that will be running on uh, uh, on hydrogen. hydrogen but, um, uh, I am not a great supporter of uh, electric projects. I think I am going to add to that and give a different view. Uh, yes, it is a fact that electrical anything from you know run on electricity derives its energy from fossil fuels. But the issue is one of point source of pollution versus dispersed source of pollution. Mm -hmm. And a point source of pollution can be better controlled than a dispersed source of pollution. Mm -hmm. And just for information, there is a commercial passenger ship of 26 passengers, which is being operated commercially in the backwaters of Kerala. It was built by a company run by the government of Kerala. Mm -hmm. And its operational cost is just 35 by per market. <laughs> So there are initiatives, and there are initiatives. To, I think it's very useful uh, for, for example, eco tourism. If you're going to the mud volcano in uh, Andaman, or uh, you're you're you're, 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 you're you're having a boat ride on Paikara Bay or on the Lake Kisilka Bay, I think it's it, one one should start there. But I'm very clear that yes, amount of fossil fuel use is the same, but it's the source of pollution which is manageable in one case and not so manageable in the other. Yes. So my question again is, uh, thank you for that presentation and interesting answer. You mentioned that uh, yeah, we pay $58 billion to foreign ships for carrying Indian cargo. Now, whether it's more or less in India or not, it's about how attractive Indian registry is. As you mentioned, 50 percent of those ship owners are Indian ship owners carrying but foreign flags. So, at the first, why is it a concern? And how building 400 ships, as you mentioned, plan will address this concern? Yeah, the very first question is that the ship owners $60 billion dollars that we pay are to foreign companies carrying Indian cars. Those companies don't buy Indian cars. So, yes. foreign Only uh, about uh, as, as in the middle of 80s, Exim cars, we call it as Exim cars, used to be about 46 percent carried on Indian owned and Indian uh, Indian, uh, Indian flag ships. They, they are at about 6.5%. That means that 94% of, of Indian cargo is carried on foreign hundreds, for, uh, for which the number is $58 trillion a year, is what we pay for three times. Why should we pay that? It is about making Indian business. Yes, it's about building. Because even if you build ships, you get nice to have to be here, you know, just to give an example. I think you've got a very valid point. Uh, in the example that I quoted for the long term uh, procurement term maintenance contract by the Ministry of Education, for a maintenance program. It was a very simple thing. <coughs> you know, we want let's say 100 locomotives a year. You produce 150, you export 250. So here also we are saying, if you want to do 1500 ships or 1400 ships that we have calculated on a particular site, you can defer. You know, you can change your 50,000 to whatever 60,000 and 60,000 or something else. Those numbers have been derived by working with the Indian engineer as to what would be the powering requirement and how the modular propulsion packages fit with the marine engine uh, specifications. So that you don't have to have a wide diversity of uh, marine engines to be powering all these things. But to come back to you, $60 billion, that's what I would like to pay Indian ship, uh, shippers to, uh, rather than pay to uh, 
mayors can uh, whatever else are there in the world. That's the point. So that money should be saved. That's the foreign exchange. Yeah, I think the <coughs> discussion can continue, but uh, we have to come bring it to a close at some point. Uh, it's been a very long session, so I'm going to, for the sake of recording, just uh, recap on the five uh, presentations. We had Commodore Tiwari, who had a case study, who, deliberate, uh, who, who had presented a case study of Korea and China, and focused on the need for financial reforms, development of science and technology, and manufacturing, and having dedicated ship building needs. And uh, <coughs> Commander Siraluddin, focused on the vendor base, the need to develop a very robust and reliable vendor base, whereas Captain Mishra highlighted the need for integrated indigenization, reduce the procedural complexities, promote collaboration, and create a competitive edge among the shipyards. <coughs> uh, Professor Mishra highlighted the need to focus on value-added ships and even vessels, but once again, systems integration but advanced skill, which includes training in digital twin and shipbuilding simulation software. And uh, Commodore Samadhar, of course, uh, it was filled with so much information uh, that I think we need an evening to look at it. <laughs> but uh, some things that uh, you know, I could say was implication of outsourcing cargo to foreign shipping on not just the offshore of forex, but also on security matters and need for standard designs, importance of assured cargo, no cargo, no shipping. That's the equation that I have. So I would like to thank each one of the panelists for their commitment and you know serious um, in intensive presentation. Uh, I think we all agree that shipping has to be promoted in India, and we are discussing how to go about it. These capabilities do not develop overnight. And I can assure you that even policy reforms are not a magic wand. Having been in government for 35 years, there is policy, there is policy reform, and there is policy implementation. There is no dearth of ideas as we can see from the startups. We are the, I think, the fourth largest startups. And it's not just ordinary startups, we are having unicorn startups. So there's no dearth of ideas. But how do we actually nurture, mentor, and support these projects? And before I close, I'd like to just share four points that can, you know, just thoughts, um, which which come from many of the presentations so far. One is we talk about clusters. We have to be very clear. It would be very advisable to be clear on what we call clusters. Because clusters is a generic term which is thrown around. And if we are looking at maritime clusters only for manufacturing, or are we looking at maritime clusters on the Norway mode, which is basically uh, research, training, education, uh, as well as manufacturing. And incidentally, we have a maritime cluster that, uh, as BG Shipping, we had kick-started and capitalized in Goa, and it's called the Konkan Maritime Cluster. Now, if we could, we need the industry and the Navy and everybody to support them, because without support, they cannot go. It will just go flat. Any cluster needs to be supported. Otherwise, it will just remain a group of uh, industries which will go to broad after a few years. Um, the second one is partnerships and collaboration. I think every single speaker spoke about collaboration. This is the era of collaboration. What is the kind of partnerships we need? And one of the proposals I had made, um, you know, to the vice admiral was, uh, Navy is talking about economies of scale. We're talking about in-house design capabilities. We don't have capabilities just within the Navy. These kind of clusters and capabilities are built on a uh, India basis. It has to be both Navy as well as private sector. So can we start with a tangible, doable partnership between the Navy and uh, the IMU campus at Vishakhapatnam, which offers courses in naval architecture and ocean technology. This was the design center previously. Maybe we can even revive the design center um, by certain collaborations. Now, yes, we have in-house design capabilities, but I must share, um, you know, one uh, example of some one feedback that I got from a private company. They said they hired the best um, naval architect. Uh, the person was extremely good, asked to do a piece of work. The work was done perfectly well, superb. But 
that company needed to modify the design a little bit. And when the professional was asked to modify it, it was a disaster because they had the professional forgot to you know ensure that the entrance to the door they had to shift the door this way, and there is nobody you you have to actually crawl through the door. So the 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 outcome of this is we have um, named a graduates, we have postgraduates who are very good. It's very classroom oriented and it is very exam oriented. By this participation and interaction, perhaps they can be opened up to more application of mind and what does the industry want, that they understand what the industry wants. Incidentally, we also have an incubation center which is started in the INO campus of Chennai. So that could be one thing where we slowly start developing FNP and R. &D. A third one that I thought is the shipbuilding financial assistance. Now we are talking about vendors. When we talk about MSME, we are talking only about vendors. That's one part of it. But there are MSMEs who have shipyards. I mean, in fact, I visited a shipyard in Goa, which is in four acres, and you have to aluminum ships for the shapes of the And they are telling that this financial assistance is not beneficial for them for some reason. The, pro the, pro the, the profit margin is very low and the problem is very slow. Perhaps a study group of IMS can actually take this up and see, like, because it will be a third party assessment, it won't be internal. To see what is making it so adverse that they are not picking up this subject. You know, the money is not sufficient, that's one thing, but the amount that is given by the government of India is not getting picked up by MSMEs. Mm -hmm. And the bigger ones won't need this money, mm -hmm. or they may not need it right now. Mm -hmm. That's number three. And number four, uh, and my last point is, can there be a conclave of Navy and maritime entrepreneurs? Because we thought about vendor development, a robust vendor development, which could be supplier of spare parts, supplier of ordinary um, category C, category C star, but it could also be entrepreneurs in different uh, areas. Uh, there are maritime uh, professionals who turned entrepreneurs. One of them is actually Captain Ikun Parashan, who's working for the Navy. I mean, in the sense, it's not projects. Uh, I think these are the drone projects for the name. So there are people coming up, but they need hand-holding, they need some confidence building. And perhaps bringing them together on a conclave will be one extension of, you know, uh, an outcome of this, uh, of this seminar or conference. So with these thoughts, thank you for the patience for listening to me and thank you for having given me an opportunity to moderate this and once again I thank everybody for their patience and their speakers especially for the listening. Thank you. Thank you ma'am for the uh, moderator and also to the panelists uh, for their uh, a uh, very uh, interesting and educative presentation. And uh, once again, uh, my sincere apologies for all the technical glitches we faced in uh, getting from the Mishra online. I'm only happy that uh, we finally did manage to get him just by the software that we have to uh, uh, As I say, the best laid plans of uh, my set was not going to arrive. But uh, also, my father used to always keep telling me that uh, whenever something goes wrong, talk it down to XPM and make sure that it doesn't again happen to you. So I think uh, that is a lesson for IMF to uh, keep in mind for next time. Uh, before we uh, adjourn for tea, I request the President IMF to, to present the mementos uh, to the moderator as well as the speaker. Next Vinit, uh, I request my co-author to join Prashant. Come on, Vinit, 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 Vinit,
And we will be calling the memento for Professor Mishra. So with that, we will adjourn for our team. And uh, we'll have a very short tea break of 15 minutes. We are going to be watching the SMLs at 160. <laughs> So you can change. Sir, I'll just tell you. How about you? How about the sides here? Okay, my, my flight is at 7. I can buy it after mine. I think I have a good shot. By 30, I think. Uh, sorry, only three things. No, in this line and this side, only animation if it is there. So, uh, so. Check, check, check. 
check, check, check. ऑनलाइन
It's moving, Nathan. See, it's moving. See, the moment you point to the screen, it works. Yes. What they were trying to do was somebody was saying, move the slide on the seat, nothing required. Correct. See, the one who is obviously comfortable by removing the this is backward, this is forward. So, it's okay. And this is laser. This is what you want. This is why this was projected just to fix this. First slide. That's what he wanted to do with slide three straight away. Of course, this is not the first one. Yes, sir. All presentations. Yes, sir. Yeah, I loaded mine all. Yes, sir. To sum up, I'll use only three slides. Ah, sir, your slides, sir. John. Yeah, that's all. Focus. Please take your seats there. So when my turn comes, you know what? My name is. Yes, I'm up. I know. We will now start our third session, which is on the topic way ahead to enhance capability, capacity, and competitiveness of Indian engineers. The moderator for this session is the T J D Patel, board time director, defence and smart technologies. And a member of the LNT board, LNT Defence. May I invite him to the moderator table, please? Sri J D Patel is an alumnus of IIT Mumbai, studied mechanical engineering in 1978. 
He has a more than four decade long career in LNT and has been instrumental in growing the nascent technology and product development group of LNT's corporate research and development with a focus on top end interdisciplinary product development. <laughs> Since uh, I have been told to cut it down, I'll just say that uh, I would go on and on and on and on about him. But uh, all uh, the accomplishments are there in the biodata. Uh, so uh, I'll just request the other speakers to also come up yeah. onto the table. That is uh, Commander Nathan of LNT also. Sri Jatesh Chandra of CSL. And Sri Piju George of MPL. <laughs> that I'll hand over the mic to Sri Party. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, I said uh, we were at the end of the day, and as usual, uh, the builders come the last. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever be the delay the placement of a contract, we must deliver on time. So that's essentially where, uh, without uh, spending any more time at the beginning, I take a couple of minutes to sum up. But uh, I must say, very, uh, uh, I would say, uh, good uh, people on the panel. Uh, I know at least these two. Uh, yeah. you, I know for quite some time. Of course, Kamal Nathan was with me for nearly about uh, 22 years now. Uh, people who are established uh, in the industry, there are a lot in their careers. Uh, read a little more about the uh, 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 my book genuinely spent for a long year outside the country. So it would be something very interesting to hear his views in terms of what he's actually accomplished and outside, trying to bring a lot of those ideas uh, right into the potential here. Yeah. So with that, uh, the first speaker for the session is Kamada Nathan. Good evening, everybody. Uh, as you are nearing the end of the day, I'll make it light with more pictures and less words. Uh, we'll be covering uh, two major aspects of modern shipbuilding, model and construction. Uh, if you look at it uh, simplistically from a business point of view, we are worried about three aspects. Cost should be within the cost. There should be good quality and delivery within that time. There are two major aspects which enable us in our experience, one is modular construction and digital techniques. If you look at the modular construction, what happens in this is, as against the normal construction where you make the whole hull as a single piece and then start uh, putting all the equipment, system runs, integrate everything. Here what we do is, the ship is divided into modules, as you can see here, at the bottom, and these are the modules, various modules, and you start outfitting these modules as they stand up. So the access is very high, and you can do simultaneous construction of all the modules at the same time. So once you have done maximum pre outfitting and start assembling the mega blocks together, and then finally you do the ship assembly. So this is the in simple the modular construction. It starts right from the design stage. When you are designing itself, you should be careful that you know you are going to do a modular construction. So accordingly, ensure that there are not much of a cross runs across the blocks and see that everything is as much as possible self-contained. So that when you have integrated, your work reduces. Uh, the size of the blocks is usually decided by the shop size and the grade is available. Go for the maximum possible. We usually do up to 400 tons at least as single models. Uh, we must maximize pre outfitting at the module level. That is the only reason for completion of modular construction well within that time. So, very good access is there and uh, quality of outfitting can be done. That we should make full use of it. And obviously, minimize the outfitting post launch. So just do the least possible. So, modular construction enables ease of access. For outfitting, simultaneous work on all the fronts and improves the quality and cuts down 
uh, significantly the cycle time for construction. Now let's move to the uh, digital techniques, what we usually employ. Uh, if you see, uh, there has been a tremendous growth in various uh, ID technologies, be it uh, big data, analytics, internet of things, cloud computing, cyber security, uh, robots, digital twin, uh, additive manufacturing, and so on. As a whole, a number of uh, techniques and tools have been developed, which have been applied for industry for enhancing productivity. <laughs> and when applied to shipbuilding, it's called shipbuilding. In shipbuilding form, what we do is you run a single digital code and try to integrate all functions related to the shipbuilding. Right from design, production, planning, supply chain, quality, FNA, HR, be it any department, that all are integrated and integrated together. So that, that is a, there has to be a digital strategy which is applicable to the organization for doing this and also ensure that while you are integrating vertically all the functions, you also horizontally inter integrate the customers and the vendors. Uh, I'll just give one example of this uh, digitization and digitalization, what uh, uh, Professor Krishna also was talking about. Just let's take the case of vendors. So when the wedding is taking place, capture all the data, be it vendor, its qualification, its rate of building, number of defects, well consumables, environment, so on and so forth. And then get into analysis. You should look at what is the vendor efficiency, welding defect analysis across the projects. Is the same type of happening, emerging failure patterns, what it is, institute remedial measures, and take learnings to other projects, and a number of other analysis can be done. So the, the basic mantra is digitize, digitalize, keep on capturing data as much as possible. Uh, as we said earlier. There, is, there should be a single data code, digital code. In our case, we have taken ERP as a digital code. And uh, uh, the design, uh, we have been doing digital design, digital twin, all these things for the past 22 years. And then he's quite uh, experienced in this. So the digital design is carried out, 3D modeling, production drawings are generated from the 3D modeling. Bomb specs, uh, statement of technical requirements, everything is generated from that. And then that is passed on through, in our case, through PDM or PLM as applicable to the ERP. This single digital code gets connected to all the functions, supply chain, project management, production, quality, and EHS. And then in turn, the same data gets used in their respective functions. So you see how the whole thing is integrated right from design up to delivery. That, that is the advantage of uh, shipbuilding for techniques. Uh, just a few examples I'll keep giving. Usually what happens is the early start doesn't work well. You need to ensure that there is a full kitting when you start a job so that you can quickly finish it. So if you see here, when the uh, design issues of production activities, uh, what is required to be done, the activity codes planning also involves gets involved and needs the activity codes. Then when it goes to that, automatically few checks are carried out. Is the drawing available? Is the material available? Is the predecessor activity completed? Then only release work authorization. Then it goes to production and then automatically it goes to quality for carrying out quality. <laughs> so these systems are inbuilt into the process so that every day you don't have to keep on inserting or manually seeing it. Uh, quality assurance when it comes, further drilling it down, what we do is, when you have issued the work authorization, the related quality control protocols are also automatically released. There is no need for separate things. So that also gets released. Uh, the relevant instructions to them get released. And then when they offer for this uh, production offers for quality, the quality comments, both internally as well as from the third party, it could be class, everything gets integrated. And then the reverse management is carried out, further studied, analyzed, and then you carry on, you know, what is severe, uh, most severe or less severe, what kind of remarks and what kind of remedy actions should be taken. So all we are saying is end to end, start digitalizing and integrating. Uh, the, once you have collected uh, the, uh, for example, the hull uh, defects, then start analyzing it in various formats. It could be causewise design defects, you know, is it a lack of vision, is it a uh, slag inclusion, what is it, or any other cause. 
year wise defects project wise defect is it happening in a particular project is it happening in a particular scenario is it a specific type of a defect you can analyze in a number of manner i am only giving examples here uh, the progress monitoring is very very important just take one example let's say take the case of piping you start uh, compiling the data on how many spools you completed correction how many spools you completed flushing how many you have pressure tested how many smart board pressures pressure tested all this corrected and then with the weighted uh, number you try to examine how much is the piping progress made similarly for all aspects of production be it cabling installation of equipment maintain or any other thing so you get all the aspects numbered and then you collect together what is the progress made and then you make composite production progress when this composite production progress is made uh, it's easy for the management to make out where we are lacking are we requiring uh, contingency measures to be instituted or what else can be done into this and there is a very good warning to them that yes i need to take action like this that's it say right from the fourth floor uh, it has gone to the top management in a simplified format how much he is ahead or back or what is the problem uh, supply chain management is a very important function and number of them can be automated once you have digitalized uh, it will be the purchase request uh, material request there is all the update management information inventory status uh, tracking uh, warm comparison uh, stock location tracking and so on so many functions all these are automated and you get a number of fas reports on each and every aspect of this uh, we also have a elastic search engine what it means is it need not be in a database form where the data resides and you can search for a particular item which was used in a particular project or across project it could be any of the unstructured data also like it could be an email it could be images pdf shared folders word or anything so it's an elastic engine irrespective of what form it is whether it is structured data like a database or unstructured data you still get all the details of each and every component you used in the ship building in a particular project across projects across territory uh one more important aspect of uh, the digital uh, uh, you know management is that you must have a sufficient project management system which is uh, very very tightly integrated uh, generally uh, what we see in the human behavior is there will be a tendency to build buffer whenever you ask a person how many days it take Uh, statistics may prove it is one day, but it will still be three days. You would like to keep some buffer with him, and then obviously the work expands to fill the time available. It will be three days. And what will also happen is a student syndrome, where despite the three days, the work will get done in the last day. So this is, these are natural uh, behavior of the human beings. Similarly, people will start early, saying that I am starting the job. There will not be the requisite equipment or the drawings or the items, anything. So that kind of a thing is a false start. Similarly, the myth of multitask. So understanding all this, to start very good project management program and tightly integrated with your system code. Uh, safety is extremely important. Extremely important. Uh, shipping is inherently unsafe for a simple reason: you work in heights, you work with very heavy weights. Uh, so we conduct a lot of things like safety drills, behavioral safety, you know, shop floor briefings, and so on and so forth. But more important is collect all the data and analyze it in all forms. Is it happening at a particular time of the day? Is it like you know? 3 to 6 pm more accidents are taking place or 9 to 12 am more accidents are taking place or which particular trade is facing accidents not uh, and that kind of an analysis or month wise is any particular month it could be a very very hot month or a very cold month is it causing uh, kind of a thing body part wise is it that i you know i accidents are more or hand accidents typically that sort is really more in shipyards and uh, similarly category wise near mean sir fire or anything so analyze all this so, so that you can take remedial actions and improve the safety standards which is very very important the moment we get into global competitions uh, finally we need to care for the environment uh, that's uh, another important thing when we talk about a uh, global ship building uh, competitiveness usage of uh, sustainable energy uh, occupancy sensors recycling water rainwater harvesting increasing the green belt 
and all this, how it gets digitally connected, everything here can be digitally monitored and you can keep on increasing your target. Yes, I'm going to have at least 90% of sustainable energy, next time 95%, like that you can keep setting records, I mean targets and the people start working on this. So overall, if you see, uh, shipbuilding port or a digital techniques, if you see, there's no limit to digitalization. Uh, it's only limited by the mindset or, you know, our power of thinking. So priority should be given for digital tools to address the pain areas. Thereafter, we need to look at other areas so that you know, over the years, you develop a total digital solution for this. And relatively, it is inexpensive to implement, but it needs a commitment from top management. That drive from the top management is very essential. So, gentlemen, with these two powerful approaches, that's a modular construction which provides fast and ease of construction and digital tools which enable effective monitoring and automated checks. Both of them together, they will make the yards highly competitive, ensuring that the projects are delivered on time, within the cost and with very good quality. Thank you very much. I, I will only add that uh, this is a surprise because we got some very, very serious uh, global competition and I'll talk about it in the Samina. We realized uh, our safety records are seven times better to US yards. Uh, it is three times superior to British yards. Uh, there's not a single accident. We are a golden sport winner uh, of British technology. We say that uh, we just decided in 1992, and I think precise, we'll shift to digitalization. Uh, there's absolutely no shortcut. You, the moment you have transparency of data, the data bites you, and you have to take action because you want to look yourself in a mirror in a better way. So that's only a trick, which essentially makes you completely competitive and different. And that's essentially where, after delivering 71 vessels to the men in white, they still deliver ahead of that. Uh, I think uh, I'll come to visual a little later because uh, uh, the face is uh, supposed to be feeling on a leaf light. So I need to release him in the next 15 minutes. And of course, we'll have question answers for his part. And then uh, he can go for his flight. His flight is at 7. <coughs> My second moderator and distributors the speakers and the audience. Warm good evening to all of them. I think uh, uh, we have been hearing the same issues. I think uh, some of the slides uh, may be repetitive, so I will not be going into detail on that because all of us know the issues were the same policies and all the discussed in detail. Mm -hmm. So uh, only thing different will be, uh, we had uh, <coughs> been discussing more about uh, mm -hmm. different ships and the uh, Spurgeon shipyard was a commercial, commercial shipyard. Mm -hmm. We came into uh, uh, naval ships because of the aircraft carrier, uh, because of our power infrastructure we had that they bought the aircraft carrier. And like that, and they were in uh, So, I will be talking more about uh, the commercial shipbuilding issues. And uh, the topic today is India's uh, hub for niche commercial shipbuilding. The topic is very relevant at this time because uh, we, we are, as we speak, there are a lot of changes, and the trends, the shipbuilding trends are also changed because of the in the search of alternate fuels and technologies. Yeah, so that's the brief I'll be, but uh, I think most of this uh, I'll be skipping. Uh, so the idea is uh, uh, look at the shipping scenario and what are the changes happening and whether we are able to catch up with those technologies and can we score in this, this space. Just a glance on. Uh, CSL, CSL, uh, I hope you know that we are celebrating 50 years uh, now, uh, this year. That's the uh, CBJ celebrating 75 years. We have got uh, 
total of around uh, yeah, 8,000 food falls and uh, uh, permanent employees around 1,076. And we have got uh, four uh, divisions, basically uh, shipbuilding, ship repair, CISA is a new division which is uh, created that is uh, switching shipyard strategic and advanced solutions and then this is for a training institute, an engineer's training institute. Uh, and the past few years, uh, last uh, three years or so, we have uh, expanded to other areas also, east and west. We have got now total seven uh, uh, setups. Uh, mainly in the east, we have uh, taken up uh, HCSL, which is for the inland vessels. And uh, this one in Udupi, UCSL in Malpe, that is the old Tebma shipyard uh, that is mainly concentrating on trucks and small vessels less than uh, 19 meters. So the other ship repair units in uh, Cochin as well as, uh, and also in uh, ship, uh, Cochin, we have got now a tide off coming up about uh, 310 meters. So that also will enhance the ship repair <laughs> Yeah, there was uh, some uh, uh, in the first session. There was questions around about exporting ships to outside India. So I I thought I will answer that in my session. So I touch on that also. We have exported around 50, 50 ships uh, to uh, Europe, USA, mainly Norway and uh, Denmark. So bulk carriers also were exported to for Clipper Group. So these are some of the uh, Commercial ships uh, we have delivered. Uh, supply vessels also we have delivered to Norway. And uh, yeah, IAC, we all know the uh, September 2nd was the commissioning for that. And uh, uh, delivering ships to uh, exporting orders, one of the main things which we need to look at is the quality. They were looking at the uh, the accommodation quality, the people, the standard of living, all those are different from what we normally see here. So we had tie up with uh, the Norwegian uh, and European uh, uh, vendors for, for accommodation. We had uh, Maritime one year. They have already accepted the Kochi So we are doing the accommodation modules to them and uh, for electricity. Trickle packages, and we had a uh, uh, ward electron, ward electron. Not, they also had a setup in Kochi. So, these kind of uh, collaborations has helped us to deliver quality ships, which is very important for uh, the European market. So, uh, just to see the global shipbuilding in this uh, scenario, it, it is, you know, cyclical. So, it is uh, after the COVID, we see there is a uh, even though it was uh, it is in a contraction phase, but we see that it's going up. So we hope so it will go up. Whether we are able to tap that, that's what we need to see. To see. And uh, China, Korea, and Japan, uh, they were uh, they have gone from five to six percentage to in uh, late two thousand to uh, twenty five to thirty percentage. They have captured the building market, so that is still going to be a week or as we have seen only maybe around less than two percentage still in the overall market. So that uh, we have seen, uh, we know we discussed that in detail in the morning sessions also mainly because of they have uh, um, policies which have covered them to go to that level. I'm not going into the detail of that. And the Indian shipbuilding industry, we have uh, 35 shipyards. So we have a strong, uh, out of that, some of some are not operational now, but uh, still we have a strong uh, uh, shipbuilding experience, which we can tap for the upcoming um, rising trend in the commercial shipbuilding. shipbuilding. Uh, one of the uh, things which we uh, that also slightly touched upon in the morning session was uh, even though we have uh, mm, uh, uh, 
incentivization and everything there in days. But the problem we have is our uh, productivity, the manoeuvres per CGT is small. So the productivity is less, even though the labor rate is very low compared to China and Korea, uh, compared to Korea and Japan. So ultimately, we have, uh, we have, uh, we are back around uh, 20 percentage. That gap is still there with China, Korea, and Japan. So that is what we are looking at with the gap funding, maybe a maybe the from the government. So that is one of the issue we are facing. So here we can see the uh, productivity they increase with automation and other uh, improvement in uh, digital technologies. So that is yet to happen here in India. Yeah, we had uh, 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 around uh, 300,000 in the uh, GTs in 2000, but that has gone down to 30,000 30, GT only uh, in the uh, 2020s. But in uh, uh, Korea and uh, China, they have gone up very much 30 to 35 percentage of the global market. Sorry, okay. okay. I think basically these were these policy measures were discussed. Uh, uh, we know Maritime uh, Vision 2030, and the uh, Yojana and Atmanjabar Bharat, all these things I just want to touch upon, but I think all these are all of you are aware and we had discussed this. So all these are policies are in place to promote our shipbuilding industry in India. Yeah. So, and uh, uh, there was a some policy which has uh, come up recently for uh, chartering trucks in Indian ports should be Indian built. So that is also come up. So these are all uh, policies which help us to improve the shipbuilding uh, uh, market in India. So what I was trying to touch on was mainly because of the emerging trends, the niche shipbuilding the, whether we can tap on that. that. That is one of the things I wanted to cover. So the, mainly the technologies, the what we were, uh, the diesel engines which, which we were using is on challenge because of the IMO greenhouse gas emission requirements. The target is to reduce the greenhouse gas emissions to 50% of 2008 by 2015. So it's a big challenge. In order to reach that target, Still, nobody knows what is the single solution, what is, what is the fuel which we need to go for. Everybody is looking at number of fuels, solar, hydrogen, LPG, LNG, ammonia, methanol, wind, wind itself, there are so many. So all these mix is being tried, a lot of research is happening, a lot of pilot projects are happening. So the maturity of some of these are good, but many of this is still in trial phase. For solar, it's it's only feasible for smaller ferries and inland ferries. Man was uh, telling today morning as yes, uh, he was uh, in Kochi, we have got a solar ferry operating, but uh, it's, 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 so, it's so for some cases this will be good, but some other cases like uh, long endurance vessels we cannot go for a solar or even for battery pretty difficult. So what? In the future, it could be a mix of all these things. So the technologies of all these need to be addressed, and there is going to be a big challenge in technologies and whether we will be able to, uh, because in Europe and Norway, especially in Norway, these technologies are uh, uh, being tried. Uh, LNG we have not tried, but in Europe, they have changed from LNG to already they have gone to the other. They have they started removing LNG. So some of the technologies we have not seen. So, but at least whether we will be able to catch up and utilize this in our shipyards here. That's what I would like to cover. So as I said, uh, the still the import forecast is going up. So this exponential growth plus the change in technology. There is, there is definitely the commercial shipbuilding. There is going to be a lot of special ships coming up. There is a lot of market in this in Europe. 
that is definitely there. So how do we get that? So that question was asked in the morning. So what we need to see there is, uh, I'll come to that maybe towards the end. Yeah, some of the technologies I'll just touch upon the solar uh, uh, solar boards. Uh, this, as I said, uh, only for short duration ferries. This is now found feasible, even though the efficiency of solar cells has gone up, but still not viable for long duration batteries. Other technologies like uh, wind sales technology is coming up, but that also will not answer our question for long duration. This will cover only very few auxiliary power. <laughs> there is wind guide technologies, which will also only cover only very, uh, maybe a very partial amount of for the auxiliary load. Wind rotor technologies, based on the uh, rotary effect, there could be some energy which can assist the uh, uh, propulsion as well as during the auxiliary power. So all these are being tried, but none of this. So this, what I mean to say is the technologies are being tried. There are a lot of technologies coming up, and trials are going. Trials are happening, but none of this is proven to be the single solution for the coming future technologies. Battery. Uh, one of the audience was asking about batteries. Can we go for batteries? Why don't we try batteries? Batteries, of course, there are a lot of technologies available. Uh, NMC batteries, LFP batteries, NCA batteries, LTO batteries, all has got different different uh, applications. For example, LTO is used for very fast charging uh, uh, case. If you need a very fast, char fast charging requirement, you need to go for an LTO, but the cost is high. And safety case is also very good. But the problem is, again, this is you cannot carry that much of amount of battery on board the vessel. Uh, uh, for uh, suppose you have a bulk carrier or a cargo carrier, which but we cannot provide that much of to cross the ocean. Uh, that much of battery cannot be on board the vessel. For example, we have uh, we have delivered uh, recently few uh, vessels to uh, Fuji Metro. Those are battery powered. The endurance for that is only one hour. One hour, you have to have 120 kilowatt hour battery on board. So it's 15 minutes charging afterwards, then it will go for another one hour. So these are all for specific cases, batteries may be applicable and it is good, but it's not a single solution. Next one, uh, the world is looking at is definitely hydrogen fuel cells. This is, uh, this could be one of the future uh, technology. Uh, maybe for even for uh, long duration, long endurance vessels also. With hydrogen, you can, uh, uh, with the uh, proton exchange membrane or, or with solid exchange, solid oxide technologies, you can have uh, uh, fuel cells and green uh, power generator on board the ship. Ammonia. Ammonia is, ammonia is also one of the potential fuel, but I see personally maybe this could be the future fuel because uh, ammonia fuel is uh, ammonia is uh, the systems are known to everyone and it is being handled in ports and uh, that has got NH three has got uh, three hydrogen uh, molecules so that with that in the liquid state, you will be able to carry in a much better way. So that ammonia could be a very potential future fuel uh, for the alternate fuels. But uh, the problem is we don't have an ammonia engine developed until now. That is, trials is also going on uh, in Europe. Watzla and Man is uh, trying out their engines uh, with ammonia. That could be, uh, we are looking at maybe by 2025, sometime only, we will have these engines, these engines coming into production. So, based on, uh, okay, so some of the projects which we have done, as I explained, this is the Kochi Metro project. So, this is a, this was a high end vessel which uh, we should look at it. 
uh, with the technology of battery and the hybrid technology. Uh, the vision from Kochi Metro was to have uh, the backwaters uh, connectivity through uh, uh, boats powered by green uh, power. So that was the vision. And with that, 23 boats were ordered to CSM. Uh, and we have delivered five of that. So that is with the LTO batteries. And the, this has got BG also on board. In case they need to boost up the power from 8 knots to 10 knots, they can use the battery. They can use the DG. So that DG is... Uh, 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 it can be used either to boost up or in case of uh, redundancy also. And the batteries are char charged from solar grid. And the interior is uh, similar to exactly similar to the Kochi Metro or the controls what you see. Uh, and uh, of course, reduction in CO2 uh, with these boats are uh, significant. And it is considered to be the largest fleet of electric ferries, uh, that is 23 plus they are coming up with another 30 ferries and total maybe around 78 electric ferries will be there. And this one, uh, uh, I'm not sure whether you are aware of, there is an autonomous vessel which was uh, uh, constructed and delivered to Norway recently. Today as we speak, the christening ceremony of this one is going happening in Norway. But uh, uh, as you all know, the, the, the autonomy part is the core part which the Norwegians or now they won't give it to us that is still with them. So these are the part which we need to look at it whether we will be able to excel in that. So we have done the battery and the fit for, um, uh, and uh, ready for autonomy and the vessel was taken from here to Norway in a uh, heavy lift carrier. So based on these two projects, battery driven and auto autonomous vessels, uh, CSL has initiated two pilot projects so that we can uh, uh, have indigenous uh, technology in house develop. Uh, so this is a fuel cell uh, uh, pilot project which we are doing right now, similar to which uh, Kuchi Metro project. This boat we are converting to a fuel cell boat with the hydrogen cylinders on board and fuel cell uh, technology from uh, a company called the Kipping Indian Company, and uh, IRS is a partner in rural development. So, with the IRS and uh, Kipping, we are uh, developing this uh, pilot project. The delivery is uh, sometime scheduled, sometime for over two to three. And another one we are uh, uh, looking at is a pilot project for autonomous vessels, uh, a small pilot, uh, small autonomous project, uh, small autonomous vessel. That is also the autonomy of, uh, technology from Indian uh, company and uh, involving NSTL, ERDO, NSTL, and model testing and uh, 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 mathematical modeling of things to be done at NSTL. So these are the two pilot projects which we are thinking of. Uh, no, we have started this, and this is also in the process of uh, design development. So, uh, so now we have seen uh, the shipbuilding scenario is uh, going up, uh, shipbuilding uh, uh, industry is going up, market is going up, plus there is a lot of technologies going up. So we need to, what all things we need to focus. So uh, this was discussed in the morning, uh, equipment, we lack in equipment suppliers, uh, cost, competitiveness, and R&D projects, R&D uh, facilities, basic <coughs> design and R&D facilities. And executing pilot projects. This is one of the important things for all these technologies. Generally, we will be in the forefront of such uh, technologies and improving operation excellence, like uh, uh, my previous uh, speaker, uh, the Commander uh, Nathan said, uh, Industry 4.4 and Digital uh, 4.1 and uh, uh, operation excellence through uh, 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 the digitization. So, those are the things which we need to look at. And of course, uh, financing for the capex. Thank you. And uh, I, uh, I, I would like to just to touch upon uh, that answer uh, question uh, which was asked in the morning: why there was not uh, exports? So, as I said, uh, uh, CSL being a commercial yard, we got that opportunity. We yeah. had uh, uh, compared to uh, naval shipbuilding, the uh, the commercial shipbuilding is. It's different because uh, naval shipbuilding it is uh, mostly concurrent design, so we have to uh, 
keep up with the, the technology. So there will be uh, design currently going on along with the uh, construction time. But in case of commercialization, most of the uh, orders go for standard, proven, and uh, well-established designs. And in in uh, we were fortunate to get uh, good projects in early 2000s because of um, the uh, peak uh, during the offshore period. Offshore uh, uh, period. That time we got PSPs uh, constructed in uh, uh, about 35 PSPs constructed in the And most of this, the problem what we'll be facing is the procurement uh, uh, issues we face here. We don't have this. OEMs and uh, 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 ancillary industries to support this. So in order to do this kind of business, we should have ancillary industries and OEMs here. So these kind of projects come with the uh, with the equipment packages. So that is one of the things. Okay. I have a wide question. Sure. Sure. Uh, uh, we think you can have the convenience to be moving out if there is something specific. Thank you. Thank you for reminding me. Sir. Yes. So that is uh, uh, and uh, I would like to thank uh, IMO for uh, inviting us for this seminar session. Uh, I'm open for questions now. So I, I would uh, take permission to leave for, uh, the session after this because I have to catch a flight at 7 o'clock. Okay. I said, yes. Yeah. No questions. So uh, I, I must thank Vijay uh, Chandra for uh, bringing out very lucidly in terms of some of the new concepts on powering. And that's essentially where we believe uh, uh, the commercial shipping industry truly can make a lot of difference. So of course, many of these solutions cannot be as relevant uh, to the naval shipping, but that's essentially going to be extremely important uh, looking at what we are going to be talking about by 2015. In terms of uh, the leading the now uh, on that note, uh, let me say uh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you once again. Thank you, sir. Uh, we also touched upon one very important point, and I want to highlight it uh, before he leaves. Um, very little today has been spoken on the unmanned aspect of uh, the navy. That's something which all of us believe, and today the. Huge amount of work happening on the unmanned, and since there is no specifically focused agenda on it, I can tell you, Lassen Tukra today has at least a dozen products ready on unmanned surface vessel, underwater, and varieties of those. So, we may we not really touched upon that aspect, but that's an aspect which becomes extremely important going forward because it essentially makes your ship now much larger beyond your normal range and your harm's way. So you're going to be seeing how much much away from you, keeping it much more away from you. And those are technologies which essentially are going to mean a lot of difference in terms of what he uh, touched upon very rightly. But I must highlight that before he moves on. Thank you. Thank you, Jagdish. Thank you, sir. Uh, since, uh, Mr. Jitesh is on the question to accept firstly the comment of the on behalf of CSL as a sponsor and also a moment as a speaker. Eric is the president of IMF too. Thank you. I would like to convey an uh, apology from uh, Dr. Hari Krishnan. Actually, he was supposed to attend this seminar, uh, but he was tested for Satip, uh, so I am to thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, my pleasure to introduce uh, uh, Biju George. Uh, of course, I don't think you really need an introduction in this forum, but uh, notwithstanding, uh, a man who's uh, truly Risen from the college ranks, 
all of us at Lazar Group who actually cherish people of this time, join as trainees and virtually grow uh, to the board. So that's essentially where I see another example that uh, Madhav Dawson, that's precisely what Major George's represent uh, directorship building at MDF. At the very outset, let me thank uh, IMF for uh, giving me this uh, distinguished honor and uh, privilege to be part of this seminar and also take this session. session. I am I am deeply aware that we are running out of time. Two sessions, sessions which are very difficult is one immediately after the lunch and the other one before the vote of thanks. So, so I am going to, to do the, uh, the, the latter. And uh, as a perk, my uh, theme of the talk is integrated transmission experience in MDA in IC. The primary focus is to excuse time, and even in this presentation, I am forced to do the same. And uh, I'll be doing a test service if I don't make one mention about my ex CMD who is seated here, uh, Vice Admiral SKR K. Krishnan, uh, Chairman and Managing Director, uh, who was with uh, MDA. And, uh, and who has mentored a lot of young people in our yeah. shipyard with his uh, sterling and excellent uh, leadership. I was also uh, uh, privileged to be associated with the session chair for many years now, and, and it's my privilege. So I'm cutting all films, even the first slide does dance like this. So straight away into uh, introduction, I'll not uh, spend much time. MDL as on date has uh, delivered around 800 ships since its inception, 240 being exports. 25 being capital warships, including uh, submarines and uh, destroyers and frigates. And uh, the whole purpose of this presentation is to paint in broad strokes MDL's experience in integrated construction uh, in P17 a project. Uh, most of you are aware that we are having two projects, major projects in hand in the surface ship building, one is 315 B, which is tracing the conventional method of construction. And uh, P17A, which is the integrated construction, which is the state of the art approach. And uh, I am privileged to head uh, both. So, just uh, uh, overview, maybe a couple of seconds on the complexity of warship uh, building. There are primarily four components the design, the procurement, the build, or the construction, and then the coordination. What is important here is the uh, it's, it's the spiral. Probably in a merchant ship, it can be a linear straight line. So, that means you have to revisit again and again. It's an iterative process. And that's where the whole catch is. So, uh, I don't have time to explain more elements, but uh, I think it's self-explanatory uh, with the spiral nature of the entire uh, uh, you know, womb to tomb, as we say it. So in traditional construction, this is how it uh, normally goes. You can see this is where we start. Uh, the steel cutting starts here uh, as we focus with the functional design. So basically, if you see these three arrows, it are telescopic in nature. In fact, that is where we lose the time. And uh, in fact, if we want to uh, build ships uh, with a shorter duration, uh, we need to completely change our approach. In Europe, if a French frigate can be built in six years, why in India we are taking 108 months? Why in India it's taking 100 months? So this was the question which Navy as well as the shipyard was pondering some uh, years back. And that's why when we decided to go for uh, uh, integrated construction in P-17A project, so it has to radically transform the entire spectrum of activities in a, in a shipyard from detailed design, uh, build strategies, uh, detailed design and procurement, re-engineering, how the data is managed and construction methodology. Uh, my, uh, the illustrious speaker prior me has uh, covered almost all the uh, aspects of integrated construction. I will not uh, uh, dwell much, but uh, to put the thing in perspective, uh, design, build strategy, construction, and outfitting are the three, uh, four pillars of which is, uh, the building is uh, cresting. And uh, in traditional, it is telescopic, but uh, in the approach uh, of IC, we are going to Sequential has to be made into parallel. And uh, uh, what we used to do as units, we need to do at the block level. And uh, uh, instead of doing system erections at uh, in the float condition, we have to do it at the block level itself. So this is the actual screenshot of our build strategy for P17A project. The ship is divided into 29 blocks, and you can see the 
ship here is you know, placed like this, and blockwise uh, timelines have been uh, predicted. And this is the same build strategy we are following with GRSC, our uh, sister shipyard, where three ships are being built. So this is the actual uh, picture, how we were doing it in the past, now it is today. today. Uh, this is the actual uh, picture uh, of the uh, P-17A block, which is uh, right now on the slipway. So this is, uh, uh, this is the distinct advantage of the construction. In fact, uh, this shows you the time, this shows the cost, and uh, the, the whole uh, magic is to enhance, do it early in the build cycle of the ship so that we can uh, save on time. And, uh, this slide is a uh, very important slide that can speak volume, but I, because of lack of time, I'm just going to the next slide. So uh, the commercial construction is a path where you have uh, extra time uh, and uh, time is taken, whereas the integrated construction is the time to, you can put the project to the left. So that's the whole advantage. So when we decided to go ahead, uh, there were two options, do it on our own and uh, or take help. And we decided we need help. And Navy also was keen that we need to go outside for help. And that's why, uh, that's how we finally ended up in appointing uh, Pink and Italy as the know-how partner for uh, technology upgradation. So with uh, uh, with Fincandry, what we did is we tried to work on all these uh, aspects. Uh, the first thing was we did was a gap analysis to see what are the gaps between uh, conventional construction and the integrated construction. Accordingly, some infrastructure had to be upgraded, like uh, painting wood, etc. I gave one example. Then manpower was trained. Then detailed design had to be tweaked for IC. Then uh, the IC is riding on a backbone known as the extended work breakdown structure. If I had time, I would have well uh, dwelt more on that, but I am skipping that. And finally, the construction. And the data management and stealth management and weight management also came out as the fringe benefit of this exercise uh, with our uh, experience with the uh, pink and blue. So, uh, one line, the gap, what came out was the palletization. So, we never used the pallet, pallets for this thing, which LND has called as kitting. The same thing. So, kitting is a very key uh, uh, concept and infrastructure. Uh, one of the major things which you have to do is to introduce the paint booth in the shop itself. Then uh, domain experts provided training work for both the Indian Navy and the shipyards. And we also uh, uh, mastered the art of detailed design for IC in the process. So as I said, uh, ESWPS uh, based planning because we have typically three components in ESWPS. The product data, uh, the activity and the uh, uh, workshop or the uh, work center engine is carried out. These three things actually completely defines both the product as well as the activities. So the approach is basically to maximize uh, outcome. Uh, and uh, these are uh, actual pictures of this uh, block. And what is important is, uh, I think this is the core uh, thing here. Uh, we need two things. Uh, if integrated uh, construction has to be a success story. One is we need to have a fairly good level of design maturity that puts pressure on the Navy. Secondly, we need uh, to, to have a, a good maturity of inventory that puts pressure on the shipyard. That means only if the Navy and the shipyard works in tandem, integrated construction can be a reality. So let me tell you very frankly, we missed integrated construction in the first ship. Why? Primarily, I'm not blaming here anymore because Navy continued with the uh, telescopic design. We also continued with our uh, traditional procurement process. But from second, third, fourth, fourth, in fact, is becoming full blown IC. So, second and third, we are calling it as LIC, nothing to do with life insurance cooperation, low IC. So, that is how we went uh, ahead. So, stealth management, uh, because of uh, management of the stealth signature and the detailed design and the installation, the nuances associated with uh, the block level itself or the unit level has to be taken. Care. And uh, weight management is a big issue because we need to control the weight the weight and 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 the the components of industry 4.0 as uh, Commander Nathan has uh, brought out in this presentation as well, we have implemented in our shipyard. And uh, another important challenge is how to get into a secure data exchange where the data has to be traded off between 
uh, MDL, DRC, DMD, and Italy. And we had to put a uh, uh, the cyber security was a challenge. Uh, we had to put a completely safe uh, data exchange in place. So these are the various aspects which uh, we have to focus and we have fine tuned, uh, design for IC. The procurement maturity, uh, uh, it is almost one year since I've taken as director of shipbuilding. One of the first things which I've done is to downsize the thickness of the purchase. Uh, with that, we try to um, uh, accelerate the procurement process. With, of course, it complies with all the rules which are around us. And uh, the vendor based development, because uh, morning we had a very interesting session on the cost side. Of the demon lies in the details. A nut or a flange or something, a bulkhead fitting can in, in fact uh, completely hold the hold in the hostage, the complete uh, uh, construction process. Then the role of warship design bureau, quick decision making is uh, is a is a must because uh, the uh, professional director is, is under a different flag officer, and uh, the D and D or the warship design bureau is another under another officer. So all these issues are there. So near the fast track uh, decision making in the whole thing. So we being at the delivery end uh, normally takes the uh, front of it, but uh, all the stakeholders need to work in uh, unison for uh, realizing this common dream. And uh, now let me tell you, if you get uh, one more order of piece of the, uh, the, uh, the let us say the eight ships, we can do it full integrated construction with timelines, cost lines, and the quality matching or uh, above par with the global standards. So the future is uh, IC can give rich students in terms of reduced bill period. Of course, that is the primary intent and purpose of doing this. MDL is capable of meeting the timelines, and uh, radical paradigm shift is uh, required in both the mindset and action of all the stakeholders. Uh, design cannot proceed in the traditional manner. Our uh, procurement process cannot uh, move in that in that manner. Vendors cannot behave in the traditional manner. If all these three important stakeholders radically change their approach and mindset, even in our country, what is happening in the developed world can become a, a real thing. And uh, I end my talk with a quote from Robin Sharma, the famed book, The Monk Who Sold His Ferrari. Happiness comes through good judgment. Good judgment comes through experience. Experience comes through bad judgment. And we have done uh, you know, both that bad judgments and good judgments. We had good experience and bad experience. And ultimately, I think we all will have happiness. Thank you very much. Uh, also coming from the time for a discussion. So now, now we have really some good and good 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 discussion. So uh, may I invite questions? Yes, no. Yes, no. yes please. My question is to the building uh, MDL. Sir, uh, so, the mission first one, I'd like to compliment the quality presentation and the first which have been working very, very interesting. Uh, I would like to know sir, what is the mission of the mission and bit period? Also, so, what is the cost of going in for such a kind of construction? So, I think it is the first time Minus the cost which you have spent for the local provider, that aside, we have to say it's a one time capital investment for the capability building. So that has to be, uh, so that will be, will have to be factored, that should be factored in costing. But uh, keep that aside, I don't think there is any other cost implication. It's only it's tweaking our. Uh, Procedures, keeping our processes, procedures and processes, and making it more uh, efficient. efficient. That, so uh, that time periods can be reduced. And moment we uh, every day is possible. If the ship is getting delayed uh, by one day. Uh, see, I'll, I'll tell you the current example. Our ship is uh, the ship which is at advanced stage of delivery is having around six hundred people on board. Let us say it is delivered today. That six hundred people can be redeployed elsewhere. Why the 600 people are required is mainly to basically the medium system to be between the shape. May not be 600, may not be required. We can likely cut down, but uh, and the uh, expense associated with that. 
So because of the too many systems and the preservations and the routines which have all that, uh, so that's the so that way it is costly. The earlier we deliver it is the minimum situation. So how to how to reduce the construction period and the, the, this has to happen at the initial stage. So it is like missing bus. You know, the, I would put it as the three stage. That is, we call it as S three, S five, and S seven. If you miss S three. We'll have to postpone it to S5. If you miss that, it will go to S7. The moment it goes to S7, the, the attendant benefits is lost. It becomes, uh, it gets approximated to conventional construction. Earlier you can do it. Or earlier to doing it, you need to have a fully, uh, if I can use the word fully pregnant uh, pallet. If the pallet is empty, you cannot outfit it. How the pallet will become uh, full? It's only with design maturity and procurement maturity. Including the court side. So uh, that is how. Uh, 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 so the of the I, I said uh, we, uh, the contract timeline is 60 months for a period. Conventional is much more. These are being. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. So, so 72. I'm talking about the contract, not the actual. Actually, it's a different story. But, uh, so there is a around. Uh, uh, well, yeah, 12 months to one, one to one and a half years in a cricket and a destroyer perspective. Yes. Yes. I can only say that the engineering is finance. Yes, sir. The finance cost. Especially at our interest rates, it means quite a size of the money. Anyone else? So there are no questions. Uh, uh, I'll attempt to sum up. But we had three uh, serious, uh, I would say, uh, uh, presentations in this session. Nathan obviously uh, talked about far more of uh, how to take it to the industry 4.0, called the shipbuilding 4.0. This is a process to which uh, there's some amazing research. Of course, he didn't talk about the research, but what exactly is done in terms of the process. Uh, Sanjay chain of a vessel, uh, horizontally as well as vertically, and both you actually can do and start fitting out at each individual level, depending on the final assembly uh, level cranage. And that's essentially the which truly delivers enormously good benefits in terms of cycle time. Uh, for an opening class, uh, in this shipyard, we had 18 and a half months uh, of build time of the vessel, 2140 tons to be precise. So it's something which is uh, quite different than what otherwise it would take in a sequential kind of a manner. Uh, every pipe and every cable, you can pre-cut with a pole, and the code essentially is all that that needs to create before it is fitted up. So entire entire process is uh, We heard uh, uh, presentations from CSL, and that reminded me since morning we've been talking of the you no know, exports. Uh, it was surprising to hear that the 50 vessels have been exported. In case of present to grow, I can tell you we exported to eight countries till date. So it's not that it is not there. The issue primarily to my mind is uh, the expensive vessels are the, not the ones which we are able to export. So percentage of our total order book to what is exported is small, but the very large number of vessels getting exported, but they're children. Because what truly opened up for competition is only children. If there's small things which are allowed to be exported, I mean, to be built in the country in a competitive form, only that will get exports. And that's essentially where you see an enormous amount of difference of what you have a track record. The buyer doesn't want to come to you for your capabilities. He comes to you for your track record. And with the track record, you actually have delivered, as I said. Uh, in terms of number of vessels, I probably would uh, add to somewhere around 25 vessels we must have exported till date. Nothing less than that. And it's less than 10 years of operation we are talking about. So that's essentially the scenario of what we start seeing. Uh, 
Uh, of course, uh, Biju talked about uh, the same animal mm -hmm. uh, in little different words in terms of rather than calling it the 4.2, calling it the integrated uh, shepherding. In, I, I remember the good old days for what uh, you talked about is what we call the concurrent engineering. engineering. Everything getting concurrent and believe me, when you do any concurrency, there is a spiral. And the spiral is precisely where uh, you keep back and forth a moment. But the fact is when we actually have experienced people doing it, one gains enormously in terms of time. And good challenge to keep. Uh, I, I can tell you out of my own experiences of having done hundreds and hundreds of programs in different time, including the ship building. You can truly target 50% time. You may not achieve it. First, second, third, fourth time you may not achieve it, but you actually can achieve the same in time. That's essentially what you will achieve. So when you actually do good amount of concurrency, good amount of spirals operating. Uh, before uh, we uh, close the uh, session, I thought uh, since a lot of debate in terms of uh, what has been going on, and uh, I'm going to share just three slides uh, towards the end of the day. So what we see in uh, Indian shipbuilding, and, and there's something uh, starting from uh, Admiral Deshpande when he spoke in the morning. What we actually have seen is precisely two decades of uh, having entered, I mean, having truly allowed the private sector into defense production. 2000 to 2010, the first decade, did not see a single RHP. And I'm, I'm so happy. I mean, this point I actually talked about the enormous amount of debate and say, should we open up, should we not open up? And 2005, is the first RFP that came to private sector for participation, but it stayed only at auxiliaries. Now, what you notice is the competitive programs entire decade was 3,500 crore and 76,800 crores of programs remain by choice. The yard to whom it is being given. Now, obviously, you can't expect anything wonderful to happen with that. And this is exactly when you had enormous amount of issues going on in the global market. So why shipbuilding remained the way it remained today? To my mind, we couldn't foresee that if the global shipbuilding scenario is dramatically now, there should have been a little more proactiveness. If not the government, Navy was always constructing. And Navy possibly could have done a difference. When I say Navy, it was not anything. If you look at the second decade, you suddenly see a substantial amount of difference. Now, another matter of detail on the slide is this 3,500 crore is 90 vessels. Now, that's something very interesting. That is what I talked about when I started talking about the children. This is where the children is. So the 90 vessels being delivered for 3,500 crore and 56 vessels being delivered for 77,000 And this is sheer statistics. I'm not adding any mystery myself. Now on the second decade, you see 110,000 crores of nominated orders versus 27,000 crore of. You see sudden change. There's some realization that something needs to be done. There's a 20% which is the competitive. And of course, that is 156. So the ratio remains. Large amount of work has gone in, but that is not something which can be counted in percentage numbers in value. Why we talk of 0.4% of amount of work? I thought, let me pull in. And after he spoke, I actually pulled in because the data is ready. He only had to pull in. Now, this is precisely where the God is in details. The God actually says, yes, we are allowing. Now, your statistician would say, we have allowed 250 vessels to be built in competitive mode. But that doesn't speak the entire truth. All of it is 30,000 crores versus much larger number which has happened in the country. Next. A whole lot of reforms, when we talk of way ahead, there are a whole lot of reforms which have indeed happened. 
the auxiliary vessels uh, actually were opened up somewhere around 2005. Um, this is the era at which we have seen dollar move from 40 to about 60, 60. over a very short period. Mm -hmm. Anybody who had an order, trust me, lost nothing less than 40%, 30 to 40%. So that's the dollar part. And the biggest contributor to that was the BNE. Now, the BNE necessarily, a lot of it came in the form of foreign currency, and that foreign currency necessarily lost. No competitive program ever was getting a foreign exchange rate variation. Now, this is essentially what our history is, and that's where I try to capture over seven, eight points. What are those major milestones wherein we see the market to be truly open today for competitive position? FERA was allowed first in 2011. And that was only if you were bidding for a bi global project. And there are bi global projects in the NHF Yard 1 in global competition. We ourselves won a project which was not 54 vessels supposed to that. So the bi global, if the project was won by a foreigner who was an L2, we would have paid him 100% more because the dollar changed. Because it was won by an Indian company, it was nothing was paid. So I'm talking of each of those reform positions when it actually happened and link it to what we need to be doing going forward. The FERB was completely allowed in 2016 for any and every program. So government realized that what is happening was not right and needs to be corrected. And that's essentially where under any category of acquisition, this is one realization that came in and we are seeing dollar change from 62 70, roughly 70 to 73 and more or less stabilized and then recently obviously attached about 80 but the situation is when we have nearly 40-50% of import content especially in the major vessels the content becomes much much higher these are basic covers which are needed which came as a part of the enormous amount of debate and discussion which has been led uh, with the government of India's uh, involvement including, of course, uh, the Navy as well as uh, the Ministry. And a lot of these reforms today are in place. The BNE cost uh, was thought to be something which vitiates the entire uh, uh, game. And that's where the one more, uh, I would say, reform during the 2018-19 period was to take out the BNE. And what Admiral Deshpande spoke in the morning, no private sector was winning. This is one thing we started making private sector. <laughs> So the efficiency of building what you have paid for your work, that efficiency was able to win projects for private sector. The BNE was the one which was a differentiator. It came out and this is where somebody actually can study program by program, policy reform by policy reform. And I think for a think tank, this is something which is absolutely right place to do that kind of uh, research and some amount of work. Obviously, in 2020, the chapter 3B, as it was known at that point in time, that the nomination will not only be of PSU, it will be allowed to anybody. Any shipyard can be nominated, or you have an equal footing when it comes to nomination, if it is to be considered whether public or private. Level playing field, obviously, there are some amount of gas more because of some of the baggage in terms of the ownership aspect. I'm not bringing a shipyard, but the ownership aspect hangover is still remains in the body. And of course, uh, in this period, we actually see a good amount of PPP happening. happening. Uh, I remember when uh, Dasaboto and DRS were talking about the relationship. One question that Mr. Saxena had for me. He said, sir, after you get your order, will you stop my order? Or you will delay my ship because you have your own work. And I said, I have my work to you. Your ship will go precisely the way it is planned. As long as we have inputs coming, we will have parallel kind of an organization because the shipyard we obviously have can be at any point in time at least 20 vessels. The capacity is far, far larger than what actually we have in terms of work. And that's essentially where I truly believe if we were to go forward, the way ahead is in, in partnerships. 
I don't mean that uh, the partnership can happen <laughs> after getting an order, which is a chasing case of GRAC master. After GRAC means, yes, there is a, a scenario that uh, capacity may be not beginning. We were also having an uh, enormous amount of capacity of growth going up again. And we have not said that, why don't you order it on us? But truly, a PPP must start in terms of a strategic team in before bidding because the efficiency announcement that one can contribute will come into the bid. And that's where the mining reform will actually do a saving, an actual saving of those efficiencies rather than the other way. So I believe truly going forward is going to be in the form of making some of the relationships actually into a strategic types. We heard lot of words today from speakers about JV, about teaming and those kind of things. If we are serious, we need to truly have this in place. We need, we actually have some issues about it because I can tell you in 2012, there was a joint venture. Which, right? which, and, uh, is it, and is obviously here. Uh, but the scenario is after the JV was entered into, the CDO asked, how will you give him any work? He must compete with any vendor. Now, if we have to compete as a JV with any vendor, why do I need a JV? Mm -hmm. The JV is not going to create this infrastructure. So some of these fundamentals are missed out at the time of sometimes when we debate this bigger and bigger picture, bigger and bigger points. And that's essentially where it needs to be put in place. The same CDC policy also says if you have a pre bid tie up, this doesn't affect you. And that's exactly where I come from. We need those relationships in place if we want cost savings, if we want efficiency, if we actually want to work together. And distributed work, only one who benefits is a demand customer because he gets it faster, he gets it cheaper. Uh, I thought uh, I'll take just about two, three minutes to tell you about uh, we currently someone who was selected in UK after 22 global shipyards participated in the global competition. We are at the last phase of decision being made. So don't uh, quote me anywhere, but uh, about one month from now, we'll know whether we have won it or we have lost it. But the scenario is there are three shipyards out of 22 who were picked up. And the experience that we went through in this process, I actually want to take it as a piece as way forward where your reforms can go in terms of truly partnering with a shipyard. Next slide. So the process essentially is starts with an RFI and that's where we had 22 yards participation. Based on what all enormous amount of interactions that happened, we obviously had a stage at which they say we are now shortlisting. They decided to shortlist four out of 22. These four out of 22 were then paid. Mark my word. They were paid for doing the what is called the big design. Now, the pit design you do is a paid design. And the moment it is paid design, the user actually can demand enormous amount of details and he has clarity in terms of what he is thinking. Now, this relates on the next slide when I move forward because 56% of the evaluation weightage is how good your design is, what flexibility it allows. Can you do multiple roles? Have you built in some of those features? Have you actually given me a vessel which is the best of every parameter? Because every ship building or every ship design is a matter of compromise. I mean, all of us as designers know that there's nothing like everything can be best. It's a matter of compromise now. If within the compromise, what is that overall solution? Mm -hmm. Out of 100 marks, which are used for placement of contract, 56 belongs to this design, and that's why it is paid. It's a paid design. Based on that, obviously, enormous amount of discussions continue. During this entire design phase of about 9 to 12 months, every month there is an interaction. So there's no surprise in terms of what this specific is going to have. 
there's no surprise. Now, enormous amount of maturity that gets built in before the contract is awarded. Now, relate to what Vishu talked about in terms of maturity of the design and maturity of actually taking it to a full 3D. But everything is happening on full 3D. Now, this is where you truly put in a full fledged industry 4.0 scenario and it can do wonders. Now, this is precisely what we are seeing in this place. And as a result, huge number of parameters get evaluated at that design, design stage. And then the last stage says, now you can bid. So you actually say a price. If your price is one rupee higher than the reserve price, your bid is rejected. Because there's good amount of maturity which has come in into a learning. So there's a cost which has been estimated given by the user. And the user says, I believe this is a fair price. Now, the contrary to this, the other point is, if you say that I will somehow do it in that price and want to win the contract, you have to prove that you make profits. If you don't make profits, you're rejected. So the flip side is, I don't want as Ministry of Defense you to lose your money. But if you lose money, next time you are not going to be there. So that's the maturity of uh, one of the maritime country into that level of uh, having controlled the whole world. The their maturity of the process saying, I want you to make money. Third point, they can reject you, is if you don't have good green practices, which is some other talked a lot about the, uh, the green practices. Now, this is essentially where the world is moving. This is where people who say they want to ensure on any given day of the shipbuilding program, you have a surplus cash at hand than what you have spent. And this is how the payment stages are structured. Because if you are actually borrowing, the government realizes that I am the one who is paying it. It's not the shipyard who is paying it. Who, who pays? Who pays the cost of capital? Mm. Ultimately, it's the customer who pays the cost of capital. On one project, somebody else may pay. But in long run, it's always the customer who pays. There's a maturity in the process. You must make profit. You must make good practices. You must also have a good design. Based on this, next slide. You actually see the commercial clauses <coughs> or the commercial conditions or your actual price out of 100 has a weightage of 19. 12 and 6. I'll give you a break up also. 13 and 6. 13% is a weightage. We heard, I think uh, Man was saying about, or somebody else said, uh, unless the weightage on technical parameters is 80%, I will not even pay. Here's the weightage, which is 13%. So your price bid has a weightage of 13%, 81%, 13 plus 6, having gone out of 9, that 81% is for what, what is the value proposition. So the entire shipbuilding game is changed into win win because it's the value, not the price getting talked about. And with this, there's only one condition on the price. Are you below or you're above? Now imagine what incentivization it will do to a shipbuilding industry to truly revive the shipbuilding. The moment we start talking about policies, we heard comments of maybe, uh, I think, uh, uh, Commander of the country was talking about, we only go by rules. So you don't need rules when you have a policy in place. And the policy assures next 30 years of work. Listed down programs for 30 years, and there's a book. You can you can buy it. You, you, you can go download it. Go to a shipbuilding office. There's a national shipbuilding office created. Incidentally, since we are talking about all this, national shipbuilding office has been created at the behest of the prime minister two years back. Mandate given to national shipbuilding offices beyond whether it's Navy, commercial, whosoever, or the auxiliaries, royal auxiliaries, all of them are controlled finally by that one office. And this is one office which is saying, I have a 30 year of visibility. I tell you what 30 year visibility is. Now invest. Invest in better ways of doing it. I will incentivize you. 
Now, this is the process which I thought. And when I first time talked about this couple of months back to the defense secretary as well as to CNS as well as vice chief, they said this is something amazing. Is there somebody who can do this? So what all problems we talked of during the entire day, I see that the other countries who seem to be evolving, thinking new things, and why did they do it? UK today has a track record of 100% of projects going beyond schedule. Every project has a cost over. And that's essentially where two years, three years back, they decided they're going to start every major program subject to anything which is a repeat contract will go on a nomination basis. Every new contract will go competitive. It's a national thinking to say, I need to make my industry to a next level of technology, next level of way of doing things. And that's where the upper price of the cap comes in. If you bid above, you are not there. But you have a mandate to prove you make profits. So it's something which is far more an evolved process. I thought before I uh, uh, sort of uh, stop speaking today, I thought I'll speak about this because that's essentially where I see we heard the Chinese model more of commercial shipbuilding. We heard the Korean model more of again commercial shipbuilding. Here's a model for military. I'm ensuring you have no working capital cost. As Ministry of Defense, I'm ensuring you make profit. So if you don't make profit, you will not be paid there. You'll walk out. Someday you will walk out. So that's essentially where the process maturity is. I thought it's worthwhile on when we're speaking about way ahead on shipbuilding, makes sense to record that, talk about it in a forum of this kind. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. I just to move and to all the uh, panelists. I think uh, it's been a uh, uh, conversation uh, and a talk that you have in particular given, and uh, also both the speakers present here as well as the suggestions to uh, accept. I request the President IMF uh, to kindly uh, give the mementos. Firstly, to uh, the moderator, we partner. And lastly, and lastly, Mr. Biju George. That we come to our concluding session now, uh, where we again have uh, Mr. Patil deliver the concluding address. So, may it was uh, <laughs> thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. With that, uh, we come to the end of this session. Uh, may I request uh, congratulations to deliver the vote of thanks. Thank you, sir. Let me take your seats. Before that, uh, we have two more uh, mementos to be given. Uh, two of the CMEs of the shipyards who are here. Uh, firstly, Kamro Khatri of HSL. Okay, any uh, other rep from HSL? Okay, we will send it across this way. And uh, is uh, Mr. Sahara here? Shop.
last but not least, and certainly not the least, thank you all very much for each and every one of you for coming here in large numbers and making this seminar a success and staying on for the extended period. Thank you very much. That is that is very good. That's when you get a chance to meet. Shall I close it? Your slides. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. This one, sir. Ah, ah, yeah. 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 अभी ज़ूम बंद करो। उनको मैं करता हूँ।